Volume Two, Part One, Chapter One of War and Peace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. Volume Two, Part One. Eighteen o six to eighteen eleven. Chapter One. At the beginning of the year 1806, Nikolai Rostov went home on furlough. Denisov was also going to his home in Vronsk, and Rostov persuaded him to accompany him to Moscow and made him a visit. At the next-to-last post station, Denisov fell in with a comrade and drank three bottles of wine with him, and on the way to Moscow, in spite of the cradle-holes on the road, did not once wake up, but lay stretched out in the bottom of the post-sledge next to Rostov, who, in proportion as they approached the city, grew more and more impatient. Faster! Faster! Oh, these intolerable streets! Shops! Kalachki! Lanterns! Cab drivers! thought Rostov, when, having left their names at the city gates as visitors on furlough, they had fairly entered the city. Denisov! We are here! Sleep! he exclaimed, leaning forward with his whole body, as though by this motion he could hope to increase the speed of the sledge. Denisov made no answer. There's the cross street, where Zakhar, the Izvachik, used to stand, and there's Zakhar himself, and the same horse, and here's the shop where we used to buy gingerbread. Hurry, there. Which house? asked the driver. That one yonder, on the corner. That big one, can't you see it? That's our house, said Rostov. There, that's our house. Denisov! Denisov! We shall be there in a moment. Denisov lifted his head, coughed, and made no answer. Dmitri, said Rostov, calling to his valet on the coachman's seat, there is a light in our house, isn't there? Certainly there is. There's a light in your Papenka's room. They can't have gone to bed yet, eh? What do you think? See here. Don't you forget it. I want my new Hungarian coat taken out, he added, stroking his young moustache. Now then, a little further, he cried to the postillion. Here, wake up, Vasha, turning to Denisov, who had again let his head fall back. Come now, get along. Three silver rubles for vodka. Get on, shouted Rostov, when the sledge was within three doors of his own entrance. It seemed to him that the horses did not move. At last the sledge drew up at the entrance at the right. Over his head Rostov saw the well-known cornice with the peeling stucco, the front doorsteps, the curbstone. He leaped out before the sledge had stopped and rushed into the entry. The house also stood as cold and motionless as though it had no concern with the one who was entering its portals. There was no one in the entry. "'My God, has anything happened?' thought Rostov, with a sinking at the heart, standing still for a minute, and then starting to run along the entry and up the well-known crooked stairs. There was still the same old door-handle, the untidiness of which always annoyed the countess, as loose and as much askew as ever. In the anteroom burned a single tallow candle. The old Michaela was asleep on the chest. Prokofi, the hall-boy, who was so strong that he could lift a coach by the back, was sitting making shoes out of selvage. As the door opened he looked up, and his sleepy, indifferent expression of countenance suddenly changed to one of awe and even fright. "'Heavens and earth! The young Count!' he cried, as soon as he recognized his young master. "'How does it happen, my dear boy?' And Prokofi, trembling with emotion, rushed through the door into the drawing-room, evidently with the intention of announcing the good news, but then, on second thought, he came back and fell on his young baron's neck. "'All well,' asked Rostov, drawing away his arm. Yes, glory to God, glory to God, only just done dinner. Let us have a look at you, your illustriousness. Are they all perfectly happy? Yes, salva bohu, salva bohu. Rostov had entirely forgotten about Denisov, not wishing anyone to announce his arrival. He pulled off his fur shuba and ran on his tiptoes into the great, dark drawing-room. Everything was the same, the same card-tables, the chandelier still in its covering, 
but some of the family must have seen the young baron, and hardly had he entered the drawing-room before there came with a rush like a tornado a small person who threw a pair of arms round his neck and overwhelmed him with kisses. Then a second, and still a third, came leaping out of a second and third side door. More embraces, more kisses, more shouts, tears of joy. He could not tell which was Papa, or which was Natasha, or which was Petya. All were shouting, talking, and kissing him at one and the same time. Suddenly he discovered that his mother was not among them. And here I knew nothing about it, Nikolushka, my darling. Here he is, ours again, my darling Kolya. How you have changed. There are no lights. Bring tea. Now kiss me. Dushenka, dear heart, and me too. Sonya, Natasha, Petya, Anna Mikhailovna, Vera, the old count, were all embracing him, and the servants and the maids, crowding into the room, were exclaiming and ooing and eyeing. Petya, clinging to his legs, kept crying, Me too! Natasha, after having thrown her arms around him and kissed him repeatedly all over his face, ran behind him, and seizing him by the tail of his coat, was jumping up and down like a goat in the same spot, and giving utterance to sharp little squeals. On all sides of him were eyes gleaming with tears of joy and love. On all sides were lips ready to be kissed. Sonya, red as Kumach, also held him by the hand, and all radiant with affection, gazed into his eyes which she had been so longing to see. Sonya was now just past sixteen, and was very pretty, especially at this moment of joyous, triumphant excitement. She looked at him, without dropping her eyes, smiling and almost holding her breath. He looked at her gratefully, but still he was all the time waiting and looking for someone else. The old countess had not yet made her appearance. And now steps were heard in the entry, steps so quick that they could be no one else but his mother's. But it was his mother in a dress which he had never seen before, one that had been finished since he was gone. All made way for him, and he ran to her, when they met, she fell on his heart, sobbing. She could not lift her face, and only pressed it against the cold silver braid of his Hungarian coat. Denisov, coming into the room unobserved by anyone, stood there also, and as he looked at them, he wiped his eyes. "'Vasily Denisov, the friend of your son,' said he, introducing himself to the Count, who looked at him with a questioning expression. "'I know, I know,' said the Count, embracing Denisov and kissing him. Nikolushka wrote, Natasha, Vera, here is Denisov. The same happy, enthusiastic faces were turned upon Denisov's hirstuk figure and crowded around him. My dear Denisov, screamed Natasha, and forgetting herself in her excitement and running to him, she threw her arms around him and kissed him. All were abashed at Natasha's action. Denisov also reddened, but smiled, and taking Natasha's hand, kissed it. Denisov was conducted to the room that had been prepared for him, but the Rostovs all collected in the divan room around Nikolushka. The old countess, not letting go his hand, which she kept kissing every minute, sat next to him. The others standing around them watched his every motion, word, glance, and could not take from him their enthusiastically loving eyes. The brother and sisters quarreled and disputed with each other for places next to him, and vied with each other in bringing him his tea, his handkerchief, his pipe. Rostov was very happy in the love which they showed him, but the first moment of the meeting had been so beatific that his present happiness seemed a little tame, and he kept desiring and expecting something more and more, and yet more. The next morning the travellers slept straight on till ten o'clock. In the adjoining room there was a confusion of sabres, valises, sabretashes, opened trunks, muddy boots. Two pairs of boots cleaned and with brightened spurs had just been brought up and set along the wall. Servants were carrying wash-hand basins, hot water for shaving, and well-brushed clothes. There was an odor of tobacco and of men. Denisov, to Rostov's amazement, made his appearance in the drawing-room in a new uniform, pomaded and scented, with as much ceremony as though he were going out to battle, and showed himself so polite to the ladies and gentlemen present that Rostov could hardly believe his eyes. End of chapter 1《パート1》Chapter 2 of《War and Peace》by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle.
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 2 Nikolai Rostov, on his return to Moscow from the army, was welcomed by the home circle as the best of sons, as a hero, and their darling Nikolushka, by his relatives as a fine, attractive, and distinguished young man, by his acquaintances as a handsome lieutenant of hussars, a graceful dancer, and one of the best matches in town. The Rostovs were acquainted with all Moscow. This year the old count had plenty of money, having mortgaged all his possessions, and consequently Nikolushka, who kept his own fast trotter and wore the most stylish riding trousers of the latest cut, such as never before been seen in Moscow, and likewise the most fashionable boots, with very pointed toes and little silver spurs, was enabled to spend his time very agreeably. Now that he was home again, he experienced the pleasant sensation of accommodating himself to the old conditions of life, after an interregnum of considerable time. It seemed to him that he had grown to be very much of a man. His despair at not having been able to pass his examination in the catechism, his borrowing of money from Gavrilo for an Izvoshchik, his clandestine kisses with Sonya, all came back to him as remembrances of a childhood from which he was now immeasurably separated. Now he was a lieutenant of hussars, in a silver-laced police, with the cross of St. George, and he could enter his own racer, together with well-known, experienced, and respected amateurs. There was a lady of his acquaintance on the boulevard, with whom he used to spend his evenings. He took the lead of the mazurka at the Arkharovs, discussed war with Field Marshal Kaminsky, was a habitué of the English club, and was on thou terms with a colonel of forty years, to whom Denisov had introduced him. His passion for his sovereign had somewhat cooled since his return to Moscow, since he did not see him and had no opportunity of seeing him, but he often talked about him and of his love for him, giving people to understand that he did not tell all, that there was something in his feeling toward the emperor that was not comprehensible to all men, and with his whole soul he entered into the sentiment, general at that period in Moscow, of devotion to the emperor Alexander Pavlovich, who was then called Angel Vuploti, an angel in the flesh, or an angel on earth. During Rostov's short stay in Moscow, before he returned to the army, instead of growing nearer to Sonya, he rather drifted away from her. She was very pretty and sweet, and was evidently deeply in love with him. But he had reached that period of young manhood when there seemed to be so many things to do that no time is left for this, and the young man is afraid of binding himself irrevocably, and learns to prize his freedom, since it is necessary to him for other things. When he thought of Sonya during these days of his visit at home, he would say to himself, "Ugh, there are many, many more as good as she is, whom I have not had a chance to see as yet. I shall have time enough whenever I want to engage myself and fall in love, but now I will have none of it. Moreover, it seemed to him that there was something rather derogatory to his manhood to spend his time in the society of the ladies. If he went to balls and into the society of women, he pretended that he did so against his will. Races, the English club, junketing with Denisov, and his visits there were quite a different affair. Such things were becoming to a gay young hussar. About the beginning of March, the old Count Ilya Andreevich Rostov was occupied with the preparations for a dinner to be given at the English club in honor of Prince Bagration. The Count in his dressing-gown was walking up and down his drawing-room, giving orders to the club steward and the famous Fjoktist, the old cook of the English cub, in regard to asparagus, fresh cucumbers, strawberries, veal, and fish for the dinner to the prince. The Count, ever since the founding of the club, had been a committee man and the leading spirit. He had been appointed by the club to oversee the entertainment for Prince Bagration, because no one knew so well as he did how to organize a banquet on a broad and hospitable scale, and especially because no one else could or would spend his own money if it were necessary to make it a success. The cook and steward of the club listened to the Count's orders with happy faces, because they knew that for their advantage there was no better person for them to have manage a dinner costing several thousand rubles. Now see here, put esparce in the turtle soup, esparce, you know, "'Must there be three kinds of cold dishes?' asked the cook. The Count pondered. "'Certainly not less than three. Mayonnaise one,' said he, beginning to count them on his fingers. "'Do you wish me to order some large sterlet?' interrupted the steward. 
what shall we do if there are no good ones yes batushka certainly i came near forgetting see here we must have another entree on the table oh dear me he put his hands to his head now who is going to get me flowers Matenka, ah Matenka, hurry off Matenka! he cried to his overseer who came in at his call hurry off to my estate moskovnanya and tell masimka the gardener to get up the decorations tell him to have all the greenhouses stripped and the flowers sent up well wrapped in felt let him have two hundred flower-pots here by friday having given a profusion of various other orders he was just going to the little countess's room to rest but remembering some important item he turned around called back the steward and cook and began to give still further orders just then in the doorway were heard the light steps of a man the jingling of spurs and the young count handsome ruddy-faced with dark moustache came into the room it was evident that the restful easy-going life in moscow agreed with him ach my dear boy how my head whirls said the old man smiling at his son with a sort of humiliated expression come now if you'd only help me we really must have some more singers i shall have my own orchestra but what should you think of getting the gypsies your brotherhood of military men like them it's a fact papenka i think that prince bagration when he was getting ready for the battle of schongraben did not make such hard work of it as you are doing now said the young man with a smile the old count pretended to be angry yes you talk just try it yourself and the count turned to the cook who with an intelligent and respectful face was looking on with friendly and flattering eyes at the father and son that's the way with the young men hey fyoktist said he always making sport of us old fellows that's so your illustriousness all they want is to have good things to eat and drink but how it's got and served is no concern of theirs that's it that's it cried the count and gaily seizing his son's two hands cried now this is what i want since i have you take the sledge and a pair and hurry off to buzukoy's and tell him that the count that is ilya andreyevitch sent to ask for some fresh strawberries and pineapples no one else has any at all if he himself is not there then find the princesses and ask them and from there mind you drive to Resgulyai. Ipatka, the coachman, will know the way. And there find Ilyushka, the Saigon, the one who danced and sang in the white Kazakin at Count Orlov's, you remember, and bring him with you to me here. Shall I bring some of the Saigon girls with him, too? asked Nikolai, laughing. There, there. At this moment, with noiseless steps, and with her indefatigable and anxious, and at the same time sweet and Christian expression, which never deserted her, Anna Mikhailovna came into the room. In spite of the fact that Anna Mikhailovna every day discovered the Count in his dressing gown, each time he was abashed and offered her apologies for his costume. No matter, Count, my dear, said she, blandly closing her eyes. I myself am going to the Buzukoys. Pierre has come, and now we can get anything from his greenhouses. I have been wanting to see him. He sent me a letter from Boris. Slava Bohu! Glory to God! He is now on the staff. The Count was delighted to have one part of his commission undertaken by Anna Mikhailovna, and bade her to make use of the coupe. You tell Buzukoy to come. I will write him a note. How are he and his wife getting along? asked the Count. Anna Mikhailovna rolled her eyes, and her face expressed deep affliction. Ugh, my dear, he's very unhappy, said she. If it is true what we have heard, it is terrible— and could we have dreamed of such a thing, when we rejoiced so in his happiness? And such a lofty, heavenly soul this young Buzukoy is. Yes, I pity him from the bottom of my heart, and I mean to do all that within me lies to give him consolation. Tell us what is it? asked both the Rostovs, elder and younger. Anna Mikhailovna drew a deep sigh. Dolokhov, Marya Ivanovna's son, said she in a mysterious whisper, has, so many say, absolutely compromised her. Pierre introduced him to her, took him to his own house in Petersburg, and then she came here, and that madcap fellow followed her, said Anna Mikhailovna, trying to express her sympathy for Pierre, but involuntarily by inflections of her voice, 
and the half-smile on her face showing more sympathy for the madcap fellow, as she called Dolokhov. They say Pierre is perfectly broken by his trial. Well, then, be sure to tell him to come to the club. It will help to distract him. It will be a stunning banquet. On the next day, the 15th of March, at two o'clock in the afternoon, two hundred and fifty members of the English club and fifty guests were waiting for their distinguished guest, Prince Begration, the hero of the Austrian campaign. At first the news of the Battle of Austerlitz had been received at Moscow with incredulity. The Russians had been so accustomed to victory that when they heard of the defeat, some simply refused to believe it, others sought explanations for such a strange circumstance in extraordinary causes. In the month of December, when the news was fully confirmed, at the English club, which was a rendezvous for men of note or who had trustworthy sources of information, and everywhere else, nothing was said about the war and the recent defeat, just as though there had been common consent to hush the matter up. Men who were apt to give the cue to conversation, for instance, Count Rostopchin, Prince Yuri Vladimirovich Dolgoruki, Valuyev, Count Markov, Prince Wezemsky, did not show themselves at the club at all, but met at their own houses in their own intimate circles, and the rest of the Muscovites, who never had any opinions of their own, and in this number we must reckon also Ilya Andreevich Rostov, remained for a short time without any definite opinion in regard to the war, and without their natural leaders. These Muscovites had a dim idea that something was wrong, and that it was hard to arrive at a proper judgment in regard to this bad news, and therefore they preferred to keep silent. But after some time, when the bigwigs who directed opinion at the club came back like jurors after a consultation in the jury room, then all was made clear and definite. Reasons were found for this incredible, unheard of, and impossible circumstance that the Russians were beaten. It now became perfectly clear, and one and the same thing was said in all the corners of Moscow. These were the reasons. The treachery of Austria, the wretched victualling of the troops, the treason of the Pole, Przybyszewski, and the Frenchman, Langeron, the incapacity of Kurtazov, and, spoken with bated breath, the youth and inexperience of the sovereign, who had placed his confidence in inefficient and insignificant men. But the army, the Russian army, and all agreed in regard to this, was extraordinary, and had accomplished prodigies of valor. Soldiers, officers, generals, all were heroes, but the hero of heroes was Prince Bagration, who had won imperishable glory by his victory at Schöngraben and his retreat at Osterlitz, where he alone had led off his division unbroken and had fought the live-long day against an enemy double his numbers. What added still more eclat to his repute as a hero was the fact that he had no kin in Moscow and was a foreigner. He was considered as the representative of the simple heroic Russian soldier, who had won his way without connections and intrigues, and was moreover associated with recollections of the Italian campaign in the name of Suvorov. And then again by showing him such distinguished honors, it was felt that there could be no better way of showing Kutuzov ill will and disapprobation. If there were no bagration, we should have to manufacture one. Il faudrait il vente, said the jester Shinshin, with a parody on Voltaire's witticism. Scarcely anyone spoke of Kutuzov and those who did abused him under their breath, calling him the court weathercock and an old satyr. Prince Dolgorukov's witticism was repeated all over Moscow. Stick to the plaster, and you'll become a master. Thus he consoled himself for our defeat by the remembrance of former victories. Men likewise freely quoted Rostopchin's clever saying that, if you have to spur the French soldier to battle with high-sounding phrases, the Germans must have it logically proved to them, that it is more dangerous to run away than it is to advance, while the Russian soldier, on the contrary, must be held back and urged to go gently. On all sides were heard new and ever new tales of individual examples of heroism shown by our officers and soldiers at Austerlitz. This man saved a standard, that one killed five Frenchmen, the other alone loaded five cannons. They spoke of Berg, even those who did not know him, and told how, when he was wounded in his right arm, he took his sword in his left hand and dashed forward. Nothing was heard of Bolkonsky, and only those who knew him intimately lamented his premature death and pitied his wife with her unborn child and his droll old father. 
End of chapter 2part one chapter three of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter three on the fifteenth of march in all the various rooms of the english club was heard the hum of busy voices and like bees at the spring swarming time the members and guests of the club dressed in uniforms dress coats and some even in powder and caftans roamed back and forth sat down stood up met and parted powdered and liveried men in small clothes and slippers stood at each door and strove eagerly to anticipate each motion of the guests and members so as to offer their services the majority of those present were well on in years men of distinction with broad self-satisfied faces plump fingers resolute gestures and voices the guests and members of this class occupied the well-known places of honor and were surrounded by little circles of well-known and distinguished men. Those that formed the minority were chance guests, preeminently young men, among whom were Denisov, Rostov, and Dolokhov, the last being now an officer of the Semyonovsky regiment once more. The faces of these young men, especially those who belonged to the army, wore that expression of contemptuous deference toward their elders, which seemed to say to the older generation, We are ready to respect and honor you, but remember that nevertheless the future is ours. Nesvitsky was there also, in the capacity of a former member of the club. Pierre, who by his wife's advice had let his hair grow, renounced his spectacles, and dressed in the height of style, wandered through the rooms with a melancholy and dismal mien. As usual he was surrounded by that atmosphere of worship, offered by those who bow before riches, and he, having now become accustomed to this dominion, treated such sycophants with careless scorn. In years he should have associated with the young men, but by his wealth and importance he gravitated towards the circles of the older and more influential guests, and consequently he drifted from one group to another. Certain circles were formed by some of the most distinguished old men, around whom respectfully gathered many of the less conspicuous, for the purpose of listening to the great ones. Such groups were formed around Count Rostopchin, Valuyev, and Narishkin. Rostopchin was telling how the Russians were caught by the fugitive Austrians and obliged to force their way through at the point of the bayonet. Valuyev confidentially announced that Uvarov had been sent from Petersburg to learn the opinion of the Muscovites in regard to Austerlitz. In the third great circle, Narishkin was telling about a session of an Austrian council of war, at which Suvorov crowed like a cock in answer to the absurdities spoken by the Austrian generals. Shinshin, who formed one of the group, tried to raise a laugh by saying that, evidently, Kutuzov had not been able to learn of Zavarov even such a simple thing as to crow like a cock. But the elderly men looked sternly at the jester, giving him thereby to feel that on such a day, and in such a place, it was unseemly, so to speak, of Kutuzov. Count Ilya Andreevich Rostov, in his soft boots, hovered, full of anxiety and solicitude, between the dining-room and the parlours, giving always the same hasty greeting to every one he met, whether men of mark or not men of mark, his acquaintance including everybody, without exception, occasionally looking round for his handsome young son, at whom he would look with delight and a nod of satisfaction. Young Rostov stood in the embrasure of a window, with Dolokhov, whose acquaintance he had recently made, and felt to be congenial. The old count came up to them and shook hands with Dolokhov. "'I beg of you to come and see us, since you and my young man here are friends. You and he played the heroes together, yonder. Ah, Vasily Ignatyevich, good afternoon, old friend,' cried he, turning to welcome a little old man just entering. But he did not have time to add the usual greetings. There was a stir, and a footman with awestruck face announced, "'He has come.' The bell rang, the elders hastened forward, the guests scattered in the different rooms, like rye gathered up by the shovel, congregated in a throng, and stood in the great drawing-room at the door of the hall. At the entrance appeared Bagration, without his hat and sword, which, according to the club custom, he had left in care of the Swiss. He was dressed, not in his lambskin cap, with his whip over his shoulder, as Rostov had seen him the night before the Battle of Austerlitz, but in a new and tight-fitting uniform, with Russian and foreign orders, 
and with the star of the George on his left breast. He had evidently just had his hair and whiskers trimmed, and this did not change his appearance for the better. His face had a naively festive look, which, being inappropriate to his firm, manly features, gave him a rather comical expression. Beklashov and Fyodor Petrovich Yuvarov, who came together with him, paused at the doorway, waiting for him as the guest of honor, to precede them. Bagration was confused, not wishing to take advantage of their politeness. There was a little pause at the entrance, and finally Bagration, after all, came forward. He walked across the inlaid floor of the reception room awkwardly and bashfully, not knowing what to do with his hands. It would have been much more to his mind, and much easier for him, to cross a ploughed field under a rain of bullets, as, for instance, he had done when leading the Kursk regiment at the Battle of Schöngraben. The older gentleman met him at the door, said a few words expressive of their delight at seeing such an illustrious guest, and without waiting for his reply, seized him, as it were, and dragged him off into the drawing-room. Around the doors of the drawing-room there was such a crowd that it was impossible to pass. Members and guests crushed each other and tried to look over each other's shoulders for a glance at Bagration, as though he were some wild beast. Count Ilya Andreyitch, laughing and talking more energetically than all the rest, pushed through the throng, crying, Make way, mon cher, make way, please, make way, and led the guests into the drawing-room and placed them on the central divan, where now all the bigwigs and the most distinguished members of the club gathered in an eager throng. Count Ilya Andreevich, again, pushing his way through the crowd, left the room, but quickly reappeared with another of the directors, bearing a huge silver salver, which he presented to Prince Bagration. On the salver lay some verses composed and printed in the hero's honor. Bagration, seeing the salver, looked around in alarm, as though seeking for refuge, but all eyes demanded his submission, and Bagration, feeling that he was in their power, seized the salver resolutely with both hands, and looked gravely and reproachfully at the Count who brought it to him. Someone gallantly relieved the Prince of the salver, for otherwise he would have evidently felt it incumbent upon him to hold it in his hands till evening, and even gone out to dinner with it, and directed his attention to the ode. Well, I will read it, Prince Bagration seemed to say, and fastening his weary eyes on the parchment, tried to read it with serious and concentrated attention. But the composer of the ode took it and began to read it aloud. Prince Bagration bent his head and listened. Pride of Alexander's age, be of our Titus's throne the stern defender, at once the mighty chief and humble sage, at home, Arifius, Caesar mid the battle's splendor. Yes, e'en victorious Napoleon by sad experience has learned Bagration. Now justice to the outside Russians he must rend, and fear. But even while he was in the midst of his ode, the centurion Major Damo proclaimed, Dinner is ready. The door was flung open, and from the dining room were heard the resounding notes of the Polonaise. Roll yon thunder tones of victory, gallant Russian hearts rejoice. And Count Ilya Andreyitch, giving the author a severe look for still continuing to read his verses, came and made a low bow before Bagration. All rose to their feet, feeling that the dinner was of more consequence than poetry, and Bagration was obliged to lead the way to the dining-room. He was assigned to the seat of honor between the two Alexanders, Beklasov and Narishkin, which was meant as a delicate allusion to the name of the sovereign. Three hundred men took their places at the table, according to their ranks and stations, those most distinguished being nearest to the guest of honor, just as naturally as water flows deepest, where there is the greatest descent. Just before the dinner began, Count Ilya Andreyitch presented his son to the prince. Bagration, recognizing him, mumbled a few words, awkward and incoherent, like everything else he said that day. Count Ilya Andreyitch looked around gleefully and proudly on all, while Bagration was talking to his son. Nikolai Rostov, with Denisov and his new acquaintance, Dolokhov, sat together almost at the center of the table. Opposite to them sat Pierre, next to Prince Novitsky. Count Ilya Andreyitch's seat was opposite Bagration, with the other directors, and he did the honors to the prince, personifying in himself the hospitality of Moscow. His labors were not spent in vain. 
the dinner which was served both for those who were keeping lent and for those who were not was magnificent but still he could not feel perfectly at ease until the very end he kept beckoning to the butler whispering directions to the waiters and not without agitation he looked for the arrival of each course which he knew so well all passed off admirably at the sight of which Ilya Andreyevitch flushed with joy and modesty, the waiters began to uncork the bottles and pour out the champagne. After the fish, which produced a great impression, Count Ilya Andreyevitch glanced at other directors. There are so many toasts, it is time to begin, he said in a whisper, and taking his wine cup in his hand, he got up. All grew still and waited what he should have to say. To the health of our sovereign, the emperor, he cried and at the same time his kindly eyes were dimmed with tears of pleasure and enthusiasm. At the same time the band broke out with a polonaise again, Roll, ye thunder tones, and arose in their places and cried, Hurrah! And Bagration also joined in shouting with the same voice which had cried, Hurrah! on the field of Schöngraben. Young Rostov's enthusiastic voice was heard above all the other three hundred. He could hardly refrain from tears. Hurrah for the emperor, he cried. Hurrah! Draining his glass at one draught, he smashed it on the floor. Many followed his example, and the deafening shouts continued for a long time. When silence was restored, the servants swept up the broken glass, and all, having resumed their seats, began to converse and laugh again. Then Count Ilya Andreyitch arose once more and proposed the health of the hero of our last campaign, Prince Pyotr Ivanovitch Bagration and again the Count's blue eyes grew tender with tears. Hurrah! Again rang out the three hundred voices, but this time, instead of the band, the choir of singers struck up a cantata, composed by Pavel Ivanovich Kutuzov. Obstacles are not to Russians. Courage wins the victor's crown. If Bagration lead our columns, we shall hew the foreman down. As soon as the singers had finished, fresh toasts kept following, at which Count Ilya Andreyitch grew more and more sentimental, and more and more glasses were smashed, and the shouts grew ever more boisterous. They drank to the health of Beklasov, Narushkin, Uvarov, Dolgorukov, Apretskin, Veluyev, to the health of the directors, to the health of the committeemen, to the health of all the members of the club, to the health of all the guests of the club, and finally, as a special honor, to the health of the master of ceremonies, Count Ilya Andreyitch. At this toast, the Count took out his handkerchief and, hiding his face, actually wept. End of chapter 3. Part 1, Chapter 4 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 4. Pierre sat opposite Dolokhov and Nikolai Rostov. He ate much and greedily, and, as usual, drank much. But those who knew him intimately observed that a great change had come over him that day. He said nothing all the time of the dinner. Scowling and frowning, he looked about him, or with downcast eyes and a look of absolute abstraction picked his nose with his finger. His face was gloomy and dismal. Apparently he did not see or hear anything that was going on around him, and was absorbed in some disagreeable and unsolvable problem. This unsolvable problem which tormented him was caused by the hints of the princess in Moscow in regard to Dolokhov's intimacy with his wife, and by an anonymous letter received that very morning, wherein it was said, in that dastardly mocking tone, characteristic of anonymous letters, that his spectacles did him very little good, and that his wife's criminal intimacy with Dolokhov was a secret for him alone." Pierre resolutely refused to heed the princess's insinuations or the letter, but it was terrible for him to look now at Dolokhov, sitting opposite him. Every time that his glance fell accidentally upon Dolokhov's handsome, insolent eyes, he was conscious of something awful and ugly arising in his soul, and he would quickly turn away. Involuntarily remembering all his wife's past and her behavior toward Dolokhov, Pierre saw clearly that what was expressed so brutally in the letter might very well be true, might, at least, seem true, did it not concern his wife. Pierre could not help recalling how Dolokhov, on being restored to his rank after the campaign, had returned to Petersburg and come to him. 
taking advantage of the friendship arising from their former sprees together. Dolokhov had come straight to his house, and Pierre had taken him in and loaned him money. Pierre remembered how Ellen, with her set smile, expressed her discontent at having Dolokhov living under their roof, and how Dolokhov had cynically praised before him his wife's beauty, and how, from that time forth until his coming to Moscow, he had not budged from their house. "'Yes, he is very handsome,' thought Pierre. "'I know him. In his estimation it would be admirable sport to besmirch my name and turn me into ridicule just for the reason that I was doing so much for him and taking care of him and helping him. I know, I understand, what spice it would add in his estimation to all his villainy, if it were true. Yes, if it were true, but I don't believe it. I have no right to believe it, and I cannot. He remembered the expression which Dolokhov's face had borne at times when he was engaged in his acts of deviltry, as, for instance, when they had tied the policeman to the bear and flung him into the river, or when without any provocation he had challenged men to fight duels, or shot the post-driver's horse dead with his pistol. This expression he had often noticed lately on Dolokhov's face. Yes, he is a bully, said Pierre to himself. He would think nothing of killing a man. It is essential for him to think that everyone is afraid of him. This must be pleasant to him. He must think that I am afraid of him, and in fact I am afraid of him, thought Pierre, and again at these suggestions the awful and ugly something arose in his mind. Dolokhov, Denisov, and Rostov were still sitting opposite to Pierre, and seemed to be very lively. Rostov was gaily chatting with his two friends, one of whom was a clever hussar, the other a well-known bully and madcap, and occasionally he glanced rather mockingly at Pierre, who had impressed him by the concentrated, abstracted, and stolid expression of his countenance. Rostov looked at Pierre with a malevolent expression, in the first place because Pierre, in the eyes of a hussar like him, was merely a millionaire civilian, the husband of a pretty woman, and moreover was a baba, an old woman. In the second place because Pierre, in his abstracted state of mind, did not recognize Rostov, or return his bow. When they stood up to drink the toast to the emperor, Pierre was so lost in his thoughts that he forgot to get up with the others and did not lift his wine-glass. "'What's the matter with you?' shouted Rostov, his eyes flashing with righteous indignation as he looked at him. "'Why don't you pay attention? The health of our sovereign, the emperor!' Pierre, with a sigh, humbly got to his feet, drained his glass, and then after they had all sat down he turned to Rostov with his good-natured smile. "'Ah!' I did not recognize you, said he. But Rostov was engaged in shouting hurrah, so that this was lost on him. Aren't you going to renew the acquaintance? asked Dolokhov of Rostov. Curse the fool! One must caress a pretty woman's husband, said Denisov. Pierre did not catch what they had said, but he knew that they were talking about him. He reddened and turned away. Well, now to the health of the pretty women, said Dolokhov and with a serious expression, though a smile lurked in the corners of his mouth, he lifted his glass to Pierre. To the health of the pretty women, Petrushka, and their lovers, he added. Pierre, dropping his eyes, sipped his glass, not looking at Dolokhov or making him any reply. A lackey, who was distributing copies of Kutuzov's cantata, handed one of the sheets to Pierre as being among the more distinguished guests. Pierre was going to take it, but Dolokhov leaned over, snatched the sheet from his hand and began to read it. Pierre stared at Dolokhov. His pupils contracted. That awful and ugly something that had been tormenting him all the dinner-time now arose in him and overmastered him. He leaned his heavy frame against the table. "'Don't you dare to take it!' he cried. Nezvitsky and his right-hand neighbor, hearing him speak in such a tone of voice, and seeing whom he was dealing with, were filled with alarm and hastily tried to calm him, "'That's enough. Be careful. Think what you're doing,' whispered anxious voices. Dolokhov stared at Pierre with his bright, merry, insolent eyes, and with that smile of his that seemed to say, "'This is what I like.' "'I will not give it back,' he said, measuring his words. Pale, with twitching lips, Pierre snatched back the sheet of paper. "'You, you, blackguard! I shall call you to account for this,' he cried." and pushing away his chair, rose from the table. At the very instant that Pierre did this, and pronounced these words, 
he felt that the problem of his wife's guilt, which had been torturing him for the past twenty-four hours, was finally and definitely settled beyond a peradventure. He hated her, and the breach between them was widened irrevocably. In spite of Denisov's urgency that Rostov should not get mixed up in this affair, Rostov consented to act as Dolokhov's second, and after dinner he arranged with Nesvitsky, Buzakoy's second, in regard to the conditions of the duel. Pierre went home, and Rostov, together with Denisov and Dolokhov, stayed at the club till late, listening to the gypsies and the singers. "'Well, then, till tomorrow, at Sokolniki,' said Dolokhov, taking his leave of Rostov on the club steps. "'And are you confident?' asked Rostov. Dolokhov paused. "'Now see here. I will give you in two words the whole secret of dueling. If you are going to fight a duel and write your will and affectionate letters to your father and mother, if you get it into your head that you are going to be killed, then you are an idiot, a durak, and deserve to fall. But if you go with firm intention to kill him as quickly and certainly as you can, then you are all right, as our Kostroma bear-driver told me. How can you help being afraid of the bear, says he? Yes, but when once you see him, your only fear is that he will get away. Well, that's the way it is with me. Ademain, mon cher. On the next morning at eight o'clock, Pierre and Nesvitsky drove to the woods of Sokolniki, and found there Dolokhov, Denisov, and Rostov waiting for them. Pierre had the aspect of a man entirely absorbed in his reflections, and absolutely incognizant of the affair before him. His countenance was haggard and yellow. He had evidently not slept the night before. He glanced around him vaguely, and frowned as though blinded by the bright sun. Two considerations exclusively occupied him. His wife's guilt, of which, after his sleepless night, he had no longer the slightest doubt, and Dolokhov's innocence, granting that he had no reason to guard the honor of a stranger. "'Maybe I should have done the same thing if I had been in his place,' said Pierre to himself. "'I am perfectly certain that I should. Why, then, this duel, this homicide? Either I shall kill him, or he shall put a bullet through my head, in my elbow or my knee. Can't I get out of it somehow? Run away? Hide myself somewhere?' This thought came to his mind but at the very instant that these suggestions were offering themselves to him, he, with his usual calm and absent-minded expression, which aroused the respect of those who saw him, was asking if all were ready, and they should begin soon. When all had been arranged, and the swords struck upright in the snow to mark the limits for them to advance, and the pistols had been loaded, Nesvitsky went up to Pierre. "'I should not be doing my duty, Count,' said he, in a faltering voice or be worthy of the confidence and honor which you confide in my hands at this moment, this most serious moment, if I did not tell you the whole truth. I consider that this affair has not sufficient reason, and does not warrant the shedding of blood. You were in the wrong, absolutely. You were in a passion. Oh, yes, it was horribly foolish, said Pierre. Then allow me to offer your regrets, and I am sure that your opponent will be satisfied to accept your apologies, said Nesvitsky, who, like the other participants, and like all men in similar affairs, did not believe, even now, that it would actually come to a duel. You know, Count, that it is far more noble to acknowledge one's fault than to carry an affair to its irrevocable consequences. The insult was not wholly on one side. Let me confer. No, there's nothing to be said about it, said Pierre. It's all the same to me. Is everything ready? he asked. Do you only tell me where I am to stand? and where to fire, he added, with an unnaturally sweet smile. He took the pistol, began to ask about the working of the trigger, for he had never before held a pistol in his hands, though he was unwilling to confess it. Oh, yes, that's the way, I, I know, I had forgotten, said he. No apologies, decidedly not, said Dolokhov to Denisov, who also on the other side proposed to effect a reconciliation, and he also went to the designated place. The place selected for the duel was a small clearing in the fir woods, covered with what remained of the snow after the recent thaw, and about eighty paces from the road where the sledges were left. The opponents stood about forty paces apart on the border of the clearing. The seconds, while measuring off the distance, had trampled down the deep, wet snow between the place where they stood and Nesvitsky and Denisov's sabres, stuck upright ten paces apart, to mark the bounds. It was thawing, and the mist spread around. 
nothing could be seen forty paces away for three minutes all had been ready and still they hesitated about beginning no one spoke end of chapter four part one chapter five of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter five well begin said dolokhof all right said pierre still smiling as before it was a solemn moment it was evident that the affair which at first had been so trivial could no longer be averted but was now bound to take its course to the very end irrespective of the will of the men denisof first went forward to the barrier and announced as the adversaries have refused to agree we may proceed take your pistols and at the word three advance and fire a uh, one two three cried denisof sternly and stepped to one side the two men advanced along the trodden path coming closer and closer their faces growing more and more distinct to each other in the fog the antagonists had the right to fire at any moment before reaching the barrier dolokhof advanced slowly not raising his pistol but fastening his bright glittering blue eyes on his opponent's face his lips as usual wore what seemed like a smile so it seems i can fire when i please said pierre to himself and at the word three he advanced with quick strides leaving the beaten path and pushing through the untrodden snow he held the pistol in his right hand out at arm's length apparently afraid of killing himself with it his left hand he strenuously kept behind his back because he felt such a strong desire to support his right arm with it which he knew was out of the question it was after he had gone six steps that he left the trodden path he looked down at his feet then gave a quick glance at dolokhof and pulling the trigger as he had been told to do he fired not anticipating such a loud report pierre jumped and then smiling at his own sensations stood back stock still the smoke made heavier by the misty atmosphere prevented him from seeing anything at first but there was no second report as he had expected all he could hear was dolokhof's hasty steps and then his form loomed up through the smoke he was holding one hand to his left side with the other he clutched the pistol which he did not raise his face was pale rostof had rushed up to him and was saying something N no hissed dolokhof through his teeth no i'm not done yet and making a few tottering staggering steps toward the sabre he fell on the snow near it his left arm was covered with blood he wiped it on his coat and supported himself with it his face was pale and contracted and a spasm passed over it i beg of you began dolokhof but he could not speak coherently please he said with difficulty pierre hardly restrained his sobs started to run to dolokhof and was just crossing the line when dolokhof cried stop at the barrier pierre realizing what he meant paused near the sabre they were only ten paces apart dolokhof bent his head over to the snow greedily ate a mouthful lifted his head again straightened himself up tried to get to his feet and sat down in his effort to recover his equilibrium he swallowed the icy snow and sucked it his lips twitched but he still smiled and his eyes gleamed with concentrated hatred as he tried to collect his failing strength he raised the pistol and tried to aim stand sideways protect yourself from the pistol cried nesvitsky protect yourself instinctively cried denisov though he was the other's second pierre with his sweet smile of compassion and regret helplessly dropping his arms and spreading his legs stood with his broad chest exposed directly to dolokhof and looking at him mournfully denisov rostov and nesvitsky shut their eyes they heard the report and simultaneously dolokhof's wrathful cry missed cried dolokhof and lay back feebly on the snow face down pierre clutched his temples and turning back went into the woods trampling down the virgin snow and muttering incoherent words folly folly death lies he kept repeating with scowling brows nesvitsky called him back and took him home rostof and denisof lifted the wounded dolokhof 
they put him in the sledge where he lay with closed eyes and without speaking or making any reply to their questions but when they reached moscow he suddenly roused himself and with difficulty raising his head seized rostof's hand who was sitting next to him rostof was struck by the absolutely changed and unexpectedly softened expression of dolokhov's face well how do you feel now asked rostof wretchedly but that is no matter my dear said dolokhov in a broken voice where are we we are in moscow i know it it's no matter about me but i have killed her killed her she won't get over this she won't survive who asked rostof my mother my mother my good angel my adored angel my mother and dolokhov burst into tears pressing rostof's hand when he had grown a little calmer he explained to rostof that he lived with his mother that if his mother should see him dying she would not survive it he begged rostof to go and break the news to her rostof rode on ahead to attend to this and to his great surprise discovered that dolokhov this insolent fellow this bully dolokhov lived with his old mother and a hunchbacked sister and was a most affectionate son and brother. End of chapter 5「Part 1, Chapter 6 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 6 Pierre had rarely of late seen his wife alone by themselves. Both in Petersburg and Moscow their house was constantly full of company. On the night that followed the duel he did not go to his sleeping-room, but, as was often the case, stayed in the vast cabinet where his father, the Count Buzakoy, had died. He stretched himself out on the sofa with the idea of forgetting all that had taken place, but this he couldn't do. Such a tornado of thoughts, feelings, recollections, suddenly arose in his mind that not only could he not sleep, but he could not keep still, and he was compelled to spring up from the sofa and walk the room with rapid strides. Now she seemed to come up before him, as she was during the first weeks after their marriage, with her bare shoulders and her languid, passionate eyes, and then immediately he would see Dolokhov by her side, Dolokhov, with his handsome, impudent, mocking face, as he had seen it at the banquet, and then the same face, pale, convulsed, and agonized, as it had been when he reeled and fell on the snow. What was it? he asked himself. I have killed her paramour. Yes, I have killed my wife's paramour. Yes, that was it. Why? How did it come to this? Because you married her, replied an inward voice. But wherein was I to blame? he asked again. Because you married her without loving her, because you deceived yourself and her and then he vividly recalled the moment after the dinner at Prince Vasily's when he had murmured those words, Je vous aime, I love you, that had come with so much difficulty. It was all from that. Even then I felt, he said to himself, even then I felt that this was wrong, that I had no right to do it, and so it has proved. He recalled their honeymoon and reddened at the recollection. Extraordinary vivid, humiliated and shameful was the recollection of how one time shortly after their marriage he had gone in his silk dressing-gown at twelve o'clock in the daytime from his sleeping-room to his library and found there his head overseer who with an obsequious bow glanced at pierre's face and at his dressing-gown while a shadow of a smile passed over his face as though he thereby expressed his humble sympathy in the happiness of his master and yet how many times have i been proud of her proud of her majestic beauty of her social tact he went on thinking proud of my house where she received all petersburg proud of her inaccessibility and radiance yes how proud i was of it all then i thought that i did not understand her how often when pondering over her character i said to myself that i was to blame that i did not understand her did not understand her habitual repose self-satisfaction and lack of all interest and ambition and now i have found the answer in that terrible expression she is a lewd woman now i have said to myself that terrible word all has become clear 
Anatole came to her to borrow some money, and kissed her on her naked shoulder. She did not let him have the money, but she was willing for him to kiss her. Her father, in joke, tried to make her jealous, and she, with her calm smile, replied that she was not so stupid as to be jealous. Let him do as he pleases, said she, about me. I asked her once if she saw no signs of approaching maternity. She laughed scornfully, and replied that she was not such a fool as to wish to have any children, and that I should never get any children by her. Then he recalled the coarseness and frankness of her speech, the vulgarity of the expressions that came natural out, in spite of her education in the highest aristocratic schools. I am no such fool. Go and try it on yourself. And such like slang she was fond of. Pierre, witnessing her success in the eyes of old and young, men and women, had often found it hard to understand why he did not love her. Yes, and I have never really loved her, said Pierre to himself. I knew that she was a lewd woman, he kept repeating to himself, but I did not dare to acknowledge it to myself. And now there is Dolokhov sitting on the snow and trying to smile, and dying maybe, and answering my repentance with pretended bravado. Pierre was one of those men who, notwithstanding his affectionate nature, which some would call weakness of character, would never seek a confidant for his troubles. He worked out his sufferings alone by himself. She is to blame, the only one to blame for all, he said to himself. But what was back of that? That I married her, that I said to her, Je vous aime, which was a lie, and even worse than a lie, he said to himself. I am to blame and must suffer. What? The besmirching of my name? The unhappiness of my life? Eh, that's all nonsense, he continued. The disgrace to my name and honor, all that is conditional, absolutely independent of me. Louis the Sixteenth was executed because they said that he was a guilty offender, thus Pierre reasoned, and they were right from their point of view just as they also were right from theirs who died a violent death after him, and who reckoned him among the saints. Then Robespierre was beheaded because he was a tyrant. Who was right? Who was to blame? No one. But live while we live. Tomorrow we die, just as I might have easily done an hour ago. And is it worth tormenting one's self about, when life counts only as a moment in comparison with eternity? But even while he was trying to reason himself into calmness by such a train of thought, suddenly she again rose before his imagination, and at one of those moments when he had expressed to her more violently than ever his insincere love, and he felt how the blood poured back to his heart, and he was obliged again to get up, move about, and break and smash whatever things came within reach of his hands. Why did I tell her that I loved her? Why did I say, Je vous aime, he kept asking himself. And after he had asked himself this question a dozen times, the phrase of Molière came to his head. Mais que diable allait, il fait dans cette galère. And he had to laugh at himself. It was night, but he summoned his valet and ordered him to pack up in readiness to go to Petersburg. He could not imagine himself having anything more to say to her. He had decided to take an early departure the next day, leaving her a letter in which he should explain his intention of living apart from her for evermore. The next morning, when the valet, bringing him his coffee, came into the cabinet, Pierre was lying on an ottoman asleep, with an open book in his hand. He roused himself and looked around for some time with a startled expression, wholly unable to understand where he was. "'The Countess commanded to ask if your illustriousness were at home,' asked the valet." But before Pierre had time to decide what answer to give, the Countess herself, in a morning gown of white satin embroidered in silver, and with her hair dressed in the simplest style, two enormously long braids, wound twice, and diadem, around her graceful head, came into the room, calmly and majestically. Only on her marble forehead, which was a little too prominent, was there a deep frown of fury. With thoroughly masterful self-restraint, she did not say a word in the valet's presence. She had heard of the duel and had come to speak about it. She waited until the valet had set down the coffee and left the room. Pierre looked at her timidly over his spectacles, and like a hare surrounded by dogs, which lays back its ears and crouches motionless before its enemies, 
so he also pretended to take up his reading again but he was conscious that this was a senseless and impossible thing to do and again he looked at her she did not sit down but with a scornful smile stared at him waiting until the valet should be out of the room well now what's this latest what have you been doing i demand an answer said she sternly i what have i stammered pierre playing the bravado eh come now answer me what about this duel what did you mean to imply by it what i demand an answer pierre turned heavily on the sofa opened his mouth but could not make a sound if you won't answer then i will tell you continued ellen you believe everything that is told you you were told ellen laughed that dolokhof was my paramour said she in french with her uncompromising explicit manner of speech pronouncing the word amant like any other word and you believed it and what have you proved by it what have you proved by this duel that you are a fool a durak that you are unsought and that's what every one calls you what will be the result of it this that you have made me the laughing-stock of all moscow this that every one will say that you while in a drunken fit and not knowing what you were about challenged a man of whom you were jealous without any reason ellen kept raising her voice and growing more and more excited a man superior to you in every sense of the word hum hum bellowed pierre scowling but not looking at her or stirring and why did you believe that he was my paramour why was it because i liked his society if you had been brighter and more agreeable i should have preferred yours do not speak to me i beg of you whispered pierre hoarsely why shouldn't i speak to you i have a right to speak and i tell you up and down that it's rare to find a woman with a husband like you who doesn't console herself with lovers and that is a thing which i haven't done said she pierre started to say something looked at her with strange eyes the expression of which she could not understand and again threw himself back at that moment he was suffering physical pain his chest was oppressed and he could not breathe he knew that it behooved him to do something to put an end to his torment but what he wanted to do was too horrible we had better part he exclaimed in a broken voice by all means part provided only you give me enough said ellen part that's nothing to scare one pierre sprang from the sofa and staggered toward her i will kill you he cried and seizing from the table a marble slab with a force such as he had never before possessed rushed toward her brandishing it in the air ellen's face was filled with horror she screamed and sprang away from him his father's nature suddenly became manifest in him pierre experienced the rapture and fascination of frenzy he flung down the marble breaking it in fragments and with raised arms flew at her crying away with such a terrible voice that it rang through the whole house and filled every one with horror god knows what pierre would have done at that moment if ellen had not escaped from the room at the end of the week pierre had given to his wife a power of attorney for the control of all his great russian possessions which amounted to the larger half of his property and returned alone to petersburg end of chapter six part one chapter seven of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this slipper-box recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter seven two months had elapsed since the news of the battle of austerlitz and the death of prince andrei had been received at luisia guri and in spite of all the letters sent through the diplomatic service and all inquiries his body had not been recovered and his name was not on the lists of prisoners worse than all for his relatives was the very hope that still remained that he had been picked up on the battlefield by some of the natives and might even now be convalescing or dying somewhere alone among strangers and unable to send them any word 
In the newspapers from which the old prince had first learned of the Battle of Austerlitz, it was stated, as usual, in the briefest and vaguest terms, that the Russians, after brilliant deeds of arms, had been compelled to retreat, and had accomplished this with the greatest order possible. The old prince understood from this official bulletin that our troops had been defeated. A week after the receipt of the newspapers, which informed him of the Battle of Austerlitz, a letter came from Kutuzov, who announced the fate that had befallen his son. "'Your son,' wrote Kutuzov, "'before my eyes, fell at the head of his regiment, with the standard in his hands, like a hero worthy of his father and his fatherland. To the universal regret of all the army, including myself, it is as yet uncertain whether he is alive or dead. I flatter myself with the hope that your son is still alive, for, on the contrary case, he would certainly have been mentioned among the officers found on the field of battle, the list of which was brought me under a flag of truce. Receiving this news late in the afternoon when he was alone in his cabinet, the old prince, as usual, went the next day to take his morning promenade. But he had nothing to say to the overseer, the gardener, or the architect, and though his countenance was lowering, there was no outbreak of wrath. When, at the accustomed time, the Princess Maria went to him, he was standing at his bench and driving his lathe, but he did not glance up at her as usual when she entered the room. "'Ah, Princess Maria,' suddenly said he, in an unnatural tone, and threw down his chisel. The wheel continued to revolve from the impetus. The Princess Maria long remembered this dying whirr of the wheel, which was associated for her with what followed. The Princess Maria approached him, looked into his face, and suddenly something seemed to pull at her heartstrings. Her eyes ceased to see clearly. By her father's face, which was not melancholy or downcast, but wrathful and working unnaturally, she saw that now, now some terrible misfortune was threatening to overwhelm her, a misfortune than which none is worse in life, none more irreparable and incomprehensible, a misfortune such as she had never yet experienced, the death of one she loved. "'Mon père, André,' said the princess, and she who was ordinarily so clumsy and awkward became endowed with such inexpressible charm of grief and self-forgetfulness that her father could not endure her glance, and, with a sob, turned away. "'I have had news. He is not among the prisoners. He is not on the list of the dead. Kutuzov has written me.' he cried in a shrill voice, as though wishing by this cry to drive the princess away. He is killed. The princess did not fall. She did not even faint. She was pale to begin with, but when she heard these words, her face altered, and a light seemed to gleam in her beautiful, lustrous eyes. Something like joy, a supernatural joy, independent of the sorrows and joys of this world, was breathed above this violent grief that filled her heart. She forgot all her fear of her father, and went up to him, took him by the hand, and drew him to her, and threw her arm around his thin, sinewy neck. "'Mon père,' said she, "'do not turn away from me. Let us weep together.' "'Villains! Scoundrels!' cried the old man, averting his face from her. "'To destroy the army! To waste men's lives in that way! What for?' Go. Go and tell Lisa. The princess fell back feebly into the armchair near her father and burst into tears. She could now see her brother as he looked at the moment when he bade her and Lisa farewell with his affectionate and at the same time rather haughty face. She could see him as he tenderly and yet scornfully hung the medallion round his neck. Did he come to believe? Had he repented of his unbelief? Was he yonder now? yonder in the mansions of eternal calm and bliss. These were the questions that filled her thoughts. "'Mon père, tell me how it happened,' said she, through her tears. "'Go, go. He was killed in the defeat where the best men of Russia and the Russian glory were led out to sacrifice. Go, Princess Maria. Go and tell Lisa. I will follow.' When the Princess Maria left her father, she found the little princess sitting at her work, with that expression of inward calm and happiness peculiar to women in her condition. She looked up as her sister-in-law came in. It was evident that her eyes did not see the Princess Maria, but were rather profoundly searching into the tremendous and blessed mystery that was taking place within her. "'Marie,' 
said she, turning from her embroidery frame and leaning back. Let me have your hand. She took the princess's hand and laid it just below her heart. Her eyes smiled with anticipation. The little downy lip was raised in a happy, childlike smile. The princess Maria knelt down before her and buried her face in the folds of her sister-in-law's dress. There, there, do you not perceive it? It is so strange. And do you know, Marie, I am going to love him very dearly, said Lisa, looking with shining happy eyes at her husband's sister. The princess Maria could not raise her head. She was weeping. What is the matter, Masha? Nothing. Only I felt sad. Sad about Andre, she replied, wiping away her tears on her sister-in-law's knee. Several times in the course of the morning the Princess Maria attempted to break the news to her sister-in-law, and each time she had to weep. These tears, the cause for which the little princess could not understand, alarmed her, unobservant as her nature was. She made no remark, but she looked around in some alarm, as if searching for someone. Before dinner the old prince came into her room, and went right out again without saying a word. She was always afraid of him, but now his face was so disturbed and stern that she gazed at the Princess Maria, then fell into a brown study, with her eyes, as it were, turned inward with that expression so characteristic of women in her condition, and suddenly burst into tears. "'Have you heard anything from André?' she asked. "'No. You know that it isn't time yet to get news, but mon père is anxious, and it frightens me.' "'Then there's nothing?' "'Nothing,' replied the Princess Maria, letting her lustrous eyes rest unflinchingly on her sister-in-law. She had made up her mind not to tell her, and had persuaded her father to conceal the terrible tidings from her until her confinement, which would be now before many days. The Princess Maria and the old prince, each according to their own nature, bore and hid their grief. The old prince was not willing to indulge in hopes. He had made up his mind that Princess Andre was killed, and although he sent a chinovnik to Austria to make diligent search for traces of his son, he commanded him to order in Moscow a gravestone to be erected in his garden, and he told everyone that his son was dead. He himself aged rapidly. He unchangeably carried out the rigorous routine of his life, but his strength failed him. He took shorter walks, ate less, slept less, and each day grew weaker. The Princess Maria still hoped, she prayed for her brother, as though he were alive, and all the time was on the lookout for news of his return. End of chapter 7 Part 1, Chapter 8 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 8 Ma bonne amie, said the little princess after breakfast on the morning of the thirty-first of march and her downy upper lip was lifted out of mere habit for a certain sense of melancholy had affected not only the talk but the footsteps of all in this house ever since the receipt of the terrible news so that even the little princess had come under the influence of it and she smiled in such a way that it reminded one even more of the general depression ma bonne amie i am afraid my frühstück this morning as Foka, the cook calls it, did not agree with me. What's the matter, sweetheart? You are pale? Ah, you are very, very pale, said the Princess Maria, alarmed, and going toward her sister-in-law with her heavy but gentle steps. Your illustriousness, shan't we call Maria Bogdanovna? inquired one of the maids, who happened to be present. Maria Bogdanovna was the midwife from the Shire town, who had now been living at Luisia Gurieu, for a fortnight. It certainly may be necessary, replied the Princess Maria. I will go. Courage, mon ange. She kissed Lisa and started to leave the room. Ah, oh, no, no. And over and above the pallor arising from physical suffering, the little princess's face showed a childish fear of unendurable agony. Non, c'est l'estomac, dit, que c'est l'estomac, dit, Marie, dit and the princess wept, childishly, capriciously, and perhaps rather hypocritically, wringing her hands. The young princess went from the room, in search of Marya Bogdanovna. Mon Dieu, mon Dieu, oh, was heard behind her. 
rubbing her plump small white hands the midwife came to meet her with a significant but perfectly composed expression of countenance marya bogdanovna i think it is beginning said the princess marya looking at the midwife with terrified wide-open eyes well then glory to god for that princess said marya bogdanovna not quickening her steps you young ladies have no need to know anything about it but what shall we do if the doctor from moscow has not come yet asked the princess by liza and prince andrei's desire they had sent to moscow for an acquisher and he was expected at any moment no matter princess don't be alarmed said marya bogdanovna it will come out all right even without a doctor in the course of five minutes the young princess heard as she sat in her room the sound of men carrying something heavy she looked out and saw the servants for some reason or other carrying into the sleeping-room the leather divan which had always stood in prince andrei's study there was an expression of gentleness and solemnity on the faces of the men who were lugging this the princess marya sat alone in her room listening to the various sounds of the house and occasionally opening the door when any one passed and trying to make out what was going on in the corridor a number of women with light steps were moving hither and thither and they gave a glance at the young princess and turned away she did not venture to ask any questions but shut her door went back to her own bedroom sat down for a little in her armchair then hastened to her oratory and bent on her knees before the kyot or shrine of images to her dismay and surprise she found that prayer did not aid her in calming her agitation suddenly the door of her room was softly opened and on the threshold appeared her old nurse prashkovya savishna with a kerchief tied over her head it was almost never that she came to the princess's room as her father had expressly forbidden it god be with you mashenka i have come to sit a little while said the nurse and here are the prince's wedding tapers i have brought to light before the saint my angel she added with a sigh ach how glad i am nurse god is merciful my dove the old nurse lit the tapers in the golden candlesticks before the shrine and then sat down by the door with her knitting the princess marya took a book and began to read only when they heard footsteps or voices the princess would glance up with frightened anxious face and the nurse would look at her with a soothing expression in all parts of the house every one was dominated by the same feelings which the princess marya experienced as she sat in her room in accordance with the old superstition that the fewer people know of the sufferings of a woman in labor the less she suffers all pretended to be ignorant of what was going on no one spoke about it but everybody over and above the habitual gravity and respectful propriety that obtained in the prince's household evidently shared the general anxiety tender-heartedness and consciousness that something great incomprehensible and solemn was taking place at that hour there was no sound of laughing heard in the great room devoted to the maidservants in the official naya all the men sat silent as if waiting for something the servants kept pine knots and candles burning and did not think of going to sleep the old prince walking on his heels strode up and down his cabinet and at last ordered tikhon to go to marya bogdanovna merely say the prince has sent to ask and come and tell me what she says inform the prince that labor has begun said marya bogdanovna giving the messenger a significant look tikhon went and reported to the prince very good exclaimed the prince closing the door behind him tikhon heard not the slightest sound in the cabinet after waiting some time tikhon went into the cabinet pretending that it was to snuff the candles and seeing the prince lying on the sofa he looked at his agitated face shook his head then silently stepping up to him and kissing him on the shoulder he left the room forgetting to snuff the candles and not saying why he had gone in the most solemn mystery in the world was in process of consummation the evening passed the night wore away and the sense of expectancy and solemnified thought at the presence of the ineffable grew intenser rather than grew weaker no one slept it was one of those nights in march when winter seems determined to resume his sway and scatters with rage and despair his last snows and gusts of wind a relay of horses had been sent along the highway to meet the german doctor from moscow who was every moment expected and horsemen with lanterns were sent out to the junction of the cross-road to guide him safely by the pitfalls and watery hollows the princess marya had long since laid down her book she was sitting in perfect silence with her lustrous eyes fastened on her old nurse's wrinkled face 
every line of which she knew so well, on the little tuft of grey hair that had escaped from under her kerchief, and on the loose flesh hanging under her chin. Yanya Savishna, with her unfinished stocking in her hand, was telling in a low voice, without heeding her own words, the story that she had told a hundred times, about the late princess, and how she had been delivered of the Princess Maria in Kishinev, with an old Moldavian peasant woman for a midwife. "'God is merciful. Doctors are never needed,' she was saying. Suddenly a gust of wind beat violently against the window frame. It was always a whim of the princess to have the double windows taken off from at least one of the windows in each room as soon as the larks made their appearance, and burst the carelessly pushed bolt, while a draught of cold air laden with snow shook the silken curtains and puffed out the light. The princess shuddered. The old nyanya, laying down her stocking, went to the window, and leaning out, tried to shut it too again. The cold wind fluttered the ends of her kerchief and the grey locks of her dishevelled hair. "'Princess! Matushka! Someone's coming up the prushpet, cried she, getting hold of the window but not closing it. "'With lanterns! It must be the doctor!' "'Ah! Oh, glory to God! Salva Bohu!' exclaimed the Princess Maria. "'I must go and meet him. He won't be able to speak Russian.' The Princess Maria wrapped her shawl around her and hastened down to meet the visitors. When she reached the anteroom, she looked through the window and saw a team and lanterns standing at the front doorsteps. She went out on the landing. On the foot of the balustrade flamed a tallow candle guttering in the wind. The groom, Philip, with a terrified face, and with another candle in his hand, stood lower down on the first landing of the staircase. Still lower down, at the turning of the staircase, were heard advancing footsteps in thick boots and a voice which struck the Princess Maria as strangely familiar was saying something. "'Thank God! Salva Bohu!' said the voice. "'And my father?' "'He has gone to bed,' replied the voice of Demian, the major-domo, who had by this time come down. Then the well-known voice asked something, and Demian answered, and the steps in the thick boots came swifter up the stairs and nearer to the princess, out of sight around the turn. "'It is Andre,' said the princess to herself." No, it cannot be. It would be too extraordinary, she thought, and at the very moment that this thought occurred to her, on the landing where stood the servant with the candle appeared Prince Andrei's form, enveloped in a fur shuba, the collar all powdered with snow. Yes, it was he, but pale and thin, and with an altered and strangely gentle but anxious expression. He ran up the stairs and clasped his sister in his arms. You didn't receive my letter, he asked and not waiting for her reply, which, indeed, he would not have received, for the princess was too much moved to speak, he turned back, and joined by the accusher, who had come with him, he had overtaken him at the last post-station, with hasty steps flew up the stairs again, and again embraced his sister. "'What luck!' he cried, "'dear Masha!' And flinging off his shuba and boots, he went into his wife's room. End of chapter 8「Part One, Chapter Nine of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Nine The little princess, in a white cap, was laying on the pillows, for the moment she was a little easier. Her dark locks fell in disorder over her flushed cheeks, wet with perspiration. Her rosy, fascinating mouth, with its downy upper lip, was open, and she wore a smile of joy. Prince André went into the room and paused in front of her, at the foot of the sofa on which she lay. Her brilliant eyes, looking at him with childish trepidation and anxiety, rested on him without a change of expression. "'I love you all. I haven't done anyone any harm. Why must I suffer so? Help me,' her expression seemed to say." She saw her husband, but seemed to have no comprehension of the significance of his appearing just at this time before her. Prince Andrei went round to the side of the sofa and kissed her on the forehead. "'My darling heart, Dushenka Moya,' he said. He had never called her by this endearing term before. "'God is merciful.' She looked at him with a questioning, childishly offended expression. "'I expected help from thee, and none comes. None comes.' her eyes seemed to say. She was not surprised at his coming. She did not even realize that he had come. His appearance had nothing to do with her agony, 
and the assuagement of it. The pains began again, and Maria Bogdanovna advised Prince Andrei to leave the room. The accoucheur entered the room. Prince Andrei went out, and meeting his sister he again joined her. They began to talk in a whisper, but the conversation was constantly interrupted by silences. They kept waiting and listening. Allez, mon ami, said the Prince Maria. Prince Andrei again went to his wife, and then sat down in the adjoining room. Some woman or other came out of her room with a terrified face and was confused when she saw Prince Andrei. He covered his face with his hands and sat thus for some minutes. Pitiful, heart-breaking groans were heard in the other room. Prince Andrei stood up and went to the door and was about to open it. Someone held it too. "'You can't come in. It is impossible,' said a terrified voice on the other side. He began to pace up and down the room. The cries had ceased. A few seconds more passed, when suddenly a terrible cry, it could not be his wife's, she could not cry like that, rang through the next room. Prince Andrei hastened to the door. This cry ceased. A baby's wailing was heard. What have they brought a baby in there for? was Prince Andrei's query at first. A baby? What baby? Why a baby there? Or can my baby have been born? Then he suddenly realized all the joyful significance of this cry. The tears choked him, and leaning both his elbows on the window seat, he wept and sobbed like a child. The door opened. The doctor, with his shirt sleeves rolled up, without his coat, pale and with trembling jaw, came from the room. Prince Andrei went to him, but the doctor looked at him with a strange expression of confusion, and without saying a word passed by him. A woman came running out, but when she saw Prince Andrei stopped short on the threshold. He went into his wife's room. She was dead, lying in the same position in which he had seen her five minutes before, and notwithstanding the fixity of her eyes and the pallor of her cheeks, that charming little childish face with the lip shaded with dark hairs wore the same expression as before. I love you all, and I have done no one any harm, and what have you done to me? said her lovely face, pitifully pale in death. In the corner of the room, a small red object was yelping and wailing in the trembling white hands of Maria Bogdanovna. Two hours later, Prince Andrei, with noiseless steps, went to his father's cabinet. The old prince had already been informed of everything. He was standing by the very door, and as soon as it was thrown open, the old man, without speaking, flung his rough, aged hands around his son's neck and held him as in a vice and sobbed like a child. Three days later they buried the little princess, and Prince Andrei went up the steps to the coffin to take his last farewell. And there also in the coffin lay the same face, though with closed eyes. Ah, what have you done to me? It all seemed to say. Prince Andrei felt that his heartstrings were torn within him, that he had done a wrong that could never be repaired or forgotten. His grief was too deep for tears. The old prince also came and kissed her waxen hand, placidly folded upon her breast, and to him her face seemed to say, Ach, and why have you done this to me? And the old man, after looking into her face, abruptly turned away. Then, again, five days later, they christened the baby prince, Nikolai Andreitch. The nurse held up the little garments against her chin, while the priest with the goose quill anointed with holy oil the infant's wrinkled little pink palms and soles. His grandfather, who acted as sponsor, with tottering steps and afraid of dropping him, carried the little prince around the tin-lined font and handed him over to his godmother, the Princess Maria. Prince Andrei, in deathly apprehension lest they should drop the child, sat in the next room, waiting for the conclusion of the sacrament. He looked joyfully at his baby when the nurse brought him to him, nodded his head with great satisfaction when the nurse confided to him that the lump of wax, with some of the infant's hairs on it, when thrown into the font, did not sink, but floated. Footnote. It is part of the Russian baptismal service for the priest to cut the infant's hair. The superstition considers it unlucky for the bit of wax with a few of these hairs attached to sink if placed in the waters of the baptismal font, and lucky for it to float. And a footnote. End of chapter 9
Part One, Chapter Ten of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Ten. The part played by Rostov in the duel between Dolokhov and Buzikoy was ignored through the old count's efforts, and the young man, instead of being cashiered as he anticipated, was appointed adjutant to the governor general of Moscow. In consequence of this, he was unable to go to the country with the rest of the family, but was kept in Moscow all summer, engaged in his new duties. Dolokhov recovered, and he and Rostov became great friends during the time of his convalescence. He had been carried to the residence of his mother, who loved him passionately and devotedly. The elderly Marya Ivanovna, becoming attached to Rostov on account of his friendship for her Fedya, often talked with him about her son. Yes, Count, he is too noble and high-souled for this corrupt world of ours. No one loves goodness. It serves as a reproach to everyone. Now tell me, Count, tell me honestly, was it fair and honorable on Buzikoy's part? And Fedya, with all his noble nature, always liked him, and now never says hard things about him at all. And in Petersburg they played all those tricks on the policemen. They did it together, didn't they? Well, Buzikoy went scot-free, and my Fedya had to bear the whole brunt of it on his shoulders. Yes, he had to bear it all. To be sure, he has been restored to his rank, but why shouldn't he have been? I don't believe the fatherland has many braver sons than he is. And now in regard to this duel, have such men any feeling, any honor, knowing that he was an only son, to challenge him to fight a duel, and then to fire right at him? Fortunately, God helped us. And what was it all about? Who is there in our day who doesn't form intrigues? Why should he be so jealous? I should think he might have given some signs of it before. And here a year has gone by. And so he challenged him, supposing that Fedya would not accept because he owed him some money. How nasty of him! I know you appreciate Fedka, my dear Count, and so I love you with my whole heart, believe me. There aren't many who understand him. He has such a lofty, heavenly nature. Dolokhov himself, during his convalescence, often said things to Rostov that no one would have ever expected from him. I am supposed to be a bad man, I know, said he, and let them think so. I don't care anything about the opinions of men unless I am fond of them. But if I am fond of any one, I am so fond of them that I would give my life for them. And as for the rest... If they stood in my way, I would push them to the wall. My mother is a dear, precious woman, and I have two or three others, you among the number. And as for the rest, I only heed them as so many who may be able to be useful or injurious to me. And almost all are injurious, especially the women. Yes, my dear, Dusha Moya, he went on to say, among men I meet many who are lovable, noble, elevated, but among women I have yet to meet one who is not to be bought. All are alike, countess and cook. I have yet to find that celestial purity, devotion, which I look for in a woman. If I were ever to find such a woman, I would give my life for her. But these, he made a depreciatory gesture. And you may not believe me, but if I prize my life still, it is simply because I hope some day to find one of these heavenly creatures who would regenerate me purify me and elevate me but you will not understand me indeed i understand perfectly replied rostof who was coming more and more under the influence of his new friend in the autumn the rostof family returned to moscow early in the winter denisov also came back and stayed with the rostofs the first months of this winter of eighteen o six which nikolai rostof spent in moscow could not have been happier for him and for all his family Nikolai brought home with him to his parents' home many young men. Vera was a pretty young lady of twenty summers. Sonya was just sixteen and had all the charm of an opening flower. Natasha, half child and half maiden, was now at one moment full of innocent merriment, at the next showing all the fascination of a young lady. The house of the Rostovs at this time seemed to be full of the peculiar atmosphere of loveliness characteristic of homes where there are very pretty and very young ladies. Every young man who came there and saw these bright, impressionable, girlish faces, smiling apparently from very happiness, and the merry running to and fro, 
and heard that continual chattering of maidens' voices, inconsequential, illogical, kindly to everyone, ready for anything, and full of hope, and listened to those inconsequential sounds, now of singing, now of instrumental music, must have experienced one and the same feeling of predisposition for love and coming happiness, which the young people of the Rostov household themselves experienced. Among the young men whom Rostov introduced at home was Dolokhov, one of the first, and every one, with the exception of Natasha, was pleased with him. She almost quarrelled with her brother concerning him. She insisted that he was a bad man, that Pierre was in the right in his duel with Dolokhov, and the other in the wrong, and that he was disagreeable and insincere. "'There's nothing for me to understand,' cried Natasha, with stubborn self-will. "'He is bad, and lacks feeling. Now, here, I like your Denisov. He may be a spendthrift, and all that, but still I like him, and I certainly understand him. I don't know how to express it to you, but everything that he does has some ulterior object, and I don't like him. But Denisov—' "'There, now, Denisov is quite another matter,' replied Nikolai, giving her to understand that in comparison with Dolokhov, Denisov was of no consequence. "'You ought to know what a tender heart this Dolokhov has. You ought to see him with his mother. What a warm-hearted fellow he is!' "'Well, I don't know anything about that, but I'm ill at ease with him. And do you know, he's in love with Sonya?' "'What nonsense! I'm certain of it. You can see for yourself.' Natasha's prognostication was justified. Dolokhov, who did not like the society of ladies, had begun to be a frequent visitor at the Rostovs, and the problem what brought him there was quickly solved, and no one ventured to remark upon it. He came on account of Sonya, and Sonya, though she would never have dared to acknowledge such a thing, knew it very well, and every time that Dolokhov was announced, blushed as red as Kumach. Dolokhov often came to dinner at the Rostovs, he never missed an entertainment where they were to be found, and frequented the adolescent bowls given by Iogel, which the Rostovs always attended. He paid preeminent attention to Sonya, and looked at her with such eyes, that not only the girl herself could not endure his glances without blushing, but even the old countess and Natasha flushed if they caught sight of him looking at her. It was plain to see that this powerful, strange man was coming under the irresistible influence of this gracious, dark-eyed maiden, who, all the time, was in love with someone else. Rostov perceived that there was something new between Dolokhov and Sonya, but he could not make out what this relationship was. "'Everybody here is in love with someone,' he said to himself, referring to Sonya and Natasha. But he was no longer at his ease in the company of Sonya and Dolokhov, as before, and he began to be absent from home more frequently. In the autumn of 1806 there had been continual talk about war with Napoleon, and with even greater heat than the year before. A conscription of ten men in a thousand, and of nine militiamen to a thousand, in addition, was ordered. Everywhere anathemas were heaped upon Bonapartism, and nothing was talked about in Moscow except the coming war. For the Rostov family, all interest in these preparations for war were centred on the fact that Nikolushka would not hear of such a thing as remaining at home, and was only waiting for the end of Denisov's furlough in order to return with him to his regiment after the holidays. The approaching departure did not in any way prevent him from having a good time. It rather only seemed still more to spur them all on to enjoyment. The larger part of his time he spent away from the house, at dinners, receptions, and balls. End of chapter 10 Part 1, Chapter 11 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 11 On the third day of the Christmas holidays, Nikolai dined at home, a thing which he had rarely done of late. It was a sort of farewell dinner, as he and Denisov were going to start for their regiments after Epiphany. There were about twenty sat down at table, among the number Dolokhov and Denisov. Never at the Rostovs had that delicious breath of passion and that atmosphere of love made itself felt with such force as during these days of the Christmas tide. Seize these moments of happiness, let yourself drift into love, become enamoured yourself. This is the only genuine bliss in the world, 
everything else is dross and with this alone all of us here are exclusively occupied said this atmosphere nikolai as always tired out two spans of horses and yet had not had time enough to go to all the places where he was needed and summoned he came home just before dinner time as soon as he came in he noticed and felt this atmosphere so charged with the electrical tension of love but more especially he remarked a strange embarrassment existing among several of those who were gathered in the drawing-room peculiarly agitated were sonya dolokhov and the old countess and to a certain extent his sister natasha nikolai perceived that something must have happened between sonya and dolokhov and in accordance with his impulsive nature and the genuine tact characteristic of him he showed himself very affectionate and considerate toward these two that evening it being as we have already said the third day of the christmas tide there was to be one of the balls which Iogel, the dancing master used to give during the holidays to the young men and women of his clientele nikolenka you will go to Iogel's, won't you please do said natasha to him he invited you especially and vasily dmitritch is going by vasily dmitritch she meant denisov where wouldn't i go at the countess's request exclaimed denisov who in a joking way occupied in the rostov household the position of knight to natasha i am ready to dance even the pas de chale i will if i have time i promise to go to the arkharovs who have a party this evening said nikolai and you he asked turning to dolokhov but the moment the words had left his lip he perceived that he had committed a blunder yes perhaps so replied dolokhov coolly and laconically glancing at sonya frowning and giving nikolai exactly the same sort of a look that he had given pierre the night of the dinner to bagration at the club there must be something up said nikolai to himself and he was still further confirmed in this impression by the fact that dolokhov took his departure immediately after dinner he called natasha to him and asked what the matter was and i was just looking for you exclaimed natasha running to him i told you so but you would not believe me she said triumphantly he has proposed for sonya little as sonya had occupied nikolai's thoughts during these last weeks still he felt a sort of pang when he learned this dolokhov was a suitable and in some respects a brilliant match for the dowerless orphan sonya from the old countess's standpoint and that of society it was simple madness to refuse him and therefore nikolai's first feeling on hearing this piece of news was that of indignation against the girl he had it on his tongue's end to say and it is an excellent thing of course for her to forget her old promises and accept this first proposal but before he spoke natasha went on and can you imagine it she refused him absolutely refused him she told him that she loved someone else she added after a moment's silence yes and could my sonya have done anything else thought nikolai in spite of all mamma's arguments she refused him and i know that she won't change her decision if she said that and mamma tried to persuade her he asked reproachfully yes said natasha and now nikolenka and don't be vexed but i know you will never marry her i am sure of it god knows why but i am perfectly certain that you will never marry her well you know nothing about it at all said nikolai but i must have a little talk with her how charming she is our sonya he added with a smile charming indeed she is i will send her to you and natasha kissing her brother ran away in a moment sonya came in alarmed and abashed as though she had been doing something wrong nikolai went to and kissed her hand this was the first opportunity that they had enjoyed for some time of being alone together and talking about their love sophie he said timidly and then all the time growing more and more confident if you have seen fit to refuse it is not only a brilliant but a very advantageous offer he is a splendid noble fellow and he is a friend of mine sonya interrupted him i have already refused him she said hastily if you have refused him for my sake then i am afraid that i sonya again interrupted him she looked at him with beseeching frightened eyes nicholas don't speak of that please said she nay but i must maybe it is suffisance unbounded conceit on my part 
but it is better to speak. If you have refused him for my sake, then I ought to tell you the whole truth. I love you, I think, more than all. That is all I want, said Sonya, with a sigh. No, but I have fallen in love a thousand times, and I shall fall in love again, but I shall never find any one so friendly, so true, so lovely as you. But then I am young. Maman does not approve of this. So, then, simply, I can't make any promises. And I beg of you to reconsider Dolokhov's proposal, said he, finding it hard to speak his friend's name. Don't mention such a thing. I have no desires at all. I love you as though you were my brother, and shall always love you, and that is quite enough for me. You are an angel. I am not worthy of you. But what I am afraid is that I might deceive you. Nikolai once more kissed her hand. End of chapter 11「Part One, Chapter Twelve of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Twelve. Algel has the jolliest balls in Moscow. This was what the mamas said as they looked at their adolescence, practicing the steps which they had just been learning. This was said also by the grown-up girls and young men who came to these balls with just a shade of condescension, and, nevertheless, found there the very best amusement. This very same year, two engagements had resulted from these balls. The two pretty princesses, Gorchakova, found husbands there, and brought these balls into still greater vogue. Their peculiarity was the lack of any host or hostess. They merely had the good-natured Iogel, light as the flying down, bowing and scraping, according to the rules of his art, and almost all his guests were those from whom he had received banknotes in payment for dancing lessons. The fact was only those came to these balls who liked to dance, and have a good time with the zest of thirteen or fourteen-year-old maidens wearing a long dress for the first time in their lives. All, with rare exceptions, were pretty, or at least seemed to be. How enthusiastically they all smiled, and how eloquent were their sparkling eyes! Sometimes even the pas de chale, or shawl figure was danced by his most advanced pupils, and of these Natasha was the best, being distinguished for her grace. But at this, the last of the season, they danced only Schottisches and Glacis, and the Mazurka, which was now beginning to be fashionable. Ilgel engaged for the ball the large drawing-room in the Buzikov mansion, and the ball was a great success, as everyone confessed. Many were the pretty girls, and the Rostov maidens were among the prettiest. Both of them were remarkably happy and gay. That evening, before she started, Sonya, proud of Dolokhov's proposal, of her refusal of him, and her explanation with Nikolai, whirled around the house, scarcely giving her maid a chance to comb her hair, and now she was perfectly transfigured with impetuous delight. Natasha, not less proud of going to this ball, for the first time in a long dress, was even more radiant. Both wore muslin gowns with pink ribbons. The moment they entered the ballroom, Natasha began to be enamoured of everyone. She was not enamoured of any one in particular, but of all. Whomever her eyes happened to fall upon, with him she was deeply in love for the time being. Ah, how nice it is, she kept saying, whenever she met Sonya. Nikolai and Denisov strolled through the rooms, looking graciously and condescendingly on the dancers. How pretty she is! She will be a waving beauty. Who? The Countess Natasha, replied Denisov, and how charmingly she dances. What grace, he said once more, after a little pause. Whom are you talking about? I was referring to your sister, said Denisov testily. Rostov smiled. My dear Count, you are one of my best pupils. You must dance, said the little Iogel, coming up to Nikolai. Just see what a lot of pretty girls. And with the same request he turned to Denisov, who also had been one of his pupils. No, my dear, I prefer to be a wallflower, replied Denisov. Don't you remember how illy I profited by your lessons? Oh, no, said Iogel, hastening to reassure him. You were only somewhat inattentive, but you had the ability. Oh, yes, you had the ability. The band now began to play the newly introduced mazurka. Nikolai could not refuse Iogel, 
and invited Sonya as his partner. Denisov sat down with some of the elderly ladies, and leaning his elbows on his sword, and beating time with his foot, told jolly stories and made the old ladies laugh, while his eyes followed the young people dancing. Algel led with the mazurka, with Natasha, who was his pride and his best pupil. Noiselessly, skillfully shuffling his feet, shod in pumps, Algel flew around the hall with Natasha, rather timid, but nevertheless performing all the steps with the utmost care. Denisov did not take his eyes from her, and thumped his sword in time, with an expression that said clearly that he was not dancing simply because he did not care to, and not because he was not able. In the midst of the figure he saw Rostov passing, and called to him. "'That's no way at all,' he said. "'Do you call that the Polish mazurka? But she dances admirably, though.' Knowing that Denisov in Poland had won a great reputation for his skill in dancing, the genuine Polish mazurka, Nikolai glided over to Natasha. "'Go ahead,' said he. "'Choose Denisov. He dances splendidly. It's wonderful.' When it came Natasha's turn again, she got up and swiftly chasseing across the hall in her dainty slippers, trimmed with rosettes. She blushingly made her way to the corner where Denisov was sitting. She saw that all were looking at her and waiting. Nikolai noticed that Denisov and Natasha were having a playful quarrel, and that the former refused, but smiled with gratification. He went up to them. "'Please, Vasily Dmitritch," said Natasha, "'please, come do. I pray you, let me off, Countess.' "'There, there, that's no excuse, Vasya,' said Nikolai. "'You're like two kittens trying to persuade Vasak, the old cat,' said Denisov jestingly. "'I will sing a whole evening for you,' pleaded Natasha. "'The little enchantress can do what she likes with me,' exclaimed Denisov, and he laid aside his sword. He made his way out from among the chairs, firmly grasped his partner's hand, threw back his head, and put his feet in position, waiting to catch the beat of the music.' Only on horseback, or while dancing the mazurka, was Denisov's small stature lost sight of, and he appeared to be the gallant young hero that he felt himself to be. While waiting to get the time, he glanced up at his partner triumphantly and mischievously, then suddenly wrapped his heel to the floor and, like a tennis ball, bounded up elastically and sped out into the middle of the room, carrying his lady with him. Noiselessly he flew half across the hall on one foot, and apparently, not seeing the chairs ranged in front of him, was like to have run right into them, but suddenly, clinking his spurs and spreading his legs, he stopped on his heels, stood so for a second, then, with a clanking of his spurs, making a sort of double shuffle, quickly turned about, and with his left heel clicking against the right, he again chasséed around the circle. Natasha realized by a sort of intuition what he intended to do, and herself not knowing how, simply followed him, and gave herself up to his guidance. Now he put his left arm around her waist, then his right. Now he would fall on his knee and cause her to pirouette around him, and then again he would spring up and chasse off in a straight line with such impetuosity, without even taking breath, that it seemed as though they were going straight through all the rooms. Then suddenly he would come to a pause again and execute some other new and unexpected evolution." When at last, swiftly whirling his lady about in front of her own seat and jingling his spurs, he made her a low bow. Natasha forgot to perform a curtsy. In perplexity she fixed her eyes upon him, smiling. It seemed to her that she did not know him. "'What does this mean?' she asked herself. Although Iogel refused to acknowledge such a dance as a proper mazurka, all were in raptures over the skill manifested. Denisov was in constant requisition as a partner— and the old people, smiling, began to talk about Poland and about the good old times. Denisov, flushed from the exertion of the mazurka, and wiping his face with his handkerchief, sat down next Natasha, and through the rest of the evening did not leave her side. End of chapter 12this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 13 For two days Rostov had not seen Dolokhov at his house, or found him at home. On the third day he received a note from him. As I intend never to visit your house again, from reasons which you may appreciate, and as I am about to rejoin my regiment, I am going to give to my friends a farewell supper this evening. Come to the Hôtel de Angleterre. At ten o'clock that evening, after the theatre, where he had been with Denisov and his family, 
Rostov repaired to the place which Dolokhov had designated. He was immediately shown into the handsomest room of the hotel, which Dolokhov had hired for the occasion. A score of men were gathered around the table, at the head of which sat Dolokhov between two candles. There was a pile of gold and bills on the table, and Dolokhov was keeping the bank. Since Dolokhov's proposal and Sonya's refusal, Nikolai had not seen him, and he felt a slight sense of confusion at the thought of their meeting. Dolokhov's keen, cold eyes met Nikolai's the moment he entered the room, as though he had been waiting for him for some time. "'We have not met for several days,' said Dolokhov. "'Thank you for coming. Here, I will only finish this hand. Alushka and his chorus are coming.' "'I have called at your house,' said Rostov, reddening." Dolokhov made no answer. "'You may bet, if you will.' Rostov recalled a strange conversation which he had once had with Dolokhov. "'Only fools play on chance,' had been Dolokhov's remark at the time. "'But perhaps you are afraid to play with me,' said Dolokhov now, as though he read Rostov's thought, and he smiled. In spite of that smile, Rostov could plainly see that he was in the same frame of mind that he had been at the time of the dinner at the club, or, one might say, at any of those times when, as it were, Dolokhov felt himself under the necessity of breaking the monotony of his quiet life by some outre and usually outrageous action. Rostov felt ill at ease. He racked his brain, but was unable to find an appropriate repartee for Dolokhov's words. But before he had a chance to reply, Dolokhov, looking straight into Rostov's face, and slowly, with deliberate intervals between the words, and loud enough for all to hear, do you remember you and i were talking once about gambling it's a fool a durak who is willing to play games of chance one ought to play a sure hand i said so but i'm going to try it anyway take the chance or the sure thing i wonder which thought rostov well you'd better not play he added and springing the freshly opened pack of cards, he added, Bank, gentlemen. Pushing the money forward, Dolokhov prepared to start the bank, and Rostov took a seat near him, and at first did not play. Dolokhov glanced at him. What? Won't you take a hand? And strangely enough, Nikolai felt it incumbent upon him to take a card and stake an insignificant sum. It was thus that he began to play. I have no money with me, he said. I will trust you. Rostov named five roubles as his stake and lost. He staked again, and again he lost. Dolokhov trumped. In other words, took Rostov's stake ten times running. Gentlemen, said he, after he had been keeping the bank some time, I beg of you to lay your stakes on the cards, otherwise I may become confused in the accounts. One of the players ventured the hope that he was to be trusted. Trusted, certainly, but I am afraid of getting the accounts mixed. I beg of you to lay your money on the cards, replied Dolokhov. Don't you worry yourself. You and I will settle our accounts afterwards, he added, turning to Rostov. The game went on. The servant kept filling their glasses with champagne. All Rostov's cards failed to be matched, and his losses amounted to 800 rubles. He was just writing down on the back of a card 800 rubles, but as it happened that at that moment a glass of champagne was handed him, he hesitated and once more staked the sum that he had been risking all along, that is, twenty roubles. "'Make it that,' said Dolokhov, though he was apparently not looking at Rostov. "'You'll win it back all the quicker. The others win, but you keep losing. Or are you afraid of me?' he insisted. Rostov acquiesced, staked the eight hundred which he had written down on a seven of hearts with a bent corner which he had picked up from the floor. He remembered it well enough afterwards. He laid down this seven of hearts, after writing on the piece torn off, the figures eight hundred, in large, distinct characters. He drank the glass of foaming champagne handed him by the waiter, smiled at Dolokhov's words, and with anxious heart, while hoping that a seven would turn up, watched the pack of cards in Dolokhov's hands. The gain or loss dependent upon this seven of hearts would have very serious consequences for Rostov. On the preceding Sunday, Count Ilya Andreyitch had given to his son two thousand roubles, and although he generally disliked to speak of his pecuniary difficulties, he told him that he could not have any more till May, and therefore begged him for this once to be rather economical. 
Nikolai had told him that that would be amply sufficient, and gave him his word of honor not to ask for any more money till spring. And now, out of that sum, only twelve hundred roubles were left. Of course, that seven of hearts, if he lost on it, would signify not only the loss of sixteen hundred roubles, but also the necessity of breaking his word to his father. With heart sinking, therefore, he watched Dolokhov's hands and said to himself, now let him hurry up and give me this card, and I will put on my cap and go home to supper with Denisov, Natasha, and Sonya, and truly I will never, as long as I live, take a card into my hands again. At that instant his home life, his romps with Petya, his talks with Sonya, his duets with Natasha, his game of piquet with his father, and even his peaceful bed, in his home on the Parvaskaya, came over him with such force and vividness and attraction that it seemed to him like an inestimable bliss that had passed and been destroyed for ever. He could not bring himself to believe that blind chance, by throwing the seven of hearts to the right rather than to the left, might deprive him of all this just comprehended and just appreciated happiness, and plunge him into the abyss of a wretchedness never before experienced, and of which he had no adequate idea. It could not be so and yet with a fever of expectation he watched every motion of dolokhof's hands those coarse reddish hands with wide knuckles and hairy wrists showing from under his shirt-bands laid down the pack of cards and took up the champagne glass that had been handed him and put his pipe in his mouth and so you are not afraid to play with me repeated dolokhof and as though for the purpose of telling some humorous story he laid down the cards leaned back in his chair and with a smile deliberately began to speak yes gentlemen i have been told that there is a report current in moscow that i am a sharper and so i advise you to be on your guard against me come now deal ahead said rostof ach these moscow grannies exclaimed dolokhof and with a smile he took up the cards ach almost screamed rostof clasping his head with both hands the seven which he needed already lay on top the very first card in the pack he had lost more than he could pay I wouldn't ruin myself, said Dolokhov, giving Rostov a passing glance, and proceeding to shuffle the cards. End of chapter 13during the next hour and a half the majority of the gamblers watched with much amusement their own play the whole interest of the game centred on rostov alone instead of sixteen hundred roubles there was already a long column of figures which he had reckoned to be at least ten thousand roubles which he now vaguely imagined to be perhaps fifteen thousand in reality the sums footed up to more than twenty thousand roubles dolokhof no longer listened to stories or told them himself he watched each motion of rostov's hands and occasionally cast hasty glances at the paper containing rostov's indebtedness he made up his mind to keep him playing until his losses should reach forty-three thousand roubles he had selected this number because forty-three represented the sum of his and sonya's ages rostov supporting his head in both hands sat in front of the table now all marked up with chalk wet with wine and littered with cards one special impression was painful but it did not restrain him those wide-jointed, red hands with the hairy wrists, those hands which he loved and which he also hated, held him in their power. Six hundred roubles, ace, quarter stakes, nine spot, impossible to win it back, and how gay is it at home? Knave on five, it cannot be. And why is he treating me so? thought Rostov, and he remembered. Sometimes he staked on a card a large sum, but Dolokhov refused to accept it, and himself named a lower figure. Nikolai would submit, and then pray God, just as he had prayed on the battlefield at the bridge of Amstetten. Then it would occur to him that perhaps the first card that he should draw from the pile of rejected cards on the table would save him. Then he would count up the number of buttons on his jacket, and select a card with the same number on which to stake the double of what he had already lost. Then again he would look for aid to the other players, or glance into Dolokhov's face, now so stern and cold, and try to read what was passing in his mind. Of course he knows what this loss means for me. It cannot be that he desires me to lose like this, for he was my friend, for I loved him. But of course it isn't his fault. 
how can he help it if luck favours him and neither am i to blame he said to himself i have done nothing wrong have i killed any one or insulted any one or wished any one evil why then this horrible misfortune and when did it begin it was only such a short time ago that i came to this table with the idea of winning a hundred roubles so as to buy for mamma's birthday that jewel-box and then go home i was so happy so free from care so gay and i did not realize then how happy i was when did it all end and when did this new this horrible state of things begin what does this change signify and here i am just the same as before sitting in the same place at his table choosing and moving the same cards and looking at those wide-knuckled dexterous hands when did this take place and what is it that has taken place i am well strong and just the same as i was and in the self-same place no it cannot be surely this cannot end in such a way his face was flushed he was all of a sweat in spite of the fact that it was not warm in the room and his face was terrible and pitiable especially on account of his futile efforts to seem composed the list of his losses was nearing the fatal number of forty three thousand rostof had turned down the corner of a card as the quarter stakes for three thousand roubles which he had just won when dolokhof rapping with the pack flung it down and taking the lump of chalk began swiftly to reckon up the sum total of rostof's losses with his firm legible figures breaking the chalk as he did so it's time for supper and here are the singans it was a fact at that moment a number of dark-skinned men and women came in bringing with them a gust of cold air and saying something in their gypsy accent nikolai realized that all was over but he said in an indifferent tone what can't we play any more ah but i had a splendid little card already just as though the mere amusement of the game were what interested him the most all is over i have lost was what he thought now a bullet through my brains that's all that's left and yet he said in jocund tones come now just this one card very well replied dolokhof completing the sum total very good make it twenty-one roubles then said he pointing to the figures twenty-one which was over and above the round sum of forty-three thousand and taking up the pack of cards he began to shuffle them rostof obediently turned back the corner and instead of the six thousand which he was going to wager carefully wrote twenty-one it's all the same to me he said all i wanted to know was whether you would give me the ten or not dolokhof gravely began to deal oh how rostof at that moment hated those red hands with the short fingers and the hairy wrists emerging from his shirt-bands those hands that had him in their grasp the ten-spot fell to him well you owe me just forty-three thousand count said dolokhof getting up from the table and stretching himself one gets tired sitting still so long he added yes i am very tired also said rostof dolokhof as though to remind him that it was not seemly to jest interrupted him when do you propose to pay me this money count rostof colouring with shame drew dolokhof into another room i cannot pay you at such short notice you must take my i o u said he listen rostof said dolokhof with a candid smile you know the proverb lucky in love unlucky at cards your cousin is in love with you i know oh how horrible it is to be in this man's power thought rostof he realized what a blow it would be to his father to his mother to learn that he had been gambling and losing so much he realized what happiness it would be if he could only have avoided doing it or could escape confessing it and he realized that dolokhof knew how easily he might save him from the shame and pain and yet here he was playing with him as a cat plays with a mouse your cousin dolokhof started to say but nikolai interrupted him my cousin has nothing to do with this and there is no need of bringing her in he cried in a fury then when will you pay me demanded dolokhof to-morrow replied rostof and he left the room End of chapter fourteen part one chapter fifteen of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter fifteen to say to-morrow 
and to preserve the conventional tone of decency was easy enough but to go home alone to see his brother and sisters his father and mother to confess his fault and ask for money to which he had no right after giving his word of honour was horrible when nikolai reached home the family were still up the young people in their return from the theatre had had supper and were now sitting at the harpsichord as soon as he entered the room he felt himself surrounded by that poetical atmosphere of love which had reigned all winter in that home and which now after dolokhof's proposal and Iogel's ball had seemed to condense around sonya and natasha like the air before a thunderstorm sonya and natasha were in the blue gowns which they had worn to the theatre pretty and realizing that fact they stood happy and smiling around the harpsichord vera and shinshin were playing checkers in the drawing-room the old countess waiting for her son and husband was laying out a game of solitaire with the aid of an old noblewoman who made her home in their family denisov with shining eyes rolled up and bristling hair sat at the harpsichord with one leg thrust out behind him and while drumming out the accompaniment with his little short fingers was singing in his thin hoarse but eminently true voice some verses that he had composed under the title the enchantress and to which he was trying to suit appropriate music enchantress tell what potent charm thou sayest that to unwanted chords my spirit tends what magic fire within my heart thou layest what rapture thrills me to my fingers ends he sang in a passionate voice and fixed his bright black agate-coloured eyes on natasha lovely delightful cried she still another verse she urged not yet perceiving nikolai with them it is just the same said the poor boy looking into the drawing-room where he saw his mother and the old lady ah here is nikolenka cried natasha running to him is papenka at home he demanded how glad i am that you have come exclaimed natasha not answering his question we are having such a jolly time vasily dmitrik is going to stay another day just for my sake do you know it no papa hasn't come home yet said sonya coco have you come come here dear cried the countess from the drawing-room nikolai went to his mother kissed her hand and without saying a word took a seat near her table and began to watch her hands as she laid out the cards from the music-room they could hear the sounds of laughter and merry voices trying to persuade natasha well very good very good exclaimed denisof now there is no denying you anything but it's your turn give us the baccarola i beg of you the countess noticed her son's silence what's the matter with you she asked ugh nothing said he as though he had heard the same question till he was weary of it will papenka be back soon i think so they are the same as ever they know nothing about it where can i hide myself thought nikolai and he went again into the music-room where the harpsichord stood sonya was sitting at it and playing the introduction to the barcarolle which was denisof's especial favorite natasha was preparing to sing denisof was looking at her with enthusiastic eyes nikolai began to pace up and down the room now why should they want to make her sing what can she sing there's nothing here to make a fellow feel happy ran nikolai's thoughts sonya struck the first chord of the introduction my god i am a ruined dishonourable man a bullet through my brain that is the only thing left for me and not singing his thoughts went on go away but where very well let them sing nikolai continued gloomily to stride up and down the room glancing at denisof and the girls but avoiding their eyes nikolenka what is the matter sonya's eyes fixed up on him seemed to ask she had immediately seen that something unusual had happened to him nikolai turned away from her natasha also with her quickness of perception had instantly noticed her brother's preoccupation she had observed it but she felt so full of merriment at that time her mood was so far removed from grief melancholy and reproaches that as often happens in the case of young girls she purposefully deceived herself no i am too happy now to disturb my joy by trying to sympathize in the unhappiness of another was her feeling and she said to herself no i am of course mistaken he must be as happy as i am it must be that he is as happy as i am myself now sonya said she and she started to go to the very middle of the music-room where in her opinion her voice would have the most resonance lifting her head 
and letting her hands hang easily by her side just as ballet dancers do natasha with a fine display of energy skipping from her little heels to her tiptoes flew out into the middle of the room and there paused see what a girl i am she seemed to say in answer to denisof's enthusiastic eyes following her now what is she so happy about i wonder queried nikolai as he glanced at his sister and how can it be that she isn't tired to death of it all natasha took the first note her throat swelled her bosom rose her eyes assumed a serious expression she thought of no one of nothing in particular at that moment and from the smiling mouth gushed the sounds those sounds which may proceed in the same tempo and with the same rhythm but which a thousand times leave you cold and unmoved and the thousand and first time make you tremble and weep natasha that winter had for the first time begun to take singing seriously and in large measure because denisof had been so enthusiastic over her voice she sang now not like a schoolgirl nor was there in her singing anything of that ludicrous childish effort which had formerly been characteristic of her she sang far from well as the connoisseurs who had heard her declared not developed yet but still a lovely voice she ought to cultivate it said every one but this was generally some time after the sounds of her voice had entirely died away while this as yet untrained voice breathing in the wrong places and finding it difficult to conquer rapid runs was ringing out even connoisseurs found nothing to say but felt themselves unexpectedly moved by it and only anxious to hear it again in her voice there was a girlish sensitiveness an unconsciousness of her own powers and an untrained velvetiness which were combined with the lack of knowledge of the art of singing in such a way that it seemed as if it would be impossible to change anything in that voice without ruining it what does this mean queried nikolai as he listened to her voice and opened his eyes wide what has come over her how she sings to-day he said to himself and suddenly all the world for him was concentrated on the expectation of the following note the succeeding phrase and everything in the world was divided into those three beats o mio crudella affecto one two three one two three one two o mio crudella affecto one two three ugh how foolish our life all is said nikolai to himself all of it all our wretchedness and money and dolokhov and anger and honour it is all rubbish and this is the only real thing there natasha there golubchik there matushka will she take the sea yes she has taken it glory to god salva bohu he said to himself without noticing that he was singing struck in the second a third below in order to support that sea good heavens how nice did i take it right how splendid he said to himself oh how that accord vibrated and how all that was best in rostof's soul came up to the surface and this was something independent of all in the world and higher than all in the world what in comparison with this were his losses and such men as dolokhov and his word of honour all rubbish one might kill and rob and still be happy End of chapter 15part one chapter sixteen of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter sixteen it was long since rostov had experienced any such delight from music as he did that night but as soon as natasha had finished her baccarola the grim reality again came back to him without saying a word to any one he left the room and went up to his own chamber Within a quarter of an hour the old count came in from the club, gay and satisfied. Nikolai, finding that he had come, went to his room. "'Well, have you been having a pleasant day?' asked Ilya Andreitch, smiling gaily and proudly at his son. Nikolai wanted to say yes, but he found it impossible. It was as much as he could do to keep from bursting into tears. The count began to puff at his pipe, and did not perceive his son's state of mind." 
Ugh, it can't be avoided, said Nikolai to himself, for the first and last time. And suddenly, in a negligent tone which seemed to himself utterly shameful, he said to his father, just as though he were asking for the carriage to drive down town, Papa, I have come to speak to you about business. I had forgotten all about it. I need some money. What's that? said the father, who had come home in a particularly good-natured frame of mind. I told you that you wouldn't have enough. Do you need much? Ever so much, said Nikolai, reddening, and with a stupid careless smile, which it was long before he could pardon himself for, I have been losing a little. That is, considerable. I might say a great deal. Forty-three thousand. What? To whom? You are joking, cried the Count, flushing, just as elderly men are apt to flush, with an apoplectic rush of blood colouring his neck and the back of his head. I promised to pay it to-morrow, continued Nikolai. Well, said the old Count, spreading his hands and falling helplessly back on the sofa. What's to be done? It's what might happen to any one, said the son, in a free and easy tone of banter, while all the time in his heart he was calling himself a worthless coward, who could not atone by his whole life for such a thing. He felt an impulse to kiss his father's hand, to fall on his knees and beg his forgiveness, but still he assured his father in that careless and even coarse tone that this was a thing liable to happen to any one. Count Ilya Andreyitch dropped his eyes when he heard his son's words, and fidgeted about, as though he were trying to find something. "'Yes, yes,' he murmured. "'It'll be hard work, I am afraid. Hard work to raise so much. It happens to everyone, yes. Yes, it happens to everyone.' And the Count, with a feeling glance at his son's face, started to leave the room. Nikolai was prepared for a refusal but he had never expected this. "'Papenka! Papenka!' he cried, hastening after him with a sob. "'Forgive me!' And seizing his father's hand, he pressed it to his lips and burst into tears. While father and son were having this conversation, a no less important confession was taking place between the mother and daughter. Natasha, in great excitement, had run in where her mother was. "'Mama! Mama! He has done it!' "'Done what?' He has done it. He has made me an offer, Mamma. Mamma, she cried. The Countess did not believe her ears. Denisov made a proposal. To whom? To this little chit of a Natasha, who only a short time since was playing with her dolls, and even now was only a schoolgirl. Natasha, come now. No nonsense, said she, still hoping that it was a joke. Why do you say nonsense? I tell you just as it is, said Tasha indignantly. I came to ask you what I should do about it, and you call it nonsense. The countess shrugged her shoulders. If it is true that Monsieur Denisov has made you an offer, then tell him that he is a fool, and that's all there is of it. No, he's not a fool, replied Natasha, in a grave and offended tone. Well, then, what do you wish? It seems to me that these days all of you are falling in love. Well, if you love him, then marry him, exclaimed the countess with an angry laugh. Good luck to you. No, mamma, I'm not in love with him. It can't be that I am. Well, then go and tell him so. Mamma, are you annoyed? Don't be annoyed, sweetheart. Now we're in, I should like to know, was I to blame? No, but what do you wish, my dear? "'Shall I go and tell him?' asked the Countess, smiling. "'Certainly not. I will answer him myself. Only tell me what to say. Everything comes so easy to you,' she added, with an answering smile. "'And if you had only seen how he said it to me. For, do you know, I am sure that he did not mean to say it, but it came out accidentally. "'Well, it behooves you, at all events, to refuse him.' "'No, not refuse him. I feel so sorry for him.' He is such a nice man. Well, then, accept his proposal. Indeed, it is time you were married, exclaimed her mother, in a sharp, derisive tone. No, mamma, I pity him so. I don't know how to tell him. Well, then, if you can't find anything to say, I myself will go and speak with him, said the countess, stirred to the soul that any one should dare to look upon her little Natasha as already grown up. No, not for anything. 
I will tell him myself, and you may listen at the door. And Natasha started to run through the drawing room into the music room where Denisov was still sitting on the same chair by the harpsichord with his face in his hands. He sprang up the moment he heard her light steps. Natalie, he said, going toward her with quick steps, decide my fate. It is in your hands. Vasily Dmitrich, I am so sorry for you. Oh, but you are so splendid. No, it cannot be. It is. But I shall always, always love you. Denisov bent over her hand, and she heard strange sounds which she could not understand. She kissed him on his dark, curly, disordered hair. At this instant was heard the hurried rustle of the countess's dress. She came toward them. Vasily Dmitrich, I thank you for the honor, said the countess, in a troubled tone of voice, which seemed to Denisov to be stern. But my daughter is so young, and I should have thought that you, as a friend of my son's, would have addressed me first. In that case you might not have forced me to such an unavoidable refusal. Countess, said Denisov, with downcast eyes and a guilty look, and vainly trying to stammer something more. Natasha could not look with any composure upon him. It was so pitiable to see him. She began to sob aloud. Countess, I have done wrong. At last he managed to articulate in a broken voice. But pray believe me. I adore your daughter and all your family, and would gladly sacrifice my life twice over for you. He looked up at the Countess, and seeing her stern face. Well, good-bye, Countess, he added and kissing her hand, and not even looking at Natasha, he left the room with quick, resolute steps. Rostov spent the next day with Denisov, who would not hear to staying any longer in Moscow. All his Moscow friends gave him a send-off with the aid of the gypsies, and he had no recollection of how he was packed into his sledge, or how he rode the first three stages. After Denisov's departure, Rostov spent a fortnight longer at home, waiting for the money which the old count was unable to raise at such short notice. He did not leave the house, and spent most of the time with the girls. Sonya was more affectionate and devoted to him than ever. It seemed as if she were anxious to show him that his gambling losses were quite an exploit for which she could only love him all the more, but Nikolai now felt that he was unworthy of her. He filled the girls' albums with verses and music and at last, toward the end of November, after paying over 43,000 rubles and receiving Dolokhov's receipt for it, he started away without taking leave of any of his acquaintances to rejoin his regiment which was now in Poland. End of chapter 16 and end of part 1Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Marianne. Part 2, Chapter 1 After his scene with his wife, Pierre went to Petersburg. At the post station at Tortsok, there were no horses, or the station master took it into his head not to furnish them. Pierre was obliged to wait. Without undressing, he stretched himself out on the leather divan before the circular table, on which he supported his big feet in fur-lined boots, and pondered. "'Do you order the trunks brought in? Shall I make up a bed? Do you wish tea?' asked his valet. Pierre made no answer, for the reason that he had heard nothing, and saw nothing. He had begun to ponder while at the last station, and still he went on, propounding the same questions, quite too important for him to pay any attention to what was going on around him. He was not in the least interested whether he reached Petersburg sooner or later, or whether or not they found him a place to sleep that night at the station. Everything, indeed, was immaterial in comparison with the thoughts that were now occupying his mind, and it made no difference whether he spent a few hours or his whole life at the station. The station master, the station master's wife, his valet, an old woman who sold Turzok embroidery, came into the room and offered their services. Pierre, not changing the elevated position of his feet, looked at them over his spectacles and did not comprehend what they could want, or how they could live without having decided the questions which were troubling him. He had indeed been occupied by the same questions perpetually, ever since that day when after his duel he had returned home from Sokolniki and spent the first painful, sleepless night. 
but now in his solitary journey they took possession of him with inexorable force whatever he began to think about still his mind reverted to these problems which he could not solve and could not help asking himself it was as though the principal screw on which his whole life depended had got sprung the screw stays where it is it does not give way but it turns without the thread catching always in the same fillet and it is important to stop it turning the station-master came in and began obsequiously to ask his illustriousness to deign to wait only two little hours and then he could have for his illustriousness come what would post-horses for his service the station-master was evidently lying and his sole idea was to get as much money as possible from the traveller is this right or is it wrong pierre asked himself as far as i am concerned it is good but is bad for the next traveller but the station-master can't help himself doing so because he has nothing to eat he told me that some officer had given him a thrashing because of it but perhaps the officer thrashed him because it was necessary for him to hasten away and i shot at dolokhof because i considered myself insulted and louis the sixteenth was beheaded because he was convicted as a criminal but within a year those who had beheaded him were also put to death for something or other what is wrong what is right what must one love what must one hate what is the object of life and what am i what is life and what is death what is the power that directs all things he asked himself and there was no answer to any one of these questions except the one the illogical answer which did not in reality fit any of these questions this answer was thou shalt die all will come to an end thou shalt die and know all or else cease to question but the mere thought of death was terrible to him the torzok peddler woman in her piping voice offered her wares and called especial attention to her goatskin slippers i have hundreds of roubles which i don't know what to do with and she in her ragged sheepskin stands there and looks at me timidly thought pierre and what good would this money do her would this money of mine add the value of a single hair to her happiness to her peace of mind can anything on earth make her or me in the least degree less susceptible to evil and death death which ends all and which may come to-day or to-morrow everything becomes of equally little importance in comparison with eternity and once more he tried to screw up the screw that would not hold and the screw as before kept turning around in the self-same way his servant brought him the half-cut volume of a romance in the form of letters by madame de souza he began to read of the sufferings and virtuous resistance of the heroine emily de mansfeld and why did she resist her seducer if she loved him he asked himself god could not have put into her soul a desire which was contrary to his will my former wife made no struggle and maybe she was right nothing has ever been discovered nothing ever invented said pierre again to himself the only thing that we can know is that we know nothing and this is the highest flight of human wisdom everything within him and around him seemed confused incoherent loathsome but nevertheless in this very loathing of everything pierre found a peculiar sense of exasperating delight may i venture to ask your illustriousness to make a little room for this gentleman here asked the station-master coming into the room and introducing another traveller delayed also by the lack of horses the newcomer was a thick-set big-boned little old man yellow and wrinkled with grey beetling brows that shaded glittering eyes of indefinable greyish hue pierre took his feet from the table got up and threw himself down on the bed that had been made ready for him occasionally glancing at the stranger who with an air of moroseness and fatigue without paying any heed to pierre allowed his servant to help him lay off his wraps the old man sat down on the sofa he had a well-worn nankeen lined sheepskin jacket and felt boots on his thin bony legs his head was large and very broad in the temples and his hair was closely cropped sitting thus and leaning back against the sofa he glanced at Buzakoy. The grave, intelligent, and penetrating expression of his glance struck Pierre. He felt an inclination to converse with the stranger, but when he had made up his mind to address him with some question about the state of the roads, the old man had already closed his eyes and was sitting motionless with his wrinkled old hands folded, 
on one finger he wore a heavy cast-iron ring with a death's head for a seal and was either dozing or as it seemed to pierre meditating calmly and profoundly the stranger's servant was also a little old man all covered with wrinkles without moustache or beard not because they had been shaven but because they seemed never to have grown this agile old servant opened up the travelling case prepared the tea-table and brought in the boiling samovar when all was ready the stranger opened his eyes and drew up to the table and after pouring himself out a glass of tea filled another for his beardless servant and handed it to him pierre began to feel uneasy it seemed to him that it was unavoidable and even inevitable that he should enter into conversation with this traveller the servant brought back his empty glass turned bottom side up and with the lump of sugar untasted and asked his master if he needed anything nothing hand me my book said the stranger the servant handed him a book which pierre took to be a religious work and the traveller buried himself in his reading pierre looked at him suddenly the stranger laid down his book put a mark in it and closed it and again shutting his eyes and leaning back against the sofa assumed his former position pierre gazed at him but he had no time to look away before the old man opened his eyes and fastened his firm steady stern gaze directly on pierre's face Pierre felt confused, and anxious to escape from the searching gaze, but those brilliant old eyes irresistibly attracted him to them. End of chapter 1 Part 2, Chapter 2 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne Chapter 2 if i am not mistaken i have the pleasure of addressing count buzakoy said the stranger in a loud and deliberate voice pierre without speaking gave his neighbour an inquiring look over his spectacles i have heard of you continued the traveller and of the misfortune that has befallen you my dear sir he seemed to lay special stress on the word misfortune as much as to say yes misfortune whatever you may call it for i know what has happened to you in moscow was a misfortune I have great sympathy for you, my dear sir. Pierre flushed, and hastily putting down his legs from the bed, bent toward the old man, smiling with a timid and unnatural smile. Not from mere curiosity do I remind you of this, my dear sir, but for a much more important reason. He paused, though his eyes were still fixed upon Pierre, and he moved along the sofa, signifying by this action that Pierre should sit down by his side. It was not particularly agreeable for Pierre to enter into conversation with this old man, but involuntarily submitting, he came and sat down by his side. "'You are unhappy, my dear sir,' pursued the stranger. "'You are young. I am old. I should like, so far as within me lies, to help you.' "'Ah, yes,' replied Pierre, with the same unnatural smile. "'Thank you very much. Have you been travelling far?' The stranger's face was not genial, on the contrary it was even cold and stern, but nevertheless his face and his speech had an irresistible attraction for Pierre. "'Now, if for any reason it is disagreeable for you to talk with me,' said the old man, "'tell me frankly, my dear sir,' and he suddenly smiled, an unexpected, paternally affectionate smile. "'Ah, oh, no, not at all. On the contrary, I am very happy to make your acquaintance,' said Pierre, and glancing once more at his new acquaintance's hand, he looked more carefully at the ring. He perceived on it the death's head, the symbol of masonry. "'Allow me to ask,' said he, "'are you a mason?' "'Yes, I belong to the Brotherhood of the Freemasons,' said the traveller, looking deeper and ever deeper into Pierre's eyes. "'And on my own account and that of the craft, I offer you the hand of friendship.' "'I fear,' said Pierre, smiling and hesitating between the confidence inspired in him by the freemason's personality and his slight estimation which he shared with others of the doctrines of the order i fear that i am very far from being able to express myself i fear that my whole system of thought in regard to the world in general is so opposite to yours that we should not understand each other i know your system of thought replied the freemason and this system which you mention and which seems to you the product of your brain, is that common to most men. It is uniformly the fruit of pride, idleness, and ignorance. Excuse me, my dear sir, 
if i had not known this i should not have addressed you your system of thought is a grievous error in exactly the same way i can imagine that it is you who are an error said pierre with a feeble smile i never venture to assert that i know the truth said the mason more and more impressing pierre by the precision and assurance of his discourse no one can alone attain to the truth it must be stone upon stone all lending their aid millions of generations from the first adam even down to our day building the temple which is destined to be the suitable abiding place for the most high god said the mason and he shut his eyes i must tell you i do not believe do not believe in god said pierre with an effort and a sense of regret but feeling it indispensable to confess the whole truth the mason looked earnestly at pierre and smiled much as a rich man who had millions in his hands might smile upon a poor man who should tell him that he had nothing and that five roubles would make him the happiest of men yes you do not know him my dear sir said the mason you cannot know him you cannot know him therefore you are unhappy yes yes i am unhappy repeated pierre but what am i to do you do not know him my dear sir and therefore you are very unhappy you do not know him but he is here he is in me he is in my words he is in thee and even in these blasphemous words that thou hast just uttered said the mason in his stern vibrating voice he paused and sighed evidently trying to master his emotion if he did not exist said he gently you and i would not be speaking about him my dear sir of what of whom have we been speaking whom didst thou deny he suddenly asked with a tone of enraptured sternness and power in his voice who would have invented him if he did not exist how camest thou to have the hypothesis that such an incomprehensible being existed how came you and all the world to suppose the existence of an incomprehensible being a being omnipotent eternal and infinite in all his attributes he paused and remained silent for some time pierre could not and would not break in upon his silence he is but it is hard to comprehend him said the mason at last looking not into pierre's face but straight ahead while his aged looking hands which he could not keep quiet owing to his internal excitement kept fumbling with the leaves of his book if it were a man whose existence thou disbelieved i could bring this man to thee i would take him by the hand and show him to thee but how can i an insignificant mortal show all his omnipotence all his infinity all his goodness to him who is blind or to him who shuts his eyes in order not to see not to comprehend him and not to see and not to comprehend all his own vileness and depravity he paused again who art thou what art thou thou imaginest that thou art heroic because thou canst utter these blasphemous words said he with a saturnine and scornful laugh and thou art stupider and less intelligent than a little child which playing with the artistically constructed parts of a clock should dare to say that because it did not understand the clock it did not believe in the artificer who made it to comprehend him is hard for ages since our first ancestor adam even down to our own days we have been striving to comprehend him and we are still infinitely far from the attainment of our purpose but while we cannot comprehend him we see only our feebleness and his majesty pierre with agitated heart and burning eyes looked at the mason listening to his words not interrupting him or asking him any questions but with all his soul he believed in what this strange man told him whether it was that he was convinced by the reasonable arguments that the mason employed or was persuaded as children are by the conviction by the sincerity expressed by the mason's intonations by the trembling voice that sometimes almost failed him or by the brilliant eyes that had grown old in this conviction or by that calmness security and belief in his own mission which radiated from his whole being and which expressly impressed him when he compared it with his own looseness of belief and hopelessness he could not tell at all events he desired with all his soul to believe and he did believe and experienced a joyous sense of calmness regeneration and restoration to life 
It is not by the intellect that he is understood, but by life, said the mason. I do not understand, said Pierre, finding with dread his doubts arising in him again. He was afraid lest he might detect some weakness and lack of clearness in his new friend's arguments, and he was afraid not to believe him. I do not understand, said he, how the human mind can attain that knowledge of which you speak. The mason smiled his sweet, paternal smile. The highest wisdom and truth is like the purest ichor, which we should wish to receive into our very selves, said he. Can I, an unclean vessel, accept this pure ichor, and judge of its purity? Only through the cleansing of my inner nature can I, to a certain extent, receive this baptismal consecration. Yes, yes, that is so, said Pierre, joyfully. The highest wisdom is established, not on reason alone, not on those worldly sciences, physics, history, chemistry, and the like, on which intellectual knowledge stumbles. The highest wisdom is one. The highest wisdom has one science, the science of the all, the universal science, which explains all creation, and the place which man occupies in it. In order to absorb this science, it is absolutely essential to purify and renovate the inner man, and therefore, before one can know it, one must believe and accomplish perfection. And to attain this end, our souls must be filled with that divine light, which is called conscience. Yes, yes, cried Pierre. Look with the eyes of your spirit at your inner man, and then ask yourself, if you are content with your life, what do you attain when you put yourself under the guidance of the intellect alone? What are you? You are young, you are intelligent, and educated, my dear sir. What have you been doing with all these blessings that have been put into your hands? Are you content with yourself and your life? No, I detest my life, exclaimed Pierre, with a scowl. If you detest it, then change it. Undergo self-purification, and in accordance as you accomplish it, you will learn wisdom. Examine into your life, my dear sir. What sort of a life have you been leading? Wild revels and debauchery, receiving everything from society and giving nothing in return. You have become the possessor of wealth. How have you been employing it? What have you been doing for your neighbor? Have you had a thought for your tens of thousands of slaves? Have you helped them, physically or morally? No, you have taken advantage of their labor to lead a dissipated life. Then, my dear sir, you got married. You assumed responsibilities for the guidance of a young woman, and how have you carried them out? You have not aided her, my dear sir, to find the path of truth, but you have hurled her into the abyss of falsehood and wretchedness. A man insulted you, and you fought with him, and you say that you do not know God, and you detest your life. There is no wisdom in that, my dear sir." After saying these words, the mason, as though wearied by this long speech, again leaned back against the back of the sofa and closed his eyes. Pierre looked at the stern, impassive, almost deathly face of the old man and moved his lips without making any noise. He wanted to say, Yes, my life is shameful, idle, dissipated, but he did not dare to break the silence. The Freemason coughed, a hoarse, decrepit cough, and summoned his servant. How about the horses? he asked, without looking at Pierre. Those that were ordered have been brought, replied the servant. Do you wish to rest? No, have them harnessed. Can it be that he is going to leave me here alone, and not tell me all, and not promise me help? wondered Pierre, getting up and beginning to pace up and down the room, with bowed head, though he occasionally glanced at the mason. Yes, I had never thought about it before. I lead a contemptible, depraved life, but I do not love it, and I have no desire to continue it, thought Pierre. And this man knows the truth, and if he had the desire he might enlighten me. Pierre wished, but did not have the courage to say this to the mason. The traveller, gathering up his effects with his skilful, aged hands, began to button up his sheepskin coat. Having accomplished these tasks, he turned to Buzakoy and said to him in a polite, indifferent tone, where are you going now, my dear sir? I? I am going to Petersburg, replied Pierre, in a childish, irresolute voice. I am grateful to you. I agree with what you have said, but pray do not think that I am all bad. I wish with all my soul that I were what you wish that I was. 
but I have never found any help to become such. However, I am, above all, to blame for my faults. Help me, teach me, and maybe I might. Pierre could not speak further. There was a strange sound in his nose, and he turned away. The mason did not speak for some time, evidently lost in thought. Help is given only from God, said he, but that measure of help, which it is within the power of our craft to give you, it will be glad to give, my dear sir. When you reach Petersburg, give this to Count Valarsky. He took out a pocket book, and on a large sheet of paper folded twice, he wrote a few words. Allow me to give you one piece of advice. When you reach the capital, consecrate your first hours to solitude, to self-examination, and do not again enter into your former paths of life. And now I wish you a happy journey, my dear sir, said he, perceiving that his servant had entered the room, and all success. The traveller was Osip Alexeyevich Bezdeyev, as Pierre discovered by the station-master's record-book. Bezdeyev was one of the most distinguished Freemasons and Martinists since the time of Novikov. Pierre, after his departure, without lying down to sleep or asking for horses, long paced up and down the room of the station-house, thinking over his vicious way of living and, with the enthusiasm of regeneration, imagining to himself the blessed, irreproachable, and beneficent future which now seemed to him so easy. He was, so it seemed to him, wicked only because he had, as it were, forgotten how good it was to be a righteous man. Not a trace of his former doubts remained in his mind. He had a firm faith in the possibility of a brotherhood of men, united in one common aim of keeping each other in the path of righteousness, and such a brotherhood masonry now seemed to him to be. End of chapter 2 Part 2, Chapter 3 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 3 On reaching Petersburg, Pierre informed no one of his presence, went nowhere, and actually spent whole days in reading Thomas a Kempis, which someone, he knew not whom, had sent him. One thing, and only one thing, Pierre understood in reading that book. That was the hitherto unknown delight in believing in the possibility of attaining perfection and in the possibility of active brotherly love among men, which Osip Alexeyevich had revealed to him. Within a week after his return, the young Polish Count, Volarsky, whom Pierre had known slightly in Petersburg society, came one evening into his room with the sort of official and solemn air with which Dolokhov's second had approached him, closing the door behind him and assuring himself that no one except Pierre was in the room, he thus addressed him. I have come to you, Count, for the purpose of laying a proposition before you, said he, not sitting down. An individual of very high degree in our brotherhood has interested himself in having you admitted out of due course, and has proposed that I should be your sponsor. I consider it as a sacred duty to fulfill this person's desires. Do you wish to join the brotherhood of Freemasons under my sponsorship? Pierre was amazed at the cold and severe tone of this man, whom he had seen almost always at balls, with a gallant smile, in the society of the most brilliant ladies. Yes, said Pierre, I do wish it. Volarsky inclined his head. Still one further question, Count, said he, which I will beg of you to answer with all frankness, not as a future mason, but as a man of honor, un galant homme. Have you renounced your former convictions? Do you believe in a god? Pierre hesitated. Yes, "'Yes, I believe in a god,' said he. "'In that case,' began Falarsky, but Pierre interrupted him. "'Yes, I believe in a god,' he said once more. "'In that case we may start, then,' said Falarsky. "'My carriage is at your service.' Falarsky sat in silence all the way. To Pierre's questions as to what he had to do and how he must answer, Falarsky contented himself with replying that brethren more suitable than himself would examine him— and that all it behooved Pierre to do was to speak the truth. Entering the courtyard of a large mansion, where the lodge met, and passing up a dark staircase, they came into a small, brightly lighted ante-room, where they removed their shubas without the aid of servants. Through an entry they passed into another room. Here a man in a strange garb made his appearance at the door. Volarsky, going forward to meet him, said something to him in French, in an undertone, and went into a small wardrobe, in which Pierre observed trappings, 
such as he had never seen before. Taking from the wardrobe a handkerchief, Volarsky bound it around Pierre's eyes, and tied a knot behind in such a way that his hair was caught in it and hurt him. Then he drew him to himself, kissed him, and taking him by the hand, led him he knew not where. The hair caught in the knot hurt Pierre. He scowled with the pain and smiled shamefacedly. His burly figure, with bandaged eyes, with swinging arms, with face both frowning and smiling, followed Volarsky with timid steps. After leading him half a score of paces, Volarsky paused. "'Whatever happens to you,' said he, "'you must courageously endure it all, if you are firmly resolved to enter the Brotherhood.' Pierre nodded assent. "'When you hear a rap on the door, you can take off the handkerchief,' added Volarsky. "'I wish you good courage and success.' and pressing Pierre's hand, Volarsky went away. Left alone, Pierre continued to smile as before. Twice he shrugged his shoulders, raised his hand to the handkerchief, as though inclined to remove it, and again let it fall. The five minutes which he spent with bandaged eyes seemed to him like an hour. His hands swelled, his legs trembled, it seemed to him as though he were tired. He experienced the most complex and varied sensations. What was going to happen to him seemed to him terrible and he was still more afraid that he should show his fear. He was filled with curiosity to know what was going to take place, what was going to be revealed to him, but above all it was delightful for him to think that the moment had come when he had definitely entered upon the path of regeneration, and of an active, beneficent life, of which he had dreamed ever since his meeting with Osip Alexeyevich. Loud raps were heard at the door. Pierre took off the bandage and looked around him. It was intensely dark in the room, only in one place burned a lampada, or shrine lamp, within some white object. Pierre went near and saw that the lampada stood on a table covered with a black cloth, on which lay a single opened book. The book was a copy of the Gospels. The white object, in which burned the lampada, was a human skull, with its eye sockets and teeth. Reading the first words of the Gospel, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Pierre went around the table and saw a large box filled with something and covered. This was a coffin with bones in it. He was not at all surprised at what he saw. In his hope of entering upon a wholly new life, absolutely removed from the old one, he expected all sorts of extraordinary things, indeed much more extraordinary than what he had already seen. The skull, the coffin, the gospel. It seemed to him that all this was what he had expected. He expected something more. While trying to stimulate a sense of emotion, he looked around him. God, death, love, human fraternity, he said to himself, connecting with these words confused but pleasing conceptions. A door opened and someone entered. By the feeble light, Pierre could just manage to make out that it was a short little man. Coming from light into darkness, this man paused a moment. Then, with cautious steps, he approached the table and placed on it his small hands covered with leather gloves. The short man wore a white leathern apron, reaching from his chest to his feet. Around his neck was something like a necklace, and above the necklace arose a high, white frill, serving as a sort of frame for his elongated face, lighted from below. "'Why have you come hither?' asked the new man, coming towards Pierre, whose position was indicated by a slight noise. "'Wherefore do you, who believe not in the truth of light, and have never seen the light, wherefore have you come hither? What do you desire of us?' wisdom, virtue, enlightenment. The moment the door opened and the unknown man entered, Pierre experienced a sense of awe and reverence similar to that which he had felt in his childhood at confession. He felt that he was face to face with a man who, under all the conditions of ordinary life, was a stranger, but was near to him through the brotherhood of man. Pierre, with his heart beating so that he could hardly breathe, went toward the retter as the Masons call the brother whose duty it is to prepare the candidate for admission into the confraternity. Pierre, approaching, recognized the Retter as an acquaintance of his, named Smolyaninov. It was a disappointment to think that this man was an acquaintance. The newcomer was merely a brother and instructor in virtue. It was some time before Pierre could find a word to say, so that the Retor was obliged to repeat his question. Yes, I... I... I seek regeneration, said Pierre, speaking with difficulty. Very good, said Smolyaninov, and immediately proceeded. Have you any idea of the means by which our holy fraternity can aid you to the attainment of your desires? asked the Rhetor, calmly and rapidly. I hope for, 
guidance for help toward regeneration said pierre with a trembling voice and finding a difficulty in speaking that arose from his emotion as well as from his lack of practice in speaking russian on abstract themes what knowledge have you of freemasonry i suppose that freemasonry is a fraternite and equality of all men with virtuous aims said pierre with a feeling of shame overwhelming him at the unfitness of his words at so solemn a moment i suppose very good said the rhetor in haste evidently perfectly satisfied with this reply have you found means in religion for the attainment of these ends no i have considered religion opposed to truth and i have spurned it said pierre so low that the rhetor did not hear him and asked him what he had said i have been an atheist replied pierre you seek after truth for the purpose of following her laws through life and consequently you seek wisdom and virtue do you asked the rhetor after a moment's silence yes yes insisted pierre the rhetor coughed folded his gloved hands on his chest and began to discourse it is now my duty to unfold to you the chief object of our craft said he and if this object coincides with yours then you will find it an advantage to join our fraternity the first and principal aim and at the same time the foundation of our confraternity on which it stands firm and which no human violence can shake is the conservation and handing down to posterity of a certain important mystery which has been handed down to us from the remotest antiquity even from the first man from which mystery perhaps depends the destiny of the human race but as this mystery has the peculiarity that no one can know it and get advantage from it except through a long and assiduous course of self-purification therefore not every one can hope speedily to discover it consequently we have a secondary aim and object which consists in preparing our fellow members so far as in us lies to correct their hearts to purify and enlighten their reason by those means which have been handed down to us by tradition from those men who labored for the investigation of those mysteries and thereby to teach them to be qualified for the reception of one by purifying and rectifying our own members we endeavor in the third place to correct also the whole human race presenting in our own members an example of honor and virtue and therefore we endeavor by all means in our power to counteract the evil that rules in the world think this over and i will come to you again said he and he left the room to counteract the evil that rules in the world repeated pierre and he imagined his future activity in this great field he imagined such men as he himself had been a fortnight before and his thoughts turned to the initiatory discourse that he had just heard he called to mind the wicked and wretched men whom he should help by word or deed he imagined the oppressors from whom he rescued their victims from the three objects which the rhetor enumerated the last the improvement of the human race was the one that most appealed to pierre the important mystery of which the rhetor spoke although it aroused his curiosity did not seem to him to be a reality but the second self-purification and regeneration interested him very little because at that moment he felt that he was already perfectly freed from his former vices and ready only for what was right within half an hour the rhetor returned to instruct the candidate in the seven virtues symbolized by the seven steps of solomon's temple which every mason must make his especial practice these virtues were as follows one modesty the observation of the secrets of the order two obedience to the higher degrees of the fraternity three virtuous living four love for mankind five courage six liberality seven love of death apply yourself to the seventh said the rhetor by frequent thoughts of death bring yourself to feel that he is no more a terrible enemy but a friend who frees the soul wearied by works of beneficence from the wretchedness of this life and leads it to the place of rewards and rest yes this ought to be so thought pierre when the rhetor after delivering himself of this message again retired leaving him to solitary reflection this ought to be so but i am still so feeble as to love my life the meaning of which has only just been to some small degree revealed to me the other five virtues however which pierre counted off on his fingers he felt were already in his soul courage and generosity liberality and virtuous living and love for mankind and especially obedience 
which last seemed less to him a virtue than a pleasure so glad was he now to be freed from the exercise of his own will and to subordinate it to those who knew the indubitable truth the sixth virtue pierre had forgotten he could not remember what it was at all for the third time the rater returned this time more speedily than before and asked pierre if he were still firm in his convictions and were resolved to undergo all that might be required of him i am ready for anything said pierre i must still further apprise you said the rater that our order does not instruct by words alone but by other arguments which have perhaps a more powerful effect upon the earnest seeker after wisdom and virtue than merely verbal ones this chamber with its ornamentation which you see must have already made this plain to your heart if it is sincere more than any words could have done you will see probably during your further advancement similar modes of symbolism our order takes pattern after ancient societies which concealed their teachings under the guise of hieroglyphics a hieroglyphic explained the rater is an inanimate thing symbolizing an abstract idea and possessing in itself qualities similar to those possessed by the idea symbolized pierre knew very well what a hieroglyphic was but he did not venture to speak he silently listened to the rater being persuaded that some sort of test was immediately to begin if you are resolved then it is my duty to proceed to the initiation said the rater coming closer to pierre as a sign of liberality i shall ask you to give me everything of value that you have but i have nothing with me said pierre supposing that he was to be required to make over all that he possessed well what have you on you your watch money rings pierre hastily took out his pocket-book his watch and struggled for some time to remove his wedding-ring from his stout finger when this was accomplished the mason said as a sign of obedience i will ask you to strip pierre took off his coat vest and left boot at the rater's direction the mason opened the shirt over his left breast and bending over lifted his trousers above the knee of his left leg pierre hastily began to take off his right boot also and to tuck up his trousers so as to save this stranger the trouble but the mason assured him that this was unnecessary and gave him a slipper for his left foot with a childlike smile of shame doubt and derision at his own awkwardness involuntarily crossing his face pierre stood up dropping his arms and spreading his legs and faced the rater waiting his next command and finally as a sign of sincerity i will ask you to reveal to me your chief predilection said he my predilection but i used to have so many of them exclaimed pierre the predilection which more than all others has caused you to waver in the path of virtue said the mason pierre paused trying to think wine gluttony slothfulness impetuosity anger women he passed his faults in review mentally considering them and not knowing which to give the preference women said he in a voice so low that it was scarcely audible the mason did not move and did not speak until long after this reply at last he approached pierre took up the handkerchief that was lying on the table and again blindfolded his eyes for the last time i say to you examine yourself with all attention put a bridle upon your feelings and seek your happiness not in your possessions but in your heart the fountain-head of happiness is not without but within us pierre had already begun to feel in himself this refreshing fountain of happiness which now filled his soul to overflowing with bliss and emotion End of chapter 3
and other questions. Then he was led somewhere else, the bandage not yet removed, and while he was on the way his attendants related to him allegories about the difficulties that beset the way, about the sacred fraternity, the eternal architect of the universe, and the courage with which he ought to endure labors and sufferings. During the time of this circumambulation, Pierre noticed that he was called first the seeker, the sufferer, and then the claimant, while the mallets and swords were struck each time in a different way. At one time, just as they brought him to some object or other, he noticed that there was confusion and perplexity among his attendants. He heard the men surrounding him whispering together, and one of them insisting that he was to be led across a certain carpet. After this they took his right hand and laid it upon something, while with his left hand he was directed to hold a pair of compasses to his left breast, and to repeat the words read aloud by one of the number, and which bound him to a faithful observance of the regulations of the order. Then the candles were extinguished, some alcohol was burned, as Pierre apprehended by the odor, and they told him that he could now see the lesser light. The bandage was removed from his eyes, and Pierre saw, as in a dream, by the feeble light of the alcohol lamp, a number of men who, all wearing aprons similar to that which the rater had worn, stood in front of him holding swords pointed toward his chest. Among them stood a man with a white shirt stained with blood. Seeing this, Pierre bent his chest forward against the swords, wishing that they might pierce it, but the swords were withdrawn, and his eyes were immediately rebandaged. "'Thou hast now seen the lesser light,' said a voice. Then the candles were lighted again. He was told that he was to see the full light, and once more they removed the bandage, and more than a dozen voices suddenly cried, "'Sic transit gloria mundi!' Pierre began gradually to recover himself, and looked around the room in which he was, and at the men who were there. Around a long table covered with black sat a dozen men in the trappings which the others whom Pierre had seen wore. Some of them Pierre had known in Petersburg society. At the head of the table was a young man whom Pierre did not know. He had a peculiar badge about his neck. At his right hand sat the Italian Abate, whom Pierre had met two years before at Anna Pavlovna's. There was still another, very important dignitary, and a Swiss, who had once been a tutor in the Kurgans. All preserved a solemn silence, and listened to the words spoken by the presiding officer, who held a mallet in his hand. Inserted in the wall was a blazing star. At one end of the table was a small cover, with various allegorical symbols. On the other was something in the nature of an altar, with a copy of the Gospels and a skull. Around the table were seven large candlesticks, such as they have in churches. Two of the brethren drew Pierre to the altar, placed him at right angles and bade him lie down, declaring that he must prostrate himself at the gates of the temple. "'He ought to receive the trowel first, said one of the brethren, in a whisper. "'Ugh, oh, please hold your tongue,' said another. Pierre, with his distracted, nearsighted eyes, looked around him without obeying, and suddenly doubts began to come over him. "'Where am I? What am I doing? Are they not making sport of me? Will not the time come when I shall be ashamed of all this flummery?' But this last doubt lasted only for an instant. He looked around on the grave faces of the spectators, remembered all that he had already been through, and comprehended that he had gone too far now to withdraw. He was mortified at his doubt, and while endeavoring to regain his former feeling of emotion, he prostrated himself at the gates of the temple. And, in reality, the former feeling of emotion came over him even more powerfully than before. After he had been lying there for some little time, he was bidden to arise, and they put upon him the same kind of white leathern apron which the others wore, put a trowel into his hand, and gave him three pairs of gloves, and then the Grand Master addressed him. He told him that it behooved him to endeavor never to allow the whiteness of this apron to be sullied, it being an emblem of strength and purity. Of the mysterious trowel he said that he was to use it for eradicating the faults from his own heart, and courteously laying the foundations of virtue in the hearts of his neighbors. Then, as regarded the first pair of gloves, which were men's, he said that he was not to understand their significance, but must keep them. In regard to the second pair, which were also men's gloves, he said that he was to wear them at the lodge meetings. And finally, in regard to the third pair, which were women's gloves, he said as follows, Dear brother, these gloves are also destined for you. Give them to the woman whom you will reverence above all others. By this gift you pledge the purity of your heart to her whom you will select as your worthy Masonic affinity. Then, after a brief pause, he went on. 
but take care dear brother that these gloves are not worn by unworthy hands while the grand master was pronouncing these last words it seemed to pierre that he was embarrassed pierre himself was still more embarrassed he flushed till the tears came just as children flush he began to look around him uneasily and an awkward silence ensued this silence was broken by one of the brethren who drew pierre to the table cover and began to read to him from a copy-book an explanation of all the symbolical figures worked upon it the sun moon the hammer the plumb line the trowel the untrimmed and four-square foundation stone the pillar the three windows and other things then pierre was assigned his place the signals of the lodge were explained to him the password was told him and he was at last permitted to sit down the grand master began to read the regulations they were very long and pierre from his joy excitement and sense of shame was not in a condition to understand what they were reading he only heard the last words of the regulation and they impressed themselves on his memory in our temples we recognize no other degrees the grand master read than those which separate virtue from wrongdoing take care not to make any distinction that may tend to destroy equality fly to the aid of a brother no matter who it may be reclaim the wandering raise the fallen and never cherish anger or enmity against a brother be gentle and courteous kindle in all hearts the fires of virtue do acts of kindness to thy neighbor and never allow thyself to envy the happiness of another forgive thy enemy and avenge not thyself upon him except by doing him good having thus fulfilled the highest law thou wilt discover traces of thy primal and lost goodness he finished reading and getting up embraced pierre and kissed him pierre with tears of joy in his eyes looked around him not knowing what reply to make to the greetings and congratulations of the acquaintances who surrounded him he made no distinction between old friends and new in every one he saw only brethren whom he burned with impatience to join in carrying out the work the grand master rapped with his mallet all sat down in their places and some one read an address on the necessity of humility the grand master then proposed to carry out the last obligation and the important dignitary who bore the appellation of collector of alms began to approach each in turn pierre had the inclination to subscribe all the money he possessed but was afraid that this would be construed as an exhibition of pride and he put down only what each of the others did the session was ended and on his return home it seemed to pierre as though he had come from some long journey after an absence of ten years and was entirely changed with nothing left to him from the former objects and customs of his life End of chapter 4part two chapter five of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne on the day following his reception into the masonic lodge pierre was sitting at home reading a book and trying to penetrate the meaning of the square formed on one side by god on the second by the moral world on the third by the physical and on the fourth by a mixture of the last two occasionally his attention wandered from his book and square and in his imagination he began to formulate a new plan of life for himself the evening before at the lodge he had been told that the emperor had heard of his duel and that it would be for his advantage to leave petersburg for a time pierre proposed to go to his southern estates and look out for the welfare of his peasantry he was joyfully thinking about this new life when prince vasily unexpectedly came into the room my dear what have you been doing in moscow why what made you quarrel with leola mon cher you are in error said the prince as he came in i have known all about it and i can tell you honestly that ellen is as innocent towards you as christ toward the jews pierre started to reply but prince vasily cut him short and why didn't you come right to me in all frankness as to a friend i know how it was i understand it said he you behaved as a man who prizes his honour perhaps too you acted too hastily but we won't discuss that now just think of this though in what a position you have put her and me in the eyes of society and especially of the court he added lowering his voice she is living in moscow you hear remember my dear he made him sit down that this is a mere misunderstanding you yourself will feel it so i am sure now join me in writing a letter and she will come back everything will be explained but if you don't i will tell you you may very easily repent of it my dear 
Prince Vasily gave Pierre a very suggestive look. I have it from the very best sources that the Empress Dowager takes a lively interest in all this matter. You know that she is very favorably disposed to Ellen. Several times Pierre collected himself to speak, but on the one hand Prince Vasily did not let him have a chance, on the other Pierre himself was afraid to take that tone of determined refusal with which he had definitely made up his mind to answer his father-in-law. Moreover, the words of the Masonic ritual, be courteous and genial, occurred to him. He scowled, flushed, got up and sat down again, struggling to perform the hardest task that had ever come to him in his life, to say something unpleasant to a man's face, to say exactly the opposite of what this man expected. He was so accustomed to give in to Prince Vasily's tone of easy-going self-confidence that even now he felt that he had not the force of mind necessary to oppose him, but he felt that what he was going to say now was to decide the whole destiny of his life. Was he to go back to the old path of the past, or to go on over that new one which had been placed before him in so attractive a light by the Masons, and on which he firmly believed that he should find regeneration? Well, my dear, said Prince Vasily, in a jocose tone, tell me yes now, and I will write her the letter, and we will kill the fatted calf. But Prince Vasily had not time to finish his joke before Pierre, not looking at Prince Vasily, and with a flash of rage which made him resemble his father, exclaimed in a whisper, Prince, I did not invite you to come. Please go. Go. He sprang up and flung the door open. Go, he repeated, not believing in himself and rejoicing in the expression of confusion and terror on Prince Vasily's face. What is the matter with you? Are you ill? Go, he cried once more in a trembling voice, and Prince Vasily was obliged to go without bringing about any explanation. In a week's time, Pierre, bidding his new friends, the Masons, farewell, and leaving in their hands large sums for charities, departed for his estates. The Brotherhood gave him letters to the Masons of Kiev and Odessa, and promised to write and guide him in his new activity. End of chapter 5「Part two, Chapter six of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter six. The duel between Pierre and Dolokhov was hushed up, and, in spite of the Emperor's strictness in regard to dueling, neither the two principals nor their seconds were punished. But the story of the duel, confirmed by Pierre's rupture with his wife, was noised abroad in society. Pierre, who, when he was an illegitimate son, had been looked upon with patronizing condescension, who, when he was the best match in the Russian Empire, had been flattered and glorified, had lost much of his importance in the eyes of the world since his marriage, and young ladies and their mamas had nothing more to expect from him, the more from the fact that he could not, and would not, ingratiate himself into the favor of fashionable society. Now, he alone was blamed for this occurrence. It was said that he was a jealous blockhead, liable to exactly the same fits of ferocious temper as his father. And, when, after Pierre's departure, Ellen returned to Petersburg, she was received by all her acquaintances, not only gladly, but even with a shade of respectable deference, due to her unhappiness. When her husband was mentioned in conversation, Ellen put on a dignified expression, which, without her realizing its significance, she managed by that consummate tact of hers to make peculiarly becoming. This expression signified that she had made up her mind to endure her unhappiness without complaining, and that her husband was a cross sent her from God. Prince Vasily expressed his feelings more openly. He would shrug his shoulders when the conversation turned on Pierre, and, pointing to his forehead, would say, Un savez-vous fait-le? Je l'ai désit toujours. I always said he was cracked. I said so before you did, insisted Anna Pavlovna. I said so first thing, and before anybody else, she always claimed priority for her predictions, that he was a silly young man, ruined by the perverse notions of the day. I said so even when he had just returned from abroad, and when everyone was enraptured by him, and you will remember that at one of my receptions he posed as a sort of Marat. How is it going to end? Even then I did not approve of his marriage, and predicted what would come of it. Anna Pavlovna, just as of yore, was giving receptions on her days at home, and such ones as she alone had the gift of arranging. 
receptions at which were collected in the first place la creme de la veritable bonne société la fine fleur de la science intellectuelle de la société de petersburg as anna pavlovna herself expressed it over and above this discriminating selection of society anna pavlovna's receptions or evenings were still more distinguished by the fact that at each one she managed to present to her company some new and interesting individual and that nowhere else could be so accurately and assuredly gauged the political thermometer which reflected the disposition of the conservative court society in petersburg toward the end of the year eighteen o six when the melancholy news of napoleon's defeat of the prussian army at jena and auerstadt and the surrender of the majority of the prussian fortresses had been received when our armies had just crossed over into prussia and our second campaign with napoleon was beginning anna pavlovna gave a reception the cream of genuine good society consisted of the charming and hapless ellen montmartre the bewitching prince Ippolit, just arrived from vienna two diplomats the little old aunt a young man who enjoyed the appellation simply of un homme de boucan de merite a newly promoted frailina or maid of honour and a few individuals of more or less distinction the person whom anna pavlovna served up this evening as a choice first fruit for the edification of her guests was boris Dubretskoy, who had just arrived on a special mission from the army of prussia and was now enjoying the position of adjutant to a very great personage the political thermometer that evening offered the following points for the study of society whatever all the rulers and commanders of europe may do by way of indulging bonaparte at the expense of causing me and us in general annoyance and humiliation our opinion in regard to bonaparte remains unchanged and incapable of change we shall not cease to express our views on this subject and we can merely say to the king of prussia so much the worse for you tu la voulu georges dandin it's your choice that's all we have to say about it that was what the political thermometer indicated at anna pavlovna's when boris who was to be offered up to the guests entered the drawing-room nearly all were already present and the conversation under anna pavlovna's lead turned on our diplomatic relations with austria and on the hope of an alliance boris in an elegant adjutant's uniform fresh and ruddy and grown to man's estate came with easy assurance into the drawing-room and was led up according to custom to salute the aunt and then brought back to the general circle of the guests anna pavlovna gave him her withered hand to kiss introduced him to a number of the company with whom he was not acquainted and of each she would say in a whisper le prince hippolyte kuragani charmant jean homme monsieur krug charge de fer de copenhague un esprit profound or simply monsieur sitov un homme de beaucamp de merite giving each one whom she named a word of praise boris since he had been in the service had thanks to anna mikhailovna's efforts and to his own tastes and habit of self-control succeeded in obtaining a very advantageous position he had been appointed aide to a man of great eminence he had been entrusted with very important errands to prussia and had only just returned from there as a special courier he had thoroughly mastered that unwritten system of subordination which had pleased him so much at olmutz according to which the ensign may stand incomparably higher than a general while for success in the service exertions and services and gallantry are unnecessary but all that is needed is tact in getting on with those who control the patronage of places and he was often himself surprised at his rapid advances and by the fact that his friends could not understand it the consequence of this discovery was that his whole mode of life and all his relations to former friends and acquaintances and all his plans for the future were entirely and absolutely changed he was not rich but he would spend his last kopeck so as to be better dressed than others he preferred to deprive himself of many pleasures sooner than allow himself to ride in a shabby carriage or appear in anything but an immaculate uniform in the streets of petersburg he frequented only the society of those who were above him and might be of advantage to him he loved petersburg and despised moscow his recollections of his home with the rostovs and his boyish love for natasha were unpleasant to him and since his first departure for the army he had not once been to see the rostovs on reaching anna pavlovna's drawing-room an invitation to which he considered equivalent to a rise in the service 
he immediately understood what part he had to play and he allowed anna pavlovna to make the most of the interest which centred upon him while he attentively studied each face and took mental stock of what possibilities of getting advantage from each might present themselves he sat down in the place assigned to him next to the beautiful ellen and began to listen to the conversation that was going on vienna regards the basis of the proposed treaty as so entirely out of the question that it would be impossible to bring it about even by a series of the most brilliant successes and she questions the means we have of gaining them such is the authentic report from vienna said the danish charge d'affaires in french the doubt is flattering said the young man of the deep mind with a shrewd smile one should distinguish between the cabinet of vienna and the emperor of austria said montmartre the austrian emperor could never have thought such a thing it could only have been the cabinet who said it ah my dear viscount interrupted anna pavlovna europe for some reason she called it europe as a special refinement of french which she might make use of in speaking to a frenchman eh mon cher vicomte l'europe ne sera jamais notre alliance and then anna pavlovna immediately led the conversation around to the bravery and resolution of the prussian king doing this for the sake of giving boris a chance to take part boris was listening attentively to what was said awaiting his turn but nevertheless he had been able to look several times at his neighbor the beautiful ellen who with a smile had more than once exchanged glances with the handsome young adjutant quite naturally while speaking of the position of prussia anna pavlovna begged boris to tell about his visit to glogau and the state in which he found the prussian army boris without undue haste speaking in pure and elegant french related very many interesting particulars about the army and about the court but throughout his story he carefully avoided expressing any personal opinion in regard to the facts which he communicated for some time boris held the attention of all and anna pavlovna was conscious that all her guests took great satisfaction in the treat that she had set before them ellen more than any one else gave her undivided attention to what boris had to say she several times asked him in regard to certain details of his journey and was apparently greatly interested in the position of the prussian army as soon as he had finished she turned to him with her usual smile and said you must be sure to come and see me she said in a tone which seemed to imply that circumstances of which he could know nothing made it absolutely imperative tuesday between eight o'clock and nine you will give me great pleasure boris promised to comply with her wishes and was about to engage her in further conversation when anna pavlovna called him away under the pretext that her old aunt wanted to speak with him you used to know her husband didn't you asked anna pavlovna closing her eyes and making a melancholy gesture towards ellen ach she was such an unhappy and charming woman don't speak to her about him please be careful about it it's too hard for her End of chapter six part two chapter seven of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter seven when boris and anna pavlovna returned to the general circle prince ippolit had taken the lead in the conversation leaning forward in his chair he had said le roi de prusse and when he said it he laughed all turned to him le roi de prusse asked ippolit again laughing and then with a calm and serious expression throwing himself back into the depths of his easy chair anna pavlovna waited a little for him but as ippolit apparently had firmly shut his mouth not to say anything more she started the conversation on the godless bonaparte laying hands on the sword of frederick the great at potsdam c'est le pays de frederic le grand courageux she began to say but ippolit interrupted her with the words le roi de prusse and again as before when all had turned toward him he begged her pardon and remained silent anna pavlovna frowned montmartre ippolit's friend turned to him peremptorily what do you mean now by your roi de prusse ippolit laughed as though he were ashamed of laughing no it's nothing at all i only meant he was trying to get off a joke which he had heard in vienna and which he had been anxious the whole evening long to spring upon the company he said je voulais dire seulement 
I only meant that we were doing wrong to wage war. Pour la rue de Proust. Boris smiled a guarded smile that might have been taken to signify a sneer or approbation of the joke, according as it was received by the company. All laughed. Your pun is very naughty. It's witty, but it's unfair, said Anna Pavlovna, in French, threatening him with her finger. We do not wage war, pour le rue de Proust, mais pour le bon principe. Ah, les méchants, c'est Prince Hippolyte, this bad Prince Hippolyte, said she. The conversation had not languished the whole evening, though it had turned principally upon political matters. Toward the end of the evening it grew particularly lively on the topic of the rewards bestowed by the emperor. Now last year N. N. received a snuff-box with portrait, said the man, of the profound mind. Why should not S. S. receive the same reward? I beg your pardon. A snuff-box with the emperor's portrait is a reward, but not a distinction. Une récompense, mais point une distinction, said one of the diplomats. Rather a gift. There have been precedents. I will mention Schwarzenberg. It's impossible, said the other. I'll bet you. Le grand cordon, c'est différent. When all got up to leave, Ellen, who had spoken very little all the evening, addressed Boris again, and begged him with the most flattering and significant expression to come to see her the following Tuesday. It will be a very great favor to me, she said, with a smile glancing at Anna Pavlovna, and Anna Pavlovna, with that same melancholy expression which always accompanied her words when she spoke of her august protectress, corroborated Ellen's request. It seemed that from certain words spoken by Boris that evening concerning the Prussian army, Ellen had suddenly conceived a powerful determination to see him. She practically promised him that when he came on the following Tuesday she would tell him what it was that made her wish to see him. But when on the Tuesday evening Boris reached Ellen's salon, he received no explanation that made it plain why he was so anxiously desired to come. There were other guests. The Countess talked very little with them, and only on his departure, just as he was kissing her hand, she unexpectedly whispered to him, without any smile, which was strange for her. Venez de mon dîner, le sieur. Il faut que vous venez. Venez. With this invitation to dinner, to which he was so imperiously bidden, began Boris's intimacy at the house of the Countess Buzakaya. End of chapter 7「Part Two, Chapter Eight of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Eight. The war was growing fiercer, and its theater was approaching the Russian frontiers. Everywhere were heard curses against Bonaparte, the enemy of all the human race. In all the villages of the empire, veterans and raw recruits were forming into companies and from the theatre of war came conflicting rumours, usually false, and consequently interpreted in various ways. The life of the old Prince Bolkonsky, Prince Andrei, and the Princess Maria had changed in many respects since the year 1805. In 1806 the old prince was appointed one of the eight commanders-in-chief for the militia, at that time recruiting all over Russia. The old prince, in spite of the weaknesses of age, which had become especially noticeable at the period when he supposed that his son was killed, felt that he had no right to refuse the duty to which he had been called by the sovereign in person, and this new activity into which he entered stimulated and strengthened him. He was constantly engaged in journeying about the three governments entrusted to him. He carried his regulations even to pedantry. He was stern and strict even to cruelty with his subordinates and he himself looked into the smallest details of his work. The Prince Maria had already ceased to recite her lessons in mathematics to her father, and only on mornings when he was at home did she go into his cabinet, accompanied by the wet nurse and the little Prince Nikolai, as his grandfather called him. The baby prince, with his wet nurse and the old nyanya, Savishna, lived in the apartments which had been occupied by the princess, her mother, and the young Prince Maria, spent a large portion of the day in the nursery, trying to the best of her ability to take the place of mother to her little nephew. Mademoiselle Burine also apparently felt a passionate love for the child, and the Princess Maria, often in a spite of sacrifice, would allow her friend the pleasure of attending the little angel, as she called her nephew, and play with him. 
Near the altar of the Luisa Gorsky Church, a chapel had been built to the memory of the little princess, and in the chapel was placed a marble monument, brought from Italy, representing an angel with outstretched wings, as if about to mount to heaven. The angel's upper lip was lifted a little, as though it were going to smile. Once Prince Andrei and the Princess Maria, as they came out of the chapel, agreed that the face of the angel reminded them strangely of the face of the departed. But what was still stranger, and this Prince Andrei did not remark to his sister, was that in this expression which the artist had accidentally given to the angel's face, Prince Andrei read those very words of sweet reproach which he had before read on the face of his dead wife. Ah, what have they done to me? Shortly after Prince Andrei's return, the old prince had made over to his son, the large estate of Bogokorova, situated about forty versts from Luisa Gori, partly on account of the sad recollections associated with Luisa Gori, partly because Prince Andrei always felt himself unable to endure his father's idiosyncrasies, and partly also because he felt the need of solitude. He took possession of Bogosharovo, established himself there, and there spent a large part of his time. Prince Andrei, after the Battle of Austerlitz, had resolutely made up his mind never to go back into the military service again, and when the war began and all were obliged to enlist, he, in order to escape active service, accepted a position under his father's command in the recruiting of the militia. Since the campaign of 1805, the old prince and his son seemed to have exchanged parts. The father, excited by active life, expected all that was good from the campaign. Prince Andrei, on the contrary, not taking any active part in the war, and in the secret depths of his heart regretting it, saw only a dark prospect ahead. On the 10th of March, 1807, the old prince started on one of his circuits. Prince André, as usual during his father's absences, stayed at Luisa Guri. The dear little Nikolushka had not been quite well for several days. The coachman who had driven the old prince to the next town returned and brought documents and letters for Prince André. The valet, carrying the mail, failing to find the prince in his study, went to the Princess Maria's apartments, but he was not there either. The valet was informed that the prince had gone to the nursery. "'If you please, your illustriousness, Petrusha has come with some documents,' said one of the maids employed in the nursery, addressing Prince André, who was sitting in a child's small chair, and, with knitted brows and trembling hands, was dropping medicine from a bottle into a tumbler half full of water. "'What did you say?' said he, testily, and by an unguarded movement of his trembling hand he poured too many drops into the glass of water." He threw the medicine on the floor and asked for some more water. The maid handed it to him. In the room stood a child's cradle, two chests, two armchairs, a table, a child's table, and the little chair in which Prince Andrei was sitting. The windows were closely shaded, and on the table burned a single candle shaded by a bound volume of music, so that no light might fall on the cradle. "'My dear,' said the Princess Maria, turning to her brother from the cradle by which she was standing, you'd better wait until ugh please be kind enough you're always talking nonsense and you're always procrastinating and see what it has led to now said prince andre in an angry whisper with the manifest intention of wounding his sister my dear truly it would be better not to awaken him he is asleep now said the princess in a supplicating voice prince andre got up and went over on tiptoes to the cradle with the glass in his hand "'Had we really better not wake him?' he said, irresolutely. "'Just as you please. Truly, I think so. But just as you think best,' said the Princess Maria, evidently embarrassed and a little ashamed that her opinion was about to rule. She called her brother's attention to the maid who was speaking to him in a whisper. It was the second night that neither of them had got any sleep on account of watching over the baby, which was suffering from a sharp attack of fever.' All this time, since they had felt very little confidence in their own domestic physician and were expecting one to be sent them from the city, they had disagreed about remedies, one preferring one thing, the other another. Suffering from sleeplessness and anxiety, they each blamed the other and indulged in recriminations which accounted to actual quarrels. Petrusha, with documents from your papenka, whispered the maid. Prince Andrei went out. "'The devil take them!' he exclaimed, and after hearing the verbal messages from his father and taking the envelopes and letters, he went back to the nursery. "'How is he now?' asked Prince Andrei. "'Just the same. 
we must await the mercy of God. Karl Ivanuitch always declares that sleep is better than any medicine, whispered the Princess Maria with a sigh. Prince Andrei went to the child and felt of him. He was very hot. The mischief take you and your Karl Ivanuitch. He took the glass with the medicine which he had dropped into it and again approached the cradle. Andre, you ought not, exclaimed the Princess Maria. But he scowled wrathfully at her, and at the same time with the look of a martyr, and bent over the baby with his glass. I insist upon it, said he. Well, then, you give it to him. The Princess Maria shrugged her shoulders, but obediently took the glass, and calling the nurse to help, tried to give the child the medicine. The baby screamed and strangled. Prince Andrei, scowling, clasped his hands to his head, left the room, and sat down on a sofa in the next room. The letters were still in his hands. He mechanically opened them and began to read them. The old prince, in his large, scrawly hand, sometimes employing abbreviations and quaint, archaic words, wrote on blue paper as follows. I have just at this moment received very agreeable news, unless it's a canard. But Nixon is said to have gained a complete victory over Bonaparte at Eulau. They are wild with delight at Petersburg, and endless rewards have been distributed in the army. Though he's a German, I congratulate him. I cannot imagine what that Nachalnik Hendrikov is doing at Korchevo. So far no reinforcements or provisions have come from him. Go there as quick as you can, and tell him that I will take his head off if everything is not here within a week's time. I have received additional news about the Battle of Ailau through a letter from Petenka. He took part. It's all true. When mischief-makers do not meddle, then even a German can beat Bonaparte. They say he is retreating in great disorder. See that you go to Korchevo without delay and hurry things along. Prince Andrei sighed and tore open another envelope. This was a closely written letter from Bilibin, filling two sheets. He folded it up without reading it, and again perused the letter from his father, ending with the words, Go to Korchevo without delay and hurry things along. No, excuse me, I will not go now, when my baby is still sick, he said to himself, and stepping to the door he looked into the nursery. Princess Maria still stood by the cradle, and was gently rocking the child. Yes, what in the name of goodness was that other disagreeable thing that he wrote, asked Prince Andre, trying to recall his father's letter. Oh, yes, our men have won a victory over Bonaparte, now that I am not there to take part. Yes, Yes, he will have a good chance to make sport of me. Well, let him if he wants. And he began to read Bilibin's letter. He read without understanding half of it, read it simply for the sake of forgetting for the moment what had been painfully occupying his thoughts to the exclusion of everything else for quite too long. End of chapter 8「ーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーー
flings himself on the Prussians without allowing them to finish their parade, in short meter beats them all hollow, le rosse pat couture, and makes himself at home in the palace at Potsdam. I have the most earnest desire, writes the King of Prussia, to Bonaparte, that your majesty should be received and treated in my palace as would be most agreeable to you, and I hasten to take all measures to this end that circumstances permit. I only hope that I have been successful. The Prussian generals make it a point of honor to be gracious toward the French, and lay down their arms at the first summons. The principal officer of the garrison of Glugau, with ten thousand men, asks the king of Prussia what he should do if he is called upon to surrender. A fact. In short, while hoping to make a great impression solely by our military attitude, lo and behold, here we are in for a real war, and what is worse, for a war on our own frontiers, avec et pour le roi de Prusse. Everything is all ready. We lack only one trifling thing, that is, a general-in-chief. As it has been discovered that the successes of Austerlitz might have been more decided, if only the general-in-chief had been older, all the octogenarians had been brought forward, and between Prozorovsky and Kamensky, the preference has been given to the latter. The general comes to us in a kibitka, after the style of Suvorov, and is received with acclamations of joy and triumph. On the fourth comes the first courier from Petersburg. The mail is brought in to the marshal's study, as he likes to do everything personally. I am summoned to help sort the letters, and take those addressed to ourselves. The marshal looks on while we work, and waits for the packages addressed to him. We search them over, but there is not one. The marshal becomes impatient, and sets to work himself, and finds letters from the emperor, for Count T, for Prince V, and others. Then, lo and behold, he goes off into one of his blue rages. He shoots fire and flames against everybody. He seizes the letters, breaks their seals, and reads those which the emperor has written to others. So that's the way I am treated. They have no confidence in me. Ah, that's a fine notion, setting others to watch my actions. Away with you. And he writes his famous order of the day to General Benigson. I am wounded and cannot ride on horseback, and consequently cannot command the army. You have taken your defeated corps d'armée to Poltusk. There it is exposed, and lacks firewood and provender, and, as you yourself reported last evening, to Count Foxhofden, you must devise measures for retiring beyond our frontier. See that this is done to-day. Owing to all my riding on horseback, he writes to the emperor, I have become galled by the saddle, which, in addition to my former infirmities, entirely prevents me from riding on horseback and commanding such an extensive army, and therefore I have transferred the command to Count Buxhofden, who is next in seniority to myself, giving him the whole charge and advising him, in case he cannot obtain bread, to move nearer to the interior of Prussia, since only enough bread is left for one day, and some of the regiments have none at all, according to the reports of the division commanders, Ostermann and Sedmoreski, and the peasants also have nothing left, and I myself shall remain in the hospital at Ostrolenko until I am well. In offering, most respectfully, this report, I would add that if this army remain another fortnight in its present bouviac, by spring there will not be a single soldier left. Permit an old man to retire to the country, since he is now so feeble that he finds it impossible to fulfill the great and glorious duty for which he was chosen. I shall await your all-gracious permission here in the hospital, so as not to play the role of a clerk instead of commander at the head of the army. Of men like myself there are thousands in Russia. The marshal is vexed with the emperor, and punishes all of us for it. Isn't that logical? Thus ends the first act. In those that follow, the interest and absurdity increase in proper degree. After the marshal's departure, it is discovered that we are in sight of the enemy, and must fight. Buxhoveden is commander-general-in-chief by order of seniority, but General Benigsen is not of this opinion, all the more because it is he and his corps who are in sight of the enemy, and he is anxious to profit by the occasion to fight a battle on his own account. Aus eigene Hunt, as the Germans say. He does so. This is the Battle of Potolsk, which is reported to be a great victory, but which, in my opinion, was no victory at all. We civilians, nous autres Pekin, have, as you are well aware, 
a very wretched habit of making up our own minds in regard to the gain or loss of a battle. The one who retires after the battle is the loser, so we say, and in this respect we lost the battle of Poltusk. In short, we retreated after the battle, but we send a courier to Petersburg to carry the news of the victory, and the general refuses to surrender the chief command to Buxhovden, hoping to receive from Petersburg the title General-in-Chief as a reward for his victory. During this interregnum, we begin an excessively interesting and original scheme of maneuvers. Our design consists not, as it should have been, in avoiding or attacking the enemy, but solely of avoiding General Buxhovden, who by right of seniority should be our chief. We pursue this plan with so much energy that even in crossing an unfordable river we burn our bridges to cut off the enemy, who for the nonce is not Bonaparte, but Buxhovden. General Buxhovden just misses being attacked and taken by overwhelming forces of the enemy, by reason of one of our pretty maneuvers which saves us from him. Buxhovden pursues us, we sneak away. As soon as he crosses to our side of the river, we cross back again. At last our enemy, Buxhovden, catches up with us and attacks us. The two generals have a quarrel. Buxhovden even goes so far as to send a challenge, and Benixen has an attack of epilepsy. But at the critical moment, the courier who carried the news of our victory at Poltosk returns with our nomination as general-in-chief, and our enemy number one is done for. We can think of number two, Bonaparte. But what do you suppose? Just at this moment, there rises before us a third enemy, the Pravoslavnoye, the Orthodox army, loudly clamoring for bread, for meat, for sukari, for hay, and what not. The stores are empty, the roads impassable. The Pravoslavnoye set themselves to marauding, and in a way of which the last campaign would not give you the slightest notion. Half of the regiments formed themselves into freebooters, scouring the country and putting everything to fire and sword. The natives are ruined, root and branch. The hospitals are overflowing with sick, and famine is everywhere. Twice the headquarters have been attacked by troops of marauders, and the general-in-chief has himself been obliged to ask for a battalion to drive them off. In one of these attacks my empty trunk and my dressing-gown was carried off. The emperor has consented to grant all the division chiefs the right to shoot the marauders, but I very much fear that such a course would oblige one half of the army to shoot the other half. Prince Andrei at first read with his eyes alone, but gradually, in spite of himself, what he was reading, in spite of the fact that he was well aware of how far Biblim was to be trusted, began to absorb him more and more. Having read thus far, he crumpled up the letter and threw it aside. It was not what he had read in the letter that moved his indignation, but rather the fact that the life there, so remote and foreign to him now, had still the power to stir him. He closed his eyes, rubbed his forehead with his hand, as though to drive away all recollection of what he had been reading, and listened to what was going on in the nursery. Suddenly it seemed to him that he heard a strange sound there. A great fear came over him. He was afraid that something might have happened to his baby while he was reading the letter. He went to the nursery door on his tiptoes and opened it. As he went in, he noticed that the nurse, with a frightened face, was hiding something from him, and the Princess Mario was no longer by the cradle. My dear, he heard behind him, in the frightened voice, as it seemed to him, of his sister. As often occurs after long wakefulness and keen emotion, a causeless panic came over him. He imagined that the child might be dying, or dead. All that he heard and saw now seemed to confirm this fear. It is all over, he said to himself, and a cold sweat stood out on his brow. He went to the cradle in great apprehension, firmly convinced that he should find it empty, that the nurse-girl was hiding his dead baby. He drew the curtains aside, and it was some time before his frightened, wandering eyes could find the child. At last he saw him. The little one, all rosy, lay sprawled out across the cradle, with his head lower than the pillow, and he was smacking his lips in his sleep and breathing regularly. Prince Andrei was perfectly delighted to see the child so, when he was already beginning to think that he had lost him. He bent over and, as his sister had instructed him, felt with his lips whether the baby's fever had gone. The sweet brow was moist. He passed his hand over the little head, and the soft hair was also moist. The baby was in such a perspiration. Not only was the baby not dead, but he was aware now that the crisis had passed, and that he was better. 
he felt strong inclination to snatch up this helpless little creature and press it to his heart, but he dared not do so. He stood over him, looking at his head and his little arms and feet which had thrown off the coverings. He heard a rustling behind him, and thought he saw a shadow outlined on the curtain of the cradle. But he did not look around, but gazed into the baby's face, still listening to his regular breathing. The dark shadow was the Princess Maria, who, with noiseless steps, came to the cradle, lifted the curtain, and dropped it after her. Prince Andre, without looking around, recognized her, and stretched out his hand to her. She pressed his hand. "'He is in a perspiration,' said Prince Andre. "'I had gone out to tell you.' The baby stirred a little in his sleep, smiled, and rubbed his forehead against the pillow. Prince Andre looked at his sister. The Princess Maria's lustrous eyes in the subdued twilight of the curtains gleamed more than usually bright with happy tears. She leaned over to her brother and kissed him, slightly catching her dress in the material of the curtain. Each made the other a warning gesture and stood quiet for a moment, under the faint light of the curtain, as though they wished still to remain in that world in which they were shut off from all the rest of the universe. Prince Andre was the first to move away from the cradle, getting his head entangled in the muslin of the curtain as he did so. "'Yes, that is all that is left for me now,' said he, with a sigh." End of chapter 9「Part Two, Chapter Ten of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Ten. Shortly after his reception into the Masonic Brotherhood, Pierre, with full instructions given him for his guidance in managing his estates, reached the government of Kiev, where the larger number of his serfs were to be found. When he reached Kiev, he summoned all his overseers and explained his intentions and desires. He told him that measures would be immediately taken for the unconditional emancipation from servitude of all his serfs, that till this was done the peasants must not be constrained to hard work, that the women and children must not be required to work at all, that assistance was to be freely rendered the peasantry, that corporal punishments were not to be employed, but reprimands, and that on each of his estates, hospitals, asylums, and schools were to be established. Some of the overseers, and in the number were half-educated economs or stewards, listened with dismay, supposing that the young count's speech meant that he was dissatisfied with their management or had discovered how they had been embezzling his funds. Others, after their first panic, found amusement in Pierre's thick, stumbling speech and the new words which they had never heard before, a third set found simply a certain sense of satisfaction in hearing their barren talk. A fourth, and these were the sharpest, and at their head the chief overseer, perceived from this talk how it behooved them to manage with their baron in order to subserve their own ends. The chief overseer expressed great sympathy in Pierre's proposed plans, but he remarked that over and above these reforms it was indispensable to make a general investigation of his affairs, which were in a sufficiently unfortunate state. In spite of Count Buzikoy's enormous wealth at the time when Pierre entered upon his inheritance, and it was said that he had an income of 500,000 rubles a year, he felt himself much poorer than when he received an allowance of 10,000 a year from his late father. He had a general dim idea that his expenses were somewhat as follows. Interest to the society. Footnote. The famous bank supported by the state that loaned money on land and personal property, including serfs. End footnote about 80,000 rubles, on all his possessions. About 30,000 stood him for the maintenance of his house in Moscow and his Podmoskovnaya and the support of the three princesses. About 15,000 went to pensions, as much into various charitable institutions. 150,000 were put down for support of the countess. About 70,000 went in interest on his debts. The building of a church, which he had begun a couple of years before, cost him about 10,000 a year. The rest... Not far from one hundred thousand was expended, he himself knew not how, and almost every year he found himself obliged to borrow. Moreover, each year his chief overseer had written to him about fires, about bad harvests, about the necessity of building new factories and works, and thus Pierre was first thing confronted by what he had not the slightest taste or capacity for, the settlement of his affairs. Pierre each day spent some time with his chief overseer in this business, but he was conscious that his efforts did not advance his interests a single step. He was conscious that his efforts were wasted on this business, 
that they did not have the slightest influence on his affairs and were not calculated to help him on with his schemes on the one hand his head overseer pictured his affairs in the gloomiest colors pointing out to pierre the absolute necessity of paying his debts and undertaking new enterprises with the labor of his peasantry a thing to which pierre refused to listen on the other hand pierre insisted on the project of emancipating his serfs but to this the overseer opposed the imperious necessity of first paying off the mortgage held by the Oprakunsky, or Orphans' Aid Society, and consequently the impossibility of accomplishing the business rapidly. The overseer did not say that this was absolutely impossible. He proposed for bringing this about, the selling of certain forests in the government of Kostroma, some river lands, and an estate in the Crimea. But all these operations proposed by the overseer entailed complicated legal proceedings, replevins, permits, licenses, and so forth, so that Pierre quite lost his wits, and merely said, Yes, yes, do so then. Pierre was not possessed of that practical bent for business which would have enabled him to grasp the whole matter immediately, and consequently he disliked it all, and merely pretended to take an interest in it in the overseer's presence. The overseer, on his side, pretended to consider all these efforts advantageous for the proprietor, and troublesome for himself. In the large city of Kiev, the capital of the province, Pierre had some acquaintances. Those whom he did not know made haste to pay their respects to him, and gladly welcomed the millionaire, the largest landowner of the whole government. The temptations that assailed Pierre in his principal weakness, as he had confessed at the time of his entrance into the lodge, were also so powerful that he could not resist them. Again, whole days, weeks, months of his life sped away, constantly occupied with parties, dinners, breakfasts, balls, just as it had been in Petersburg, so that he had no time whatsoever for serious thoughts. Instead of the new life which he had hoped to lead, he still went on with the same old routine, only in different surroundings. Of the three obligations of Freemasonry, Pierre acknowledged that he was not fulfilling the one that enjoined upon every Mason to be a model of moral living, and of the seven precepts of virtue, two he had not taken to heart. Virtuous living and love for death. He comforted himself with the thought that he was fulfilling one of the other obligations, the reformation of the human race, and that he possessed other virtues, love to his neighbor, and particularly liberality. In the spring of the year 1807, Pierre determined to return to Petersburg, making on his way a visit to all of his possessions, so as to assure himself as to what had been done towards carrying out his orders, and personally to learn in what condition lived the peasantry entrusted to him by God, and whom he was striving to benefit. His head overseer, who considered all of the young Count's ideas as perfectly chimerical, disadvantageous for himself, for him, for the peasants themselves, had made some concessions. Though he still represented that the emancipation of the serfs was an impossibility, he had made arrangements for the extensive erection on all the estates, of schools, hospitals, and asylums, against the coming of the baron. Everywhere he had arrangements for receptions, not, to be sure, on a sumptuous and magnificent scale which he knew would displease the young count, but rather semi-religious and thanksgiving processions, with sacred images and the traditional kleb sol, or bread and salt, the Russian symbol of hospitality. Such demonstrations, in fact, as he was certain from his knowledge of the baron's character, would deeply touch him and delude him. The southern spring, the comfortable, rapid journey in his Vienna calash, and the solitude in which he travelled, had made a most pleasant impression on Pierre. These estates, none of which he had ever seen before, were each more picturesque than the other. The peasantry everywhere appeared prosperous and touchingly grateful to him for the benefits which he was heaping upon them. Everywhere they met him with processions and receptions which, though they embarrassed him, filled his heart with a pleasant sensation. In one place, the peasants brought him the Club Sol and a holy picture of Peter and Paul, and besought his permission to add at their own expense, in honor of his name-day, and as a sign of their love and gratitude to him, for the benefits conferred upon them, a new chantry to the church. In another place he was met by women and children at the breast, who thanked him for freeing them from hard work. On a third estate he was met by a priest carrying a cross and surrounded by children, to whom, through the Count's liberality, he was teaching reading and religion. On all his estates he saw with his own eyes the massive stone foundations of edifices for hospitals, schools, and almshouses, 
building or almost built, and ready to be opened in a short time. Everywhere, Pierre saw from the accounts of his overseers that enforced labor had been greatly reduced from what it had been, and he listened to the affecting expressions of gratitude from deputations of serfs in their blue kaftans. But Pierre had no knowledge of the fact that where he had been met with the bread and salt, and where they were building the chantry of Peter and Paul, it was a commercial village where a yarmarka or annual bazaar was held on St. Peter's Day, that the chantry had been begun long before by some well-to-do muzics of the village, the very ones, in fact, who came to meet him, while nine-tenths of the peasants of this same village lived in the profoundest destitution. He did not know that in consequence of his order to cease employing nursing women at work in the fields, these very same women were forced to do vastly harder work on their own lots of communal land. He did not know that the priest who came to meet him with his cross oppressed the muzaks with his extractions, and that the pupils who accompanied him were placed with him at a cost of tears, and were often ransomed back by their parents for large sums of money. He did not know that the edifices built, according to his plan, of stone were the work of his own laborers, and greatly increased the forced service of his serfs, which was really diminished only on paper. He did not know that where the overseers pointed out to him on the books the reduction of the serfs' obruks, or money payments, by one-third, the consequence was that an amount corresponding was added to the forced labor of the peasantry. And so Pierre was in raptures over his tour among his estates, and he fell back fully into that philanthropical frame of mind in which he had left Petersburg, and he wrote enthusiastic letters to his preceptor brother, as he called the Grand Master. How easy it is, how little strength it requires to do so much good, said Pierre to himself, and how little we trouble ourselves about it. He was happy over the gratitude, but felt mortified to be the recipient of it. This gratitude made him think how very much more he might have easily done for these simple-hearted, kindly people. The chief overseer, a thoroughly obstinate and wily man, perfectly comprehending the intelligent but naive young count, and playing him as with a toy, when he saw the effect produced upon him by the receptions that he had himself so skilfully arranged, approached him all the more resolutely with arguments for the impossibility and, above all, the uselessness of emancipating the serfs, who were perfectly happy and contented as they were. Pierre, in the depths of his soul, agreed with the overseer that it would be hard to imagine people more happy and contented, and that God only knew what would happen to them if they had their freedom, but still, though against his better judgment, he insisted upon what he felt was only justice. The overseer promised to do all in his power to carry out the Count's desires, clearly comprehending that the Count would never be in a position to assure himself whether all his plans for the disposal of his forests and other lands for the sake of redeeming his mortgages to the society had been carried out, or would ever ask or know how his costly edifices would stand empty, and the peasants would continue to contribute their labor and money just the same as they did on other estates, that is, the utmost that they could give. End of chapter 10 Part 2, Chapter 11 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 11 On his return from his southern journey, in the happiest frame of mind, Pierre carried out his long-cherished purpose of going to make a visit to his old friend, Volkonsky, whom he had not seen for two years. Bogucharovo was situated in the midst of a flat and uninteresting region, diversified with fields and forests of birch and evergreens, cleared and uncleared. The Barsky Dvor, or proprietor's place, was situated at one end of the straggling village, which extended along both sides of the straight highway. In front was a pond, recently dug and filled with water, though the grass had not yet had a chance to grow on the banks around. The house stood in the midst of a young grove, some of the trees of which were pines and firs. The Barsky Dvor consisted of a granary and threshing floor, the house servants' quarters, the stable, a bathhouse, and the wings of a great stone mansion, the semicircular facade of which was in process of erection. Around the house a young garden was planted, the fences were strong and the paths were new. Under a shed stood two fire engines and a barrel, painted a vivid green. The paths were straight, the bridges were well built and had railings, 
everything bore the impress of extreme care and good management. The house serfs who met Pierre, in answer to his question where the prince lived, pointed to a small building standing at the very edge of the pond. Prince Andrei's old body servant, Anton, helped Pierre down from the calash, told him that the prince was at home, and led him into a neat little anteroom. Pierre was struck by the modesty of this diminutive, though scrupulously clean little house, after the brilliant conditions of existence in which he had last seen his friend in Petersburg. He hurriedly went into a small hall, smelling of pine and not even plastered, and was about to go further, but Anton preceded him on his tiptoes and knocked at the door. "'Now who's there?' was the reply, in a harsh, forbidding voice. "'A visitor,' replied Anton. "'Ask him to wait,' and the noise of a chair pushed back was heard. Pierre went with swift steps to the door and met Prince André face to face as he came out, frowning and looking older than his years. Pierre threw his arms around him, pushing up his spectacles, kissed him on the cheeks, and looked at him closely. "'Well, this is a surprise. Very glad to see you,' said Prince André. Pierre said nothing. He was gazing at his friend in amazement, not taking his eyes from him. He was struck by the change that had taken place in Prince André. His words were affectionate, there was a smile on his lips and face, but his eyes were dim and lifeless, in spite of his evident desire to make them seem to have a joyous and lively light. His friend was not so much disturbed that he had grown thinner and paler, but this expression of his eyes and the frown on his brow, the evidence of long-continued concentration on some one painful topic, amazed and estranged Pierre, who was not used to seeing him so. As usual on meeting after long separation, it took some time to get the conversation into running order. They asked and answered various questions briefly in regard to things which both knew they should have to talk about afterward at length. At last they began to settle down a little more on what they already touched upon, what had taken place in the past, and their plans for the future, about Pierre's journey, his undertakings, the war, and other topics. That concentration and lifelessness which Pierre had already remarked in Prince André's eyes, was now expressed still more noticeably in the smile with which he listened to Pierre, especially when he spoke with animation of the past or the future. It seemed as though Prince André were trying, but without success, to feel an interest in what he said. Pierre was beginning to feel that it was in bad taste in Prince André's presence to speak of his enthusiasms, dreams, hopes of happiness, and of doing good. He was ashamed to tell about his new notions concerning Freemasonry, which had been especially renewed and excited during the latter part of his journey. He restrained himself for fear of seeming naive. At the same time he had an irresistible desire to tell his friend, as soon as possible, that now he was an entirely different and much better man than he had been when he had known him in Petersburg. "'I cannot tell you what I have lived through since then. I should not know myself.' "'Yes.' Yes, we have changed much since that time, said Prince André. Well, and you, asked Pierre, what are your plans? Plans, replied Prince André, in an ironical tone. My plans, he repeated again, as though he were astonished at such a word. You can see for yourself, I am building. I intend next year to come here for good. Pierre said nothing, but still looked attentively at Prince André's aged face. No, I wanted to ask, said he, but Prince André interrupted him. But what is the use of talking about me? Tell me, oh yes, tell me about your journey, all about what you expect to accomplish on your estates. Pierre began to tell him what he had been doing for his peasantry, trying to conceal as far as possible his own part in the improvements made. Prince André several times finished Pierre's description for him, as though all that Pierre had done were an old story, and he seemed to listen not only without interest, but even as though he felt ashamed at what Pierre told him. Pierre began to feel awkward and uncomfortable in his friend's society. He stopped talking. "'Now see here, my dear fellow, Dushamoya, said Prince André, who evidently found it just as uncomfortable and irksome in his guest's society. "'I'm only camping out here, as it were. Came over simply to see how things were going. I'm going back tonight to my sister's.' If you will go back with me, I'll introduce you to her. Oh, but I think you know her, he added, evidently trying to think of something to amuse a guest with whom he felt he had nothing in common. We will start right after dinner. But now, would you like to look around my premises? 
They went out, and returned to the house in time for dinner, talking of the political news, and of their common acquaintances, like men who cared very little for each other. Prince Andrei made a show of animation and interest only in regard to the new buildings and premises which he was engaged in constructing, but even here, in the midst of their conversation, and while they were on the scaffolding, and he was describing the projected arrangements of the house, he suddenly paused. However, there is nothing very interesting about this. Let us go to dinner, and then start. At the dinner-table the talk turned on Pierre's marriage. "'I was very much amazed when I heard about it,' said Prince Andrei. Pierre flushed, as he usually did when it was mentioned, and said hurriedly, "'I will tell you all about it some time, tell you how it happened. But you know that it is all over, and for ever.' "'For ever?' queried Prince Andrei. "'There is no such thing as for ever. "'But you know, don't you, how it all ended. You heard about the duel. "'And so you had to go through that also.' "'There is one thing that I thank God for, and that is that I did not kill the man,' said Pierre. "'Why so?' asked Prince André. "'To kill a mad dog is a very good thing.' "'No, but to kill a man is not good. Not right.' "'Why is it not right?' demanded Prince André. "'It is not for men to judge what is right and wrong. Men have always been in error, and always will be in error, and in nothing more than in what they consider to be right and wrong.' "'Wrong is whatever is harmful to our fellow men,' said Pierre, feeling a sense of satisfaction that here for the first time since his arrival Prince André had really brightened up and begun to talk, and was on the way to disclosing what had made him so different from what he used to be. "'And who has ever told you what is harmful to our fellow men?' asked the other. "'Harmful! Harmful!' exclaimed Pierre. "'We all know what that means for ourselves. "'Yes, we know what is evil for ourselves.' But that which is evil for myself may not be evil for another man, said Prince Andrei, growing more and more constantly animated. He added in French, I know of only two real evils in life, remorse and illness. There is nothing good except the absence of these evils. To live for myself, avoiding only these two evils, is at present all my philosophy. But how about love for your neighbor and self-sacrifice, protested Pierre. No, I cannot agree with you. It is a very little thing to live merely so as not to do evil, merely to be free from remorse. I have lived in that way. I have lived for myself, and I have wasted my life. And now only that I am living, I mean trying to live, for others, Pierre corrected himself out of modesty, only now do I realize the full happiness of life. No, I cannot agree with you, and you yourself do not mean what you say. Prince Andrei looked silently at Pierre, and smiled satirically. "'Well, you are going to see my sister, the Princess Maria. "'You and she will agree,' said he. "'Maybe you are right as far as you are concerned,' he went on to say, after a short silence. "'But everyone must work out his own life. "'You have lived for yourself, and declare that you have almost wasted your life by this course, "'and you have found happiness only when you began to live for others. "'But my experience has been exactly the opposite. "'I have lived for glory. "'And what is glory?' Is it not love for others, the desire to do something for them, the yearning for their applause? And in that way I have lived for others, and have not almost, but wholly, wasted my life. But only since I have begun to live for myself alone have I begun to feel more satisfied. But how can you live for yourself alone? asked Pierre, growing heated. There is your son, your sister, your father. Ah, yes but they are the same as myself, they are not other people, explained Prince André, but others, neighbors, le pochon, as you and the Princess Maria express it, they are the chief fountainhead of error and evil. Le pochon, your neighbor is, for instance, those Kiev musics of yours, whom you are trying to load with benefits. And he looked at Pierre with a provokingly satirical expression. It evidently provoked Pierre, you are jesting, said Pierre, who is constantly growing more and more excited. How can there be error and evil in what I have desired? The accomplishment has been very trifling and wretched, but I mean in what I have desired, to do in the way of benefiting them, and have accomplished in some small measure. What possible evil can there be in poor men, like our musics, men just like ourselves, who grow up and perish without any comprehension of God and right, beyond mere forms and meaningless prayers, 
being taught the consoling belief in a future life in rewards and compensations and joys to come pray what evil or error is there in my giving medicine and a hospital and a refuge for old age to men who are dying of maladies without succor when it is so easy to help them materially and is it not a palpable and unquestionable benefit that when the muzics the nursing women have no rest either day or night and i give them leisure and recreation said pierre stammering in his efforts to talk fast and keep up with his thoughts and i have done this stupidly enough feebly enough but at all events i have done something toward it and you will fail to persuade me either that what i have done is not good or that you yourself have any such notion and above all proceeded pierre i know i am firmly persuaded that the pleasure of doing good in this way is the only true happiness that life affords yes if you propound the question in that way you make an entirely different one out of it said prince andrei i am building a house i am laying out a garden and you are erecting hospitals and some one else might come along and argue that both were a waste of time but the decision as to what is right and what is good let us leave to him who knows all things and not try to decide it for ourselves but i see that you want to argue the question he added give it to us then they had left the table and were sitting on a flight of steps that took the place of a balcony well let us have the discussion then said prince andrei you speak of schools he went on to say bending one finger and of education and so on that is you wish to take such a man as that pointing toward a muzik who as he passed by them pulled off his hat and lift him from his animal existence and give him moral necessities but it seems to me that his only possible happiness is his animal enjoyment and that you want to deprive him of it i envy you you want to make him like me you say another thing you propose to free him from work but in my opinion physical labor is for him as much a necessity as much a condition of his existence as intellectual labor is for you or me you cannot help thinking i go to bed at three o'clock thoughts crowd in upon me and i keep turning and twisting and it is morning before sleep comes and the reason is because i am thinking and cannot help thinking just as he cannot help ploughing and mowing if he did not he would go to the tavern and make himself ill just as i could not endure his terrible physical labor and should die within a week so he could not endure my physical idleness he would grow stout and die in the third place but what is your third point prince andrei began to double down his third finger oh yes hospitals medicines well he has a stroke and dies but you would bleed him and cure him and he would drag out a crippled existence for ten years more a burden to every one it is far easier and simpler for him to die others are born and there are so many of them to take his place if it were merely that you were sorry for the loss of a good workman that would be a different thing for that's the way i look at it but you want to cure him out of mere love for him and that is not necessary as far as he is concerned and then besides what a delusion it is that medicine ever anywhere cured any one you might rather call it murder said he frowning with disgust and turning from pierre prince andrei expressed his thoughts with such clearness and precision that it was evident he had thought on these questions and he spoke fluently and rapidly like a man who has not had for a long time a chance to express his thoughts his eyes kept growing more and more animated in proportion as his ideas became pessimistic ugh this is horrible horrible exclaimed pierre what i cannot understand is how you can live holding such opinions such moments of despair have come to me but that was long long ago at moscow and abroad but at such times i go down into the depths so that i cease to live everything is disgusting to me myself above all at such times i do not eat or wash myself well is that the way with you why shouldn't i wash myself it isn't cleanly retorted prince andrei on the contrary i have to struggle to make my life as agreeable as possible i am alive i am not to blame for that and so it behooves me to make the best of it not interfering with anybody else until death carries me off but what on earth induces you to live cherishing such notions do you really intend to sit down doing nothing and without undertaking anything ah but life refuses to let me be in peace 
I should be glad enough to be a do-nothing, but here, on the one hand, the nobility of the district have done me the honour of electing me their marshal, and it was as much as I could do to get out of it. They could not understand that I had not a single qualification for the office, not a bit of that peculiarly good-natured and commonplace indefatigability which is needed for it. And that is the explanation of this house which I felt called upon to build, so as to have my own little nook where I could be free and easy. And then again there is the militia. Why don't you serve in the army? After Austerlitz, exclaimed Prince Andrei gloomily. No, I thank you humbly, but I have taken a solemn vow that I would never again serve in the Russian army. I would not, even if Bonaparte were here at Smolensk, threatening Luisa Guri. No, not even then would I serve in the Russian army. There, now I have told you, proceeded Prince Andrei, growing calmer. But there is the militia. My father is commander-in-chief of the third district, and the only way that I could avoid joining the army again was to be with him. So you are in the service after all? Yes, I am. He was silent for a little. But why are you? This is why. My father is one of the most remarkable men of his age, but he has grown old, and while he is not exactly cruel, he has too restless a nature. He is so used to unlimited power that it makes him terrible, and now he has the power granted him by the emperor as commander-in-chief of the militia. If I had been two hours late, a fortnight ago, he would have hanged a registry clerk at Yukmovo, said Prince Andrei with a smile and so I serve because no one besides me has any influence over him, and I often save him from acts which he would be sorry for afterwards. Ah, there now, you see. Yes, but it is not as you understand it, retorted Prince Andrei in French. It was not that I wasted any sympathy on the rascal of a clerk who had been stealing boots from the militia. As far as I was concerned, I should have been glad enough if he had been hanged, but I should have felt sorry for my father, which is the same thing as for myself. Prince Andrei was growing more and more excited. His eyes sparkled with a feverish light as he tried to prove to Pierre that his action had nothing whatever of philanthropy in it. Well, now look here. You want to free your serfs, he went on to say. That is a very good thing, but not for you, for you never flogged any one or sent any one to Siberia, and still less advantageous for your peasants. If they are beaten and flogged and sent to Siberia, I imagine it does them no special harm. The peasant leads in Siberia that same cattle-like existence of his, and his scars heal over, and he is just as happy as he was before. But this would be a good thing for those who are morally perishing, who are preparing for themselves an old age of remorse, who try to stifle this remorse and become cruel and severe, for the reason that they have the power of punishing either justly or unjustly. That's why I pity anyone, and in such a case should desire the emancipation of the serfs. Perhaps you have never seen, but I have, how good men, educated in these traditions of unlimited power, as they grow old and irritable, grow cruel and harsh, and are aware of it, and cannot help themselves, and so become ever more and more unhappy. Prince Andrei said this with so much feeling, that Pierre could not avoid conjecturing, that these ideas of Prince Andrei's were suggested by his own father. He said nothing in reply. And this is what I lament over, human dignity, peace of mind, and purity, and not men's backs and heads, which, however much they be flogged and shaved, will still remain nothing but backs and heads still. No, no, a thousand times no, I never should agree with you, cried Pierre. End of chapter 11showing that he was now in the very happiest frame of mind. Pointing to the fields, he told him about his agricultural improvements. Pierre preserved a moody silence, replied in monosyllables, and seemed to be immersed in his thoughts. Pierre felt that Prince Andrei was unhappy, that he was deluding himself, 
that he was ignorant of the true light, and that it was his duty to come to his aid, to enlighten him and lift him up. But as soon as Pierre tried to think what and how he should speak, he was seized with the consciousness that Prince André, by a single word, by a single argument, might destroy everything in his teaching, and he was afraid to begin. He was afraid of exposing to the possibility of ridicule the beloved ark of his convictions. No, but why should you think so? suddenly began Pierre, lowering his head and taking the aspect of a bull about to charge. What makes you think so? You have no right to think so. To think how? asked Prince André in amazement. About life, about man's destination. It cannot be. I used to think exactly the same way. And do you know what saved me? Freemasonry. No, don't smile. Freemasonry is not a religious, a ceremonial sect, as I once supposed, but it is something much better. It is the one expression of the best, of the eternal in humanity. And Pierre began to expound Freemasonry to Prince André as he understood it. He declared that Freemasonry was the doctrine of Christianity freed from political and religious dogmatic bonds, the doctrine of equality, fraternity, and love. Our sacred brotherhood only has a practical conception of life. Everything else is visionary, said Pierre. You must comprehend, my dear fellow, that outside of this fraternity, everything is full of falsehood and deception, and I agree with you that for an intelligent and good man nothing is left except to live out his life as you do, merely striving not to interfere with anyone. But once adopt our fundamental principles, join our confraternity, come with us heart and soul, allow yourself to be guided, and you will immediately perceive, just as I did, that you are part of a tremendous, invisible chain, the beginning of which is hidden in heaven, said Pierre. Prince André, silently looking straight ahead, listened to Pierre's discourse. Several times, when owing to the rumble of the carriage he failed to catch a word, he asked Pierre to repeat it. Pierre could see by the unusual gleam in Prince André's eyes and by his silence that his words were not without effect, that Prince André would not throw ridicule on what he said. They reached a river where there was a freshet, and which had to be crossed by ferry. While they were arranging for the disposition of calash and horses, the two young men went down upon the ferry-boat. Prince André, leaning his elbows on the railing, looked in silence down along the brimming river, which gleamed under the rays of the setting sun. "'Well, what do you think about it?' asked Pierre. "'Why are you so silent?' "'What do I think? I have been listening to what you said, that's all,' said Prince André. "'You say, join our confraternity, and we will teach you the purpose of life and the object of man's existence, and the laws that govern the world. But who are we?' simply men. How do you know all that? Why is it that I am the only one who fails to see what you are privileged to see? You see a kingdom of goodness and truth on earth, but that is what I do not see. Pierre interrupted him. Do you believe in the future life? he asked. In the future life, repeated Prince André, but Pierre gave him no time to reply, and took for granted that this very repetition of his words was a denial, the more so because he had known of old Prince André's atheistical convictions. You say you cannot see the kingdom of goodness and truth on earth, and I do not see it, and it is impossible to see it if we look upon our life here as the end of all things. On the earth, especially on this earth here, Pierre pointed toward a field, there is no truth. It is all lies and evil. But in the universe, in the whole universe, is the kingdom of truth, and now we are the children of the earth, in eternity we are the children of the whole universe. Do I not feel in my own soul that I constitute a part of this mighty, harmonious whole? Do I not have the consciousness that in this enormous, innumerable collection of beings in which Godhead is manifest, supreme force, if you prefer the term, that I constitute one link, one step between the lower orders of creation and the higher ones? If I see, clearly see, this ladder which rises from the plant to man, then why should I suppose that it stops at me, and does not lead higher and ever higher? I know that just as nothing is ever annihilated in the universe, so I can never perish, but shall always exist, and always have existed. I know that besides myself spirits must exist above me, and that truth is in this universe. Yes, that is Herder's doctrine, said Prince André. But that is not enough to convince me, my dear. 
but life and death are what convince. You are convinced when you see a being who is dear to you, who is bound to you by sacred ties, toward whom you have done wrong, and have hoped to atone for the wrong. Prince Andrei's voice trembled, and he turned his head away. And suddenly this being suffers, is tormented, and ceases to be. Why is it? It cannot be that there is no answer, and I believe that there is one. That is what convinces a man. That is what has convinced me, said Prince Andrei. Yes, yes, exclaimed Pierre, and isn't that exactly what I said? No. I merely maintain that arguments do not convince one of the necessity of a future life, but this. When you go through life hand in hand with a companion, and suddenly that companion vanishes, there, into the nowhere, and you are left standing by this gulf and straining your eyes to look into it, and I have looked in. Well, then, you know that there is a there, and that there is a someone. There is the future life. The someone is God. Prince Andrei made no reply. The horses had been long harnessed again into the calash on the other bank, and the ferriage fees paid, and already the sun was half hidden, and the evening frost was beginning to skim over the pools by the ferry with crystal stars. And still Pierre and Andrei, to the amazement of the servants, the drivers, and the ferry hands, stood on the ferry boat talking. If there is a God and a future life, then truth must exist, then virtue must exist, and man's highest happiness consists in striving to attain them. We must live, we must love, we must believe, Pierre was saying. Believe not that we exist for a today on this lump of earth, but that we have lived and shall live for ever yonder in the whole, he pointed to the sky. Prince Andrei was standing with his elbows resting on the railing of the ferry boat and listening to Pierre, and without turning away his eyes he gazed at the red disk of the sun reflecting in the brimming river. Pierre came to a pause. It was perfectly still. The boat had long been moored, and only the ripples of the current glided by the bottom of the boat with a faint murmur. It seemed to Prince Andrei that this lapping of the waves corroborated Pierre's words and murmured, It is true, have faith in it. Prince Andrei smiled, and with a radiant, childlike, tender expression looked into Pierre's flushed and enthusiastic face, which, nevertheless, showed that shyness peculiar to him in the presence of a friend of superior attainments. Ah, yes, if it were only so, said he. But let us be starting, added Prince Andrei, and as he stepped off the boat he glanced at the sky, to which Pierre called his attention, and for the first time since Austerlitz he saw those lofty, eternal heavens which he had looked into as he lay on the battlefield, and something long dormant, something that was the better part of himself, suddenly awoke with new and joyful life in the soul. This feeling vanished as soon as Prince Andrei fell back again into the ordinary conditions of existence, but he knew that this feeling, though he was unable to develop it, still lived in him. His meeting with Pierre was for Prince Andrei an epoch with which to begin his new life, not indeed to outward sight, which remained unchanged, but in the inner world of his consciousness. End of chapter 12 Part 2, Chapter 13 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 13 It was already quite dark when Prince Andrei and Pierre drove up to the principal entrance of Luzogorsky Mansion. Just as they reached there, Prince Andrei, with a smile, called Pierre's attention to the hubbub at the rear doorsteps. An old woman, bending under the weight of a birch-bark sack, and a short man in black attire, with long hair, seeing the approach of the calash, started to run in through the back gates. Two women were hurrying after them, and all four, gazing in fright at the carriage, hurried up the back stairs. "'Those are some of Masha's men of God,' said Prince Andrei. "'They took us for my father, and this is the only thing in which she dares think of going against his wishes.' His orders are to drive these pilgrims out, but she likes to receive them. But who are these pilgrims? Men of God, as you call them. Prince Andrei had no time to reply to him. Servants came out to meet them, and he began to ask where the old prince was and how soon he was expected. 
the old prince was still at smolensk but was expected at any time prince andrei took pierre to his own chambers which were always kept in perfect order for his reception in his father's house and he himself went to the nursery let us go and find my sister said prince andrei rejoining pierre i have not seen her yet she is hidden away somewhere talking with her men of god it will make her very much confused but you shall see her men of god c'est curieux ma parole but who are these men of god asked pierre again you shall see for yourself it was a fact that the princess maria was confused and her face blushed in patches when they joined her in her cosy chamber with the tapers burning in front of the holy pictures on the divan behind the samovar by her side sat a young lad with a long nose and long hair and dressed in a monastic cassock in an armchair near by sat a wrinkled lean old woman with a sweet expression on her childlike face andre pourquoi n'a pas ma voix pour nous? why didn't you tell me she said with gentle reproach standing up in front of her pilgrims like a hen trying to protect her chicks charmed to see you i am delighted to see you said she to pierre still in french as he stooped to kiss her hand she had known him as a boy and now his friendship for andre his unhappiness with his wife and above all his good simple face quite won her heart she looked at him from her lovely lucid eyes and her expression seemed to say i like you very much but please do not make fun of my friends after they had exchanged the first greetings they sat down ah and here is the young ivanushka said prince andrei with a smile indicating the pilgrim lad andrei exclaimed the princess maria in a beseeching tone you must know that he is a woman said prince andrei to pierre andrei un nom de dieu exclaimed the princess maria it was evident that prince andrei's jesting behavior toward the pilgrims and the princess maria's unprofitable defense of them were matters of long standing between them but my dear girl said prince andrei you ought on the contrary to be very grateful to me for explaining to pierre your intimacy with this young man vraiment are you in earnest asked pierre with some curiosity and with perfect seriousness and for this the princess was especially grateful to him looking over his spectacles at ivanushka's face who perceiving that the talk was concerning him looked at all of them with cunning eyes it was entirely useless for the princess maria to be mortified on account of her friends they were not in the least abashed the old woman dropping her eyes though looking at the newcomers sideways out of the corners of them turned her cup bottom side up on the saucer placed next it the half gnawed lump of sugar and sat silent and motionless in her chair waiting to be asked to have another cup ivanushka drinking out of his saucer gazed at the young men from under his sly woman-like eyes where have you been to kiev asked prince andrei of the old woman yes replied the old woman laconically on christmas day i was deemed worthy to partake of the holy sacrament with the saints but just now i come from kolyazin father a great blessing has been vouchsafed there tell me has ivanushka been with you no i have been all by myself alone benefactor said ivanushka striving to make his voice bass it was only at yuknova the pelagayushka and i met pelagayushka interrupted her companion she was evidently anxious to tell what she had seen in kolyazin father a great blessing has been shown what was that new relics asked prince andrei come that'll do andrei said the princess maria don't you tell him pelagayushka ni nee. but why not mother why shouldn't i tell him i love him he is good he is one of god's elect he gave me ten roubles once he is my benefactor i remember it very well when i was in kiev kiryusha the foolish said to me he is truly a man of god he goes barefoot winter and summer what makes you wander round out of your own place says he to me says he go to kolyazin there is a wonder-working icon the holy mother of god has manifested herself there so i said good-bye to the saints and i went there no one interrupted the old woman alone in her monotonous voice spoke occasionally stopping to get her breath i went there my father and the people there said to me a great blessing has been vouchsafed to us holy oil has trickled down from the cheeks of the holy mother of god well 
that will do that will do you can tell the rest by and by said the princess maria blushing let me ask a question of her broke in pierre did you see it with your own eyes he asked indeed i did father i myself was deemed worthy such brightness in her face like light from heaven and from the virgin's cheeks it trickled and trickled but see here that was a fraud was pierre's naive comment after listening with all attention to her story ugh father what do you say exclaimed pelagayushka in a tone of horror turning to the princess maria for protection that's the way they deceive the people he reiterated oh our lord jesus christ exclaimed the old woman crossing herself ugh don't say such a thing father and that's the way a certain anarel she meant to say general was an unbeliever he used to say the priests deceive yes and he was took blind in consequence and he dreamed that the matushka petroskaya came to him and says believe in me and i will cure you and so he began to beg them take me oh take me to her and i tell you this as gospel truth i see it with my own eyes they took him stone blind as he was straight to her he fell on his knees and says to her heal me i will give thee says he what the czar gave me and father i myself seen the star on her just as he gave it to her and so he got back his sight it's a sin to speak so god will punish you said she admonishingly to pierre how did the star look in the holy picture asked pierre and did they promote the virgin to be a general asked prince andrei smiling pelagayushka suddenly turning pale clasped her hands oh father father what a sin and you with a son her face flushed again lord forgive him matushka what does this mean she asked turning to the princess maria she got up and almost weeping began to gather together her saddle-bag it was evident that it was both terrible and shameful for her to take advantage of benefactions in a house where such things could be said and yet she regretted that it was now necessary for her to deprive herself of them now what amusement can you find in this asked the princess maria why did you come to my room no pelagayushka i was only joking said pierre princess ma parole je n'ai pas voulu le offenser i didn't mean to hurt her feelings it was only my way don't have such an idea i was only joking he repeated smiling timidly and anxious to smooth over his offence you see i was only in fun and he was too the old pelagayusha paused in doubt but pierre's face showed such sincere repentance and prince andrei looked now at her and now at pierre with such a gentle expression that she gradually recovered her peace of mind End of chapter 13part two chapter fourteen of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne the pilgrim woman soon recovered confidence again and returning to her favorite theme gave a long account of father amphilochoi who was such a holy man in his life that his dear little hands smelt of incense and how her friends the monks during her last pilgrimage to kiev had given her the keys to the catacombs and how she taking only some little biscuits sukariki had spent forty-eight hours in them with the saints i pray before one i worship and then i go to another then i take a nap and go and kiss the other relics and oh matushka such peace such blessed comfort never did i want to come up into god's world again pierre listened to her with an attentive and serious expression prince andrei left the room and the princess maria leaving her god's people to finish drinking their tea invited pierre into the drawing-room you are very kind said she ugh truly i did not mean to offend her i appreciate and prize so dearly such feelings the princess maria looked at him without speaking and a gentle smile played over her lips i have known you a long time and i feel as though you were my own brother said she how do you find andrei she asked hastily not giving him time to respond to her affectionate words i feel very solicitous about him in the winter his health was better but this spring his wound opened again and the doctor said that he ought to go away and be treated 
I am very apprehensive about his mental condition. His nature is so different from us women, and he cannot ease his grief by a good fit of crying. He carries it in his heart. Today he is jolly and full of life, but that is caused by your visit. He is rarely so. If you could only persuade him to go abroad. He needs activity, and this quiet, monotonous life is killing him. Other people don't notice it, but I see it. At ten o'clock the servants rushed to the doorsteps, hearing the harness-bells of the old prince's carriage. Prince André and Pierre also hastened to meet him. "'Who is this?' asked the old prince, as he got out of the carriage and caught sight of Pierre. "'Ah, I am very glad. Kiss me,' he cried, as soon as he learned who the young stranger was. He was in excellent spirits, and treated Pierre in the most friendly way. Before supper, Prince André, returning to his father's cabinet, found him in a hot discussion with Pierre. Pierre argued that the time was coming when there would be no more war. The old prince, in a bantering, but not angry tone, maintained the opposite. Drain all the blood from men's veins, and pour in water instead, and then you will have an end of war. Old women's drivel! Old women's drivel! he exclaimed, but still he affectionately tapped Pierre on the shoulder as he went over to the table where Prince André had taken a seat, evidently not caring to enter the discussion, and was glancing over the papers which his father had brought from the city. The old prince went to him and began to talk with him about business. Count Rostov, the marshal, has not furnished half his quota, and when I got to town he actually conceived the notion of asking me to dinner. I gave him an answer that settled him. But just look at this. Well, brother, said Nikolai Andreyitch, addressing his son, but patting Pierre on the shoulder, your friend is a fine young man. I like him very much. He warms me up. Many another has clever things to say, but one doesn't care anything about hearing what he says. But this one succeeds in warming an old man like me all up. Well, go on. Go on, he added. Maybe I'll come and sit down to supper with you. I'd like another discussion. Make yourself agreeable to my little goose, the Princess Maria, he shouted after Pierre through the door. During this visit to Luisia Gure, Pierre, for the first time, appreciated the real strength and charm of his friendship with Prince André. This charm was manifested not so much by his relations with André himself as it was with all his relatives and the inmates of the house. Pierre felt that he was received on the footing of an old friend, both by the stern old prince and the sweet, shy Princess Maria, and yet neither of them had hitherto really known him. Both of them soon grew to be very fond of him. The Princess Maria, whose heart was won by his genial treatment of her pilgrim friends, looked at him from her big, lucid eyes, and even the little yearling Prince Nikolai, as his grandfather called him, smiled at Pierre and liked to go to him. Mikhail Ivanuitch and Mademoiselle Burlin looked at him and smiled pleasantly while he talked with the old prince. The old prince came down to supper. This was evidently on Pierre's account. During the two days of his visit at Luisia Gurie, he treated him in the most flattering way, and often bade him to come to his own room. After Pierre had gone, and all the members of the family met, they began to express their opinions of him, as is always the case after the departure of a new acquaintance, but, as is rarely the case, they all agreed in saying pleasant things of him. End of chapter 14「Part Two, Chapter Fifteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Fifteen. Rostov, on returning from his furlough, for the first time felt and realized how strong were the ties that bound him to Denisov and the rest of the regiment. When he went back to his regiment, he experienced a sensation analogous to that which came over him on his return to his home on the Pavarskaya, when he first saw the hussar of his regiment, with unbuttoned uniform, when he recognized the red-headed Dementiev, when he caught sight of the roan horses, picketed, when Lavrushka joyfully shouted to his baron, The Count has come! And the tattooed Denisov, who had been having a nap, came running out from his earth hut, and threw his arms around him, and the officers all came out to greet him. Rostov felt very much as he did when his mother and father and sister welcomed him home. Tears of joy filled his throat and choked his utterance. The regiment was also his home, and as sweet and dear to him as the home of his childhood. 
after reporting to the regimental commander and being assigned to his old squadron, after taking his turn as officer of the day and forage purveyor, after getting into the current of all the small interests of the regiment, and coming to a realizing sense that he was now deprived of his freedom and was confined to a narrow and rigid routine, Rostov felt the same sense of restlessness, the same moral support, and the same consciousness of being at home, in his proper place, as he had felt while under the paternal roof-tree. There was nothing more of that mad confusion of the outside world in which he found himself out of place and often engaged in questionable actions. There was no Sonya, with whom he ought or ought not to come to an explanation. There was no choice offered him of going somewhere or not going somewhere. There were no longer those twenty-four hours which had to be filled with so many varied occupations. There was an end to that innumerable throng of people whose presence or absence was a matter of indifference to him. There was an end to those obscure and indefinably pecuniary relations with his father, an end to his recollections of those terrible losses to Dolokhov. Here in the regiment all was open and simple. All the world was divided into two unequal divisions. One was our Pavlograd regiment, the other all the rest, and he had nothing whatever in common with this rest. In the regiment everything was known, who was lieutenant, who was captain, who was a good fellow, who was a rascal, and above all, who was his messmate. The sutler sold on credit, the pay was given quarterly, there was no necessity for thought or decision, provided only that one did nothing that was considered dishonorable in the Pavlograd regiment, but fulfill your duty, do what is commanded you in clear, explicit, and unmistakable language, and all will be well. Coming back again to these explicit conditions of army life, Rostov felt a sense of comfort and satisfaction analogous to that experienced by a weary man when he lies down to rest. To Rostov his army life was all the more agreeable during this campaign from the fact that after his losses from his gambling with Dolokhov, an action which he could not forgive, in spite of the forgiveness of his relatives, he made up his mind to serve not as formerly, but in such a way as to atone for his fault, to be scrupulously faithful, to prove himself a thoroughly admirable comrade and officer, in other words, a fine man. This might seem quite too hard were he in the world, but it was quite possible in the regiment. He had also determined, ever since the time of his gambling episode, to pay back his debt to his parents within five years. They sent him ten thousand roubles a year. Now he resolved to take only two, and to apply the remainder to the extinction of the debt. Our army, after repeated marches and countermarches, with skirmishes at Poltusk and at Precious Eilau, was concentrated in the vicinity of Bartenstein, where they were awaiting the arrival of the emperor and the beginning of a new campaign. The Pavlograd regiment, belonging to that division of the army which had taken part in the movements of the year 1805, had been recruited to its full quota in Russia, and had arrived too late for these first actions of the campaign. It had been neither at Poltusk nor at Prusish Eilau, and now, at the beginning of the second part of the campaign, having united with the acting army, it was detailed to serve under Platov. Platov's division was acting independently of the army. Several times the Pavlogradsui had to take part in skirmishes with the enemy, captured prisoners, and once even took Marshal Udenot's baggage. During the month of April, the Pavlogradsui were stationed for several weeks in the vicinity of an utterly dilapidated and deserted German village without stirring from the spot. It was thawing and cold. The rivers were beginning to break up. The roads were impassable, owing to the mud. For many days no provisions had been brought for horses or men. As it seemed an impossibility for transport trains to arrive, the men scattered out among the pillaged and deserted villages in search of potatoes, but even these were scarce. Everything had been devoured, and all the inhabitants had fled. Those who were left were worse than poverty-stricken. There was indeed nothing to take from them, and even the usually pitiless soldiery oftentimes let them keep the little that they had, instead of appropriating it for themselves. The Pavlograd regiment had lost only two men, wounded in engagements, but they had lost almost half their numbers from sickness and starvation. Death was so certain if they went into the hospitals that the soldiers suffering from fevers and swellings, caused by bad food, preferred to keep in the ranks, dragging themselves by sheer strength of will to the front, rather than take their chances in the hospitals. 
as spring opened they began to find a plant just showing above the ground it resembled asparagus and for some reason they called it mashka's sweetwort though it was very bitter they hunted for it all over the fields and meadows digging it up with their sabres and devouring it in spite of the injunction not to eat this injurious plant later a new disease broke out among the soldiers a swelling of the arms legs and face and the physicians attributed it to the use of this root but notwithstanding the prohibition the men of denisof's squadron eagerly ate mashka's sweetwort because for a fortnight they had been trying to subsist on the few remaining biscuits half-pound rations being dealt out to each man while the last consignment of potatoes had proved to be rotten and sprouted the horses also had been subsisting for a fortnight on thatching straw taken from the roofs and had become shockingly emaciated and even before the winter was over covered with tufts of uneven hair yet in spite of this terrible destitution officers and men lived just the same as usual just as always though with pale and swollen faces and in ragged uniforms the hussars attended to their duties went after forage and other things groomed their horses cleaned their arms tore the thatch from roofs to serve as fodder and gathered around the kettles for their meals from which they got up still hungry while they joked over their wretched fare and hunger and just as usual during the hours when they were off duty the soldiers built big fires stripped and stood around them steaming themselves smoked their pipes sorted and baked their rotten sprouting potatoes and told stories about the campaigns of Potemkin and Suvorov, or legends of Alyosha the Cunning, or of Mikolka Popovich the Journeyman. The officers also, as usual, lived in couples or in threes, in unroofed and half-ruined houses. The older ones looked after the procuring of straw and potatoes, and other means of victualling the men. The younger ones were occupied as usual, some with card-playing, money was plentiful if provisions were not, some with innocent games, Sviaka, a kind of ring toss, and quoits or skittles. Little was said about matters in general, partly because nothing positive was known, partly because there was a general impression that the war was going badly. Rostov lived just as before with Denisov, and the friendship that united them was closer than ever since their furlough. Denisov never spoke of Rostov's family, but by the affectionate friendship manifested by the commander for his subordinate officer, Rostov felt assured that the old hussar's unfortunate love for Natasha was an additional factor in the strength of his affection. Denisov evidently tried to send Rostov as rarely as possible on dangerous expeditions, and to shield him, and after a skirmish or anything of the sort, displayed intense delight to find him safe and sound. On one of his expeditions, Rostov found an old Pole and his daughter, with an infant at the breast, in a deserted, ruined village, where he had gone in search of provisions. They were almost naked and starving, and had no means of getting away. Rostov brought them to his lodgings, installed them in his own rooms, and kept them for several weeks, until the old man got well. One of Rostov's comrades, while talking about women, began to make sport of Rostov, declaring that he was the slyest of them all, and that it was no wonder that he did not care to introduce his comrades to the pretty little Pole whom he had rescued. Rostov took the jest as an insult, and losing his temper, said such disagreeable things to the officer that Denisov had great difficulty in preventing a duel. When the officer had gone, and Denisov, who knew nothing about what relationship Rostov bore toward the Pole, began to upbraid him for his temper, Rostov said, Well, maybe you are right. She is like a sister to me, and I cannot describe how this thing offended me, because... Well, because... Denisov gave him a rap on the shoulder and began swiftly to march up and down the room, not looking at his friend. This was a habit of his at moments of mental excitement. "'What a deucedly fine weed all these Wostovs are!' he exclaimed, and Rostov noticed tears in his eyes. End of chapter 15「Part two, chapter sixteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter sixteen. In the month of April, the troops were cheered by word that the sovereign was coming to the army. Rostov did not have the privilege of taking part in the review made by the emperor at Bartenstein, for it happened that the Pavlogratsui were stationed at the advance posts, a considerable distance in front of Bartenstein. They were established in Buviaks. Denisov and Rostov lived in an earth hut excavated for them by their soldiers and covered with boughs and turf. 
This earth hut was constructed as follows, according to a plan much in vogue at that time. A trench three feet and a half wide, a little less than five deep, and about eight long was dug. At one end steps were constructed, and this formed the entry, the grand staircase. The trench itself constituted the abode, in which those who were fortunate, as, for instance, the squadron commander, had a board set on posts on the side opposite the entrance. This served as the table. On each side along the trench the earth was hollowed away to half its depth, making a bed and divan. The roof was so constructed that in the middle it was possible to stand erect under it, and one could sit up on the beds by leaning over toward the table. Denisov, who lived luxuriously, because the men of his squadron were fond of him, had an extra board on the pediment of the roof, and in this board was a pane of glass, broken to be sure, but mended with glue. When it was very cold, coals from the soldiers' fires were brought on a piece of bent sheet iron, and set on steps in the reception room, as Denisov called this part of the hovel, and this made it so warm that the officers, who used to come in great numbers to visit Denisov and Rostov, could sit there in their shirt sleeves. In April, Rostov happened to be on duty. One morning about eight o'clock, returning home after a sleepless night, he ordered some coals to be brought, changed his linen, which had been wet through by the rain, went through his devotions, drank his tea, got thoroughly warmed, put his belongings into order in his own corner and on the table, and, with his face flushed by the wind and the fire, threw himself down on his back, in his shirt sleeves, with his arms for a pillow. He was indulging in pleasant anticipations of the promotion which was likely to follow his last reconnoitring expedition, and was waiting for the return of Denisov, who had gone off somewhere. Rostov was anxious to have a talk with him. Suddenly, behind the hut, he heard Denisov's high-pitched voice. He had evidently returned in a bad humor. Rostov went to the window to look out and see whom he was berating. He recognized the quartermaster, Topchenko. I have given you special orders not to let them eat that woot, mashko, what you call it, cried Denisov, and here I've seen it with my own eyes. Laskarchek was bringing some in from the field. I have given the order, your high nobility, but they won't listen to it, replied the quartermaster. Rostov again lay down on his bed and said to himself with a feeling of content, Let him kick up a row and make as much fuss as he pleases. I've done my work, and now I'll lie down. It's first class. He heard Lavrushka, Denisov's shrewd and rascally valet, join his voice to the conversation going on outside the hut. Lavrushka had something to tell about ox carts laden with biscuits, which he had seen as he was going after provisions. Denisov's sharp voice was again heard behind the hut and his command, Second platoon, to saddle. What can be up? wondered Rostov. Five minutes later Denisov came into the hut, climbed up with his muddy boots on his bed, lighted his pipe in grim silence, tossed over all his belongings, got out his whip and sabre, and started from the hut. In reply to Rostov's question, whither away, he gruffly and carelessly replied that he had something to attend to. "'May God and the Sovereign be my judges!' he exclaimed, as he went out, and then Rostov heard the hoofs of several horses splashing through the mud. Rostov did not take any pains to inquire where Denisov had gone. Warm and comfortable in his corner, he soon fell asleep, and it was late in the afternoon when he left the hut. Denisov had not yet returned. The weather had cleared up bright and beautiful. Near a neighboring hut, two officers and a yunker were playing Svika, merrily laughing as they drove the redki, or mumble-pegs, into the loose, muddy ground. Rostov joined them. In the midst of the game, the officers saw a train approaching them. Fifteen hussars on emaciated horses followed the wagons. The teams conveyed by the hussars, approached the picketing station, and a throng of hussars gathered round them. "'There, now, Denisov has been mourning all the time,' said Rostov, "'and here are provisions after all.' "'See there,' cried the officers, "'won't the men be happy?' A short distance behind the hussars rode Denisov, accompanied by two infantry officers, with whom he was engaged in a heated discussion. Rostov started down to meet him. "'I was ahead of you, Captain,' declared one of the officers, a lean little man, evidently beside himself with passion. "'See here, I have told you that I would not return em, replied Denisov. "'You shall answer for it, Captain. This is violence, to rob an escort of their wagons. Our men have not had anything to eat for two days.' "'And mine have not had anything to eat for two weeks,' replied Denisov. "'This is highway robbery. 
"'You'll answer for it, my dear sir,' replied the infantry officer, raising his voice. "'What are you bothering me for? "'Hey?' screamed Denisov, suddenly losing his temper. "'I am the one who is responsible, and not you. "'What is the object of all your buzzing here? "'Forward, marsh!' he cried to the officers. "'Very good,' screamed the little officer, not quailing and not budging. "'If you insist on pillage, then I—' "'Take yourself off to the devil. Get out of here.' and Denisov rode his horse straight at the officer. "'Very good, very good,' reiterated the officer, with an oath, and turning his horse, he rode off at a gallop, bouncing in his saddle. "'A dog on a fence, a wheel dog on a fence,' shouted Denisov, as he rode away. This was the most insulting remark that a cavalryman could make to a mounted infantryman. Then, as he joined Rostov, he burst out in a loud laugh. "'I rescued him from the infantry. I carried off their transport by main force, said he. What, do they think I would let my men perish of starvation? The wagons which had been brought to the hussars were consigned to an infantry regiment, but Denisov, learning through Lavrushka that the transport was proceeding alone, had ridden off with his hussars and intercepted it. The soldiers had as many biscuits as they wished, and even enough to share with other squadrons. The next day the regimental commander summoned Denisov, and covering his eyes with his spread fingers, he said, This is the way I look at it. I know nothing about it, and I have nothing to do with it. But I advise you to go in Stanter to headquarters and report this affair to the commissary department, and if possible give a receipt for so many provisions received. Unless you do, the requisition will be put down to the infantry, the matter will be investigated, and may end badly." Denisov went straight from the regimental commanders to the headquarters with a sincere intention of adopting his advice. In the evening he returned to his hut, in a condition such as Rostov had never seen his friend before. He could hardly speak or breathe. When Rostov asked him what the matter was, he only broke out in incoherent oaths and threats, in a weak and husky voice. Alarmed at Denisov's condition, Rostov advised him to undress, drink some cold water, and send for a physician. They are going to twy me for wabui. Oh, give me a drink of water. Let them twy me. I will beat the waskals every time. And I'll tell the emperor. Give me some ice, he added. The regimental surgeon came in and said that it was absolutely necessary to take some blood from him. He filled a soup plate with dark blood from Denisov's hairy arm, and then only was he in a condition to tell all that had taken place. I get there, said Denisov, telling his story. Where is your head man here? they show me. Can't you wait? I have pressing business. Come thirty verse. Impossible to wait. Let me see him. Very good. Out comes the robbery in chief, and he, too, undertakes to lecture me. This is highway robbery. A man, says I, is not a wobber who takes provisions to feed his soldiers, but one who fills his own pockets. Will you please keep quiet? Very good. Sign a receipt at the commissioners, says he, and your affair will take its due course. I go to the commissioners. I go in, and there at the table, who do you suppose? No. Guess. Who has been starving us? screamed Denisov, gesticulating his wounded arm and pounding the table with his fist so violently that the board almost split and the glasses on it jumped up. Tell you, Nin. So it's you, is it, who's been starving us? Once before you had your snout slapped for you, and got off cheap at that. Ha! Ah, what a... what a... And I began to give it to him. I enjoyed it, I can tell you, cried Denisov, angrily, and yet gleefully showing his white teeth under his black moustache. I should have killed him if they had not separated us. Here, here, what are you shouting so for? Calm yourself, said Rostov. You've set your arm bleeding again. Wait, it must be bandaged. They bandaged Denisov's arm and got him off to bed. The following day he woke jolly and calm. But at noon the adjutant of the regiment, with a grave and regretful face, came into Rostov and Denisov's earth hut, and with real distress served upon Major Denisov a formal document from the regimental commander, who had been called to account for the proceeding of the day before. The adjutant informed them that the affair was likely to assume a very serious aspect, that a court-martial commission had been convened, and that on account of the severity with which just at that time rapine and lawlessness were treated, he might consider himself fortunate if the affair ended with a mere degradation. Those who felt themselves aggrieved represented the affair as in somewhat this way, that after the pillage of the transport, Major Denisov, without any provocation and apparently drunk, 
had made his appearance before the commissary, called him a thief, threatened to thrash him, and when he was dragged away, he had rushed into the office, struck two shivovniks, and sprained the arm of one of them. Denisov, in reply to a fresh series of questions from Rostov, laughed, and said that he thought someone else had been there in that condition, but that all this story was rubbish, fiddle-faddle, that he was not afraid of any court-martials, and that if these villains dared to pick a quarrel with him, he would answer them in a way that they would not soon forget. Denisov spoke with affected indifference about all the affair, but Rostov knew him too well not to perceive that at heart, though he hid it from the rest, he was afraid of a court-martial, and was really troubled by this affair, which evidently might have sad consequences. Every day, inquiries, summonses, and other documents kept coming to him, and on the first of May he was required to turn over his command to his next in seniority, and appear at headquarters of the divisions to make his defense in the matter of pillaging the provision train. On the evening preceding the day of the trial, Platov made a reconnaissance of the enemy with two regiments of Cossacks and two squadrons of hussars. Denisov, as usual, went out beyond the lines in order to make an exhibition of his gallantry. A bullet sent from a French musket struck him in the fleshy upper portion of his leg. Most likely Denisov, in ordinary circumstances, would not have left the regiment for such a trifling wound, but now he profited by this occurrence, gave up his command of the division, and went to the hospital. End of chapter 16Part two, chapter seventeen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter seventeen. In the month of June occurred the Battle of Friedland, in which the Pavlogradsui took no part, and this was followed immediately by an armistice. Rostov grievously missed his friend, and as he had not had any news of him since he left the regiment, and was doubly uneasy about his trial and the result of his wound. He took advantage of the armistice and went to the hospital to make inquiries about Denisov. The hospital was established in a small Prussian village, which had twice been sacked by the Russian and French armies. For the very reason that it was summer, when everything in nature was beautiful, this village, with its ruined roof trees and fences and its filthy streets, its ragged inhabitants, and the invalid and drunken soldiers wandering about, presented an especially gloomy appearance. The hospital had been established in a stone mansion with many broken panes and window frames, and situated in a yard with the remains of a ruined fence. A number of pale-looking soldiers, bandaged and swollen, were walking up and down, or sitting in the sun in the yard. As soon as Rostov entered the house, he was enveloped by the odor of putrefaction and disease. On the doorstep, staircase, he met the Russian military surgeon with a cigar in his mouth. The surgeon was followed by a Russian feldsher or assistant. I can't be everywhere at once, the doctor was saying. Come this evening to Maker Alexievich's. I'll be there. The feldsher asked him some question. Eh, do as well as you know how. It doesn't make any difference, does it? The doctor caught sight of Rostov mounting the stairs. What are you doing here, your nobility? asked the doctor. What are you doing here? Because a bullet hasn't touched you, do you want to be carried off by typhus? This is the house of leprosy. What do you mean? asked Rostov. Typhus, Batyushka. It's death for whoever comes here. Makiev, he pointed to his assistant. Makiev and I are the only two left to wriggle. Five of our brother doctors have died already. When a new man comes, it's all up with him in a week, said the doctor, with apparent satisfaction. The Prussian doctors were invited, but our allies did not like it at all. Rostov explained his anxiety to find Major Denisov of the Hussars. I don't know. I don't remember him. You can imagine. I have charge of three hospitals. Four hundred sick is too many. It's a very good thing for benevolent Prussian ladies to send us coffee and lint at the rate of two pounds a month. If they didn't, we should be utterly lost. He laughed. Four hundred. And they send me all the new cases. There are four hundred, aren't there? Hey? He asked at the Feldsher. His assistant looked annoyed. It was evident that he was impatient for the too loquacious doctor to make haste and take his departure. Major Denisov, repeated Mostov. He was wounded at Moliton. I think he's dead. How is it, Mikiev? asked the doctor in an indifferent tone to the feldsher. The assistant simply repeated the doctor's words. Tell me, was he a tall, reddish man? asked the doctor. Rostov described Denisov's appearance. Yes, there was, 
There certainly was such a person, exclaimed the doctor, seeming to show a gleam of satisfaction. But that person, I'm sure, must have died. However, I'll make inquiries. I have the lists. You have them, Mikiev, haven't you? The lists are at Maker Alexievich's, replied the feldsher. But you might inquire in the officer's ward. There you will find out for yourself, he added, turning to Rostov. Ech, you better not go, said the surgeon. You wouldn't like to be kept there. Rostov, however, took leave of the surgeon, and begged the feldsher to show him the way. "'Don't you lay blame on me,' shouted the doctor, up from the bottom of the stairs. Rostov and the feldsher went along the corridor. The hospital odor was so powerful in this dark corridor that Rostov took hold of his nose and was obliged to pause to collect his strength before he could go farther. At the right, a door opened and a thin, sallow-looking man on crutches, barefooted and in his shirt-sleeves, appeared. As he crossed the lintel, he gazed with gleaming, envious eyes at the approaching man. Glancing through the door, Rostov saw that the sick and wounded were lying in the room over the floor, on straw and on their cloaks. "'May I go in and look?' he asked. "'What is there to see?' replied the officer. But for the very reason that the felcher was evidently reluctant to have him go in, Rostov was determined to investigate the soldier's ward. The effluvium, which he had already smelt in the corridor, was still stronger here, it had also changed somewhat in character. It was sharper, more penetrating. One could be certain that it was the very place where it originated. In a long room, brilliantly illuminated by the sun, which poured in through the high windows, lay the sick and wounded in two rows, with their heads to the walls, leaving a passageway between their feet. The most of them were asleep or unconscious, and paid no attention to the visitors. Those who had their senses either lifted themselves up or raised their thin yellow faces, and all, without exception, gazed at Rostov with one and the same expression of hope that help had come, of reproach and envy at seeing another so strong and well. Rostov went into the middle of the ward, glanced through the half-open doors into the adjoining rooms, and on both sides saw the same spectacle. He paused and silently looked around him. He had never expected to see such a thing. In front of him, almost across the narrow passageway, lay, on the bare floor, a sick man, apparently a Cossack, as his hair was cropped, leaving a tuft. This Cossack lay on his back, with his huge legs and arms sprawled out. His face was livid purple. His eyes were rolled up so that only the whites could be seen, and the veins in his bare legs and arms, which were still red, stood out like cords. He was thumping his head on the floor and hoarsely muttering some word which he repeated over and over again. Rostov listened to what he was saying, and at last made out what the word was. This word was water, water, water. Rostov looked around in search of someone to put the man in his place and give him a drink. Who looks after the sick here? he asked of the feldsher. Just at that moment a train soldier, detailed to act as nurse, came along and, scraping, made a low bow before Rostov. I wish you good morning, your high nobility, cried the soldier rolling his eyes on Rostov and evidently mistaking him for some important official. "'Lift him up. Give him water,' said Rostov, pointing to the Cossack. "'I will, your high nobility,' said the soldier, with alacrity, rolling his eyes round still more attentively and craning his neck, but still not stirring from the spot. "'No, there's nothing I can do here,' thought Rostov, dropping his eyes. He was about to go on, but felt the consciousness that an entreating glance was fixed upon him from the right and he turned around to see. Almost in the very corner of the room, an old soldier was sitting on a cloak. He had a thin, stern face, as yellow as a skeleton, and a rough, gray beard. He looked entreatingly at Rostov. A neighbor of the old soldier on one side seemed to be whispering something to him, and pointed to Rostov. Rostov realized that the old man was determined to ask him some favor. He went near, and perceived that one leg was affected with gangrene, and that the other had been amputated above the knee. Another neighbor of the old man's lay motionless at some little distance from him, with his head thrown back. This was a young soldier, whose snub-nosed face, still covered with freckles, was as white as wax, the eyes rolled up under his lids. Rostov looked at the snub-nosed soldier, and a cold chill ran down his back. But this one, it seems to me, is— he began turning to the feldsher. We have already begged and prayed, your nobility, said the old soldier, with his lower jaw trembling. It was all over this morning. Why, we are men and not dogs. I will see to it immediately. He shall be removed. He shall be removed, 
hurriedly said the felcher. "'I beg of you, your nobility.' "'Come on, come on,' replied Rostov, also hurriedly, and dropping his eyes, and shrinking altogether, trying to pass unobserved under the gauntlet of those reproachful and envious eyes fixed upon him, he left the room. End of chapter 17「ト Chapter 18 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by Marianne Chapter 18 Passing along the corridor, the Feldsher led Rostov into the officer's ward, which consisted of three rooms, communicating by opened doors. There were beds in these rooms, the sick and wounded officers were lying and sitting on them, some in dressing gowns were pacing up and down the rooms, the first person whom Rostov met in the officer's ward was a little slim man, without an arm, and wearing a cap and dressing-gown, who was walking up and down the first room with a pipe in his mouth. Rostov, on catching sight of him, racked his brains to remember where he had seen him. "'What a place for God to bring us together again!' exclaimed the little man. "'I am Tushin. Tushin, don't you remember? I brought you back safe at Schrungreben. Well, they have lopped off a little morsel. See here,' said he smiling and pointing to the empty sleeve of his kalat. "'And you are hunting for Vasily Dmitrievich Denisov. He's one of our chums,' he said, on learning what Rostov wanted. "'Here, here!' And Tushin drew him into the second room, where several men were heard laughing loudly. "'I declare, how can they think of living here, much less of laughing?' wondered Rostov, with the odour of the dead body which he had seen in the soldier's ward still in his nostrils and still seeing those envious glances fixed upon him and following him, and the face of that young soldier with the upturned eyes. Denisov, with his head buried under the bedclothes, was sound asleep on his bed, although it was noon. "'What? Wostov? How are you? How are you?' he cried, in exactly the same voice as when he was with the regiment, but Rostov observed with pain that hidden under this show of ease and vivacity, there was a shadow of a new and disagreeable asperity in Denisov's expression, and in his words and tones. His wound, in spite of its insignificance, was still unhealed, though six weeks had passed since the skirmish. His face also had the same pallor and look of puffiness which characterized all the inmates of the hospital. But it was not this that so especially struck Rostov. He was amazed by the fact that Denisov did not seem to be glad to see him, and smiled unnaturally. Denisov did not once inquire about the regiment or about the general course of affairs. When Rostov spoke of these things, Denisov did not even listen. Rostov noticed that it was even distasteful to Denisov to be reminded of the regiment, and in general of that larger and freer existence going on outside of the hospital. It seemed as though he were trying to forget his former life, and the only thing that interested him was his quarrel with the commissary, Shinovnik. In reply to Rostov's question how the affair was going, he immediately pulled out from under his pillow a document which he had received from the commission, and the rough draft of his own reply to it. He brightened up as he began to read his document, and he called Rostov's attention to the keen things which he said against his enemies in his reply. Denisov's acquaintances of the hospital, who had crowded around Rostov as a person from the outside world, gradually scattered as soon as Denisov began to read his paper. By their faces Rostov perceived that all these gentlemen had more than once heard the whole story and were heartily sick of it. Only one, his neighbor of the next bed, a stout Ulan, still kept his seat on his hammock, frowning gloomily and smoking his pipe, and the little armless Tushin continued to listen, though he shook his head disapprovingly. In the midst of the reading, the Ulan interrupted Denisov. "'Now, it's my opinion,' said he, turning to Rostov, that the only thing to do is simply to petition the sovereign for pardon. They say now there are going to be great rewards, and a mere matter of a pardon. "'I petition the sovereign,' exclaimed Denisov, in a voice in which he tried hard to maintain his old-time energy and vehemence, but which sounded helplessly feeble. "'What for? If I had been a highway wobber, I might petition for pardon. But here I am court-martialed, because I carry these wobbers through clean water, as the saying is. Let him twy me, I am not afraid of him. I have served my Tsar honorably, and my country, and I have not been a thief, and they degrade me, and— See here, listen to what I write em in a straightforward language. This is what I write. If I had been an embezzler. 
It's cleverly written, no question about that, said Tushin. But that is not the point, Vasily Dmitritch. He turned also to Rostov. He must give in, and this is what Vasily Dmitritch will not hear to doing. Now there, the auditor himself told you that it was a bad business. Let it be a bad business, then, exclaimed Denisov. And the auditor wrote a petition for you, continued Tushin, and you had better sign it and give it to him. He, meaning Rostov, has influence at headquarters. You won't find a better chance. Yes, but I haven't told you that I won't stop to quinge, interrupted Denisov, and once more he set out to finish his document. Rostov did not dare to argue with Denisov, although he felt instinctively that the course indicated by Tushin and the other officers was the one advisable, and although he should have counted himself happy to find a chance to render Denisov a service, he knew Denisov's unbending will and the righteousness of his wrath. When Denisov had finished reading his venomous diatribe, which had consumed more than an hour, Rostov had nothing to say, and he spent the rest of the day in the society of Denisov's companions, who had gathered around him again, talking. He told them all the news, and listened to the tales of the others. Denisov preserved a moody silence all the afternoon. Late in the afternoon Rostov got up to go, and asked Denisov if there was nothing that he could do for him. Yes, wait, said Denisov, glancing at the officers, and, pulling some papers, out from under his pillow, he went to the window, where he stood an inkstand, and began to write. "'You can't split an axe-head with a whip,' said he, as he came away from the window, and gave Rostov a large envelope. This was the petition to the emperor which the auditor had written for him. In it nothing was said whatever about the faults of the commissary department, but he simply craved pardon. "'Hand it in. It's evident.' He did not finish his sentence, and smiled a painfully unnatural smile." End of chapter 18。ちゃんと言いなさい。ちゃんと言いなさい。ちゃんと言いなさい。ちゃんと言いなさい。ちゃんと言いなさい。ちゃんと言いなさい。ちゃんと言いなさい。ちゃんと言いなさい。ちゃんと言いなさい。ちゃんと言いなさい。ちゃんと言いなさい。ちゃんと言いなさい。ちゃんと言いなさい。ちゃんと言いなさい。ちゃんと言いなさい。On the 25th of June, the French and Russian emperors had met at Tilsit. Boris Dubretskoy begged the distinguished individual to whose staff he was attached for permission to be present at the conference which was to be held at Tilsit. Je veux de voir le grand homme. I want to see him with my own eyes, he said, speaking of Napoleon, whom he, like everyone else, had always hitherto called Bonaparte. You mean Bonaparte? asked the general with a smile. Boris looked inquiringly at his general, and immediately perceived that the general was trying to quiz him. Mon prince, je parle de l'empereur Napoleon, he replied. The general, with a smile, tapped him on the shoulder. You'll get on, said he, and he took him with him. Boris was one of the few who were there at Niemen on the day when the emperors met. He saw the rafts with the monograms, he saw Napoleon ride down the bank past the French guards, he saw the Emperor Alexander's thoughtful face as he sat in silence in the inn on the bank of the river, waiting for Napoleon to come. He saw the two emperors get into the boats, and Napoleon, who was the first to reach the raft, go forward with swift steps to meet Alexander, give him his hand, and then disappear with him under the pavilion. Ever since his entry into the highest circles, Boris had conceived the habit of carefully observing whatever was going on around him and recording it. During the time of the interview at Tilsit, he inquired the names of the personages who came with Napoleon, remarked the uniforms which they had on, and listened with great attention to the words spoken by all the men of importance. At the moment that the emperors went into the pavilion, he looked at his watch, and he did not fail to look at it again at the moment when Alexander came forth from the pavilion. The interview lasted an hour and fifty-three minutes. This fact he wrote down that very same evening, together with many others which he felt had historical significance. Thus, the emperor's suite being very small, the fact of being present at Tilsit at the time of the interview was, for a man who prized success in the service, fraught with deep meaning, and Boris, who enjoyed this privilege, felt that his position was henceforth secured. He was not only known by name, but was looked upon as indispensable, and expected to be seen around. Twice he was sent on errands to the emperor himself, so that the sovereign came to know his face, and the inner circle not only ceased to shun him as a new person, as before, 
but would have been surprised at his absence. Boris lodged with another adjutant, the Polish Count Zielinski. Zielinski, though a Polyak, had been educated in Paris, was rich, was passionately fond of the French, and almost every day, during the time of the interview at Tilsit, he and Boris used to have the officers of the guards and members of the Imperial French staff to breakfast and dine with them. On the evening of the 6th of July, Count Zielinski, Boris's chum, was giving a dinner to some of his French acquaintances. At this dinner the guest of honor was one of Napoleon's aides. There were a number of the officers of the Imperial Guards, and a young lad belonging to an old aristocratic family who was Napoleon's page. That same day Rostov, profiting by the darkness to pass unrecognized, proceeded to Tilsit in civil dress, and went to the apartment occupied by Zelinsky and Boris. Rostov, in common with the whole army from which he came, were as yet far from experiencing that change which had taken place at headquarters, and in Boris, in regard to Napoleon and the French, to look upon them as friends instead of foes. As yet, all connected with the army still continued to experience their former derisive feeling of ill-will, scorn, and fear of Bonaparte and the French. Only a short time before, Rostov, in talking with a Cossack officer of Platov's division, had contended that if Napoleon had been taken prisoner, he would have been treated not as a sovereign, but as a criminal. Even more recently, falling in with a French colonel, who had been wounded, Rostov had become heated in trying to prove that there could be no peace between a lawful sovereign and a criminal like Bonaparte. It struck Rostov strangely, therefore, to see in Boris's rooms French officers in the very same uniforms which he had been in the habit of viewing in an utterly different light across from the skirmishers' lines. The moment he saw a French officer looking out of the door, that feeling of war, of hostility, which he always experienced at the sight of the foe, suddenly took possession of him. He paused at the threshold and asked in Russian if Dubretskoy lived there. Boris heard the unwanted voice in the entry and came out to meet him. At the first moment, on recognizing Rostov, a shade of annoyance crossed his face. "'Ah, is it you? Very glad, very glad to see you,' said he nevertheless, and coming towards him with a smile. But Rostov had noticed his first impression. "'It seems I have come at the wrong time,' said he. "'I should not have come, but I had business,' said he, coldly. "'No, I was only surprised that you had got away from your regiment.' "'Dans un moment, Jésus et vous,' he shouted, in reply to someone calling him from within. "'I see that my visit is untimely,' repeated Rostov. The expression of annoyance had entirely disappeared by this time from Boris's face. Apparently having considered and made up his mind what course to pursue, he seized his visitor by both hands, with remarkable ease of manner, and drew him into the adjoining room. Boris's eyes, fixed calmly and confidently on Rostov, were, as it were, shielded by something, as though there were a screen, the blue spectacles of high society, placed in front of them. So it seemed to Rostov. Ach! "'Please say no more about being come inopportunely,' said Boris. He drew him into the room, where the table was set for dinner, introduced him to the guests, calling him by name, and explaining that he was not a civilian, but an officer in the Hussars, and an old friend of his. Count Zelinsky, le comte N. N., le capitaine S. S., said he, naming the guests. Rostov scowled at the Frenchman, bowed stiffly, and said nothing. Zelinsky was evidently displeased at the intrusion of this new Russian individual into his circle, and had nothing to say to Rostov. Boris, affecting not to notice the awkwardness produced by the introduction of the newcomer, and still displaying the same easy grace and impenetrable look in his eyes with which he had received Rostov, tried to enliven the conversation. One of the Frenchmen turned, with characteristic Gallic politeness, to the stubbornly silent Rostov, and remarked that he supposed he had come to Tislet to see the Emperor. "'No, I came on business,' replied Rostov, laconically. Rostov's ill-humour had come on immediately at noticing the annoyance expressed in Boris's face, and, as usual happens with people who are out of sorts, he imagined that all were looking at him with unfriendly eyes, and that he was in their way. And, in truth, he was in their way, for he took no part in the conversation that was just beginning.' And why is he sitting there? The glances that were fixed on him seemed to say. He got up and went to Boris. I know I am a constraint to you, he said in a whisper. Come, let me tell you about my business, and I will be going. No, not in the least, replied Boris. But if you are tired, let us go into my room, and you can lie down and rest. 
Well, really. They went into Boris's little sleeping room. Rostov, without sitting down, began in a pettish tone, as though Boris were in some way to blame for the matter, to tell him about Denisov's affair, and ask him if he could and would send in the petition for Denisov, through the general on whose staff he was serving, and see to it that Denisov's letter reached the emperor. When the two were alone together, Rostov, for the first time, found it awkward to look into Boris's eyes. Boris, sitting with his legs crossed, and pressing the slender fingers of his right hand into his left, listened to Rostov in the same way as a general listens to a report from his subordinate. Sometimes he glanced around, and then again looked into Rostov's face with that peculiar veil of impenetrability over his eyes. Rostov felt awkward every time he did so, and he looked down. I have heard of things like that, and I know that the sovereign is very strict in such cases. I think it would be best not to bring it to his majesty's attention. In my opinion, it would be better to give the petition directly to the commander of the corps, and, as a general thing, I think... Then you don't care to do anything. Why not say it right out? Rostov almost shouted, not looking at Boris's eyes. Boris smiled. On the contrary, I will do all that is in my power, but I thought... At this moment, Zelinsky's voice was heard, calling Boris back. Well, go, 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 said Rostov, excusing himself from the supper and remaining alone in the little chamber. He paced for a long time up and down and listened to the lively French conversation in the adjoining room. End of chapter 19Part 2, Chapter 20 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 20 No day could have been more unfavorable for presenting Denisov's petition to the Emperor than that on which Rostov went to Tilsit. He himself could not appear in the presence of the general in charge for the reason that he was in civilian's dress and had come away without leave of absence, and Boris, even if he had the best will in the world, could not do this on the day that followed Rostov's arrival at Tilsit. On that day, the ninth of July, the preliminary articles of peace were signed, the emperors exchanged orders, Alexander received that of the Legion of Honor, and Napoleon that of St. Andrew of the First Degree, and on that same day a dinner was to be given to the Preobaskensky Battalion by the Battalion of the French Guards. The emperors had both agreed to be present at this banquet. Rostov felt so ill at ease and so offended with Boris that, when, after the supper was over, Boris came back to talk with him, he pretended to be asleep, and on the next day he left the house early in the morning, taking especial pains not to see him. Nikolai, in his civilian's hat and cloak, wandered about the city, gazing at the French and their uniforms, studying the streets and residences where the French and Russian emperors were lodged. On the square he saw tables laid out, and men making preparations for the banquet, Along the streets he beheld draperies with the Russian and French colors entwined, and the letters A and N in monogram. In the windows of the houses there were also flags and monograms. Boris isn't willing to help me, and I won't have anything more to do with him. That's a settled thing, thought Nikolai. It's all over between us. But I won't leave town until I have done the best I can for Denisov, and at least handed his petition to the sovereign. To the sovereign? He is there, said Rostov to himself, involuntarily attracted back to the mansion occupied by Alexander. In front of the door stood saddle-horses, and the suite were assembling, evidently for the purpose of escorting His Majesty on a ride. At any moment I may see him, said Rostov to himself, if I could only put the letter straight into his hands. But wouldn't they arrest me, on account of being out of uniform? Impossible. He would understand on whose side justice lay. He understands everything. He knows everything. Who could be more just and generous than he? Besides, if they were to arrest me for being here, what harm would it be? He asked himself, catching sight of an officer going into the house where the emperor lived. It seems people do go in. Ugh, it's all nonsense. I will go and give the petition to the sovereign myself, so much the worse for Dubretskoy, who drives me to it. And suddenly, with a resolution which was unexpected even to himself, Rostov grasped the letter in his pocket and went straight to the residence occupied by the sovereign. Now, this time I will not miss my chance, as I did at Austerlitz, he said to himself, expecting every moment to meet the emperor, and feeling the blood rush to his heart at the mere thought. I will fall at his feet and beseech him. He will lift me, listen to me, and even thank me. I am glad of any opportunity of doing good, but to right wrongs is my greatest happiness, said Rostov, 
imagining the words which his sovereign would say to him and though he had to run the gauntlet of the inquisitive glances fastened upon him he went up the front steps of the imperial residence from the porch a broad staircase led straight upstairs at the right was a half-open door below at the foot of the staircase was still another door leading to the ground floor what do you wish asked someone to give a letter a petition to his majesty said rostof in a trembling voice a petition it should go to the general in charge please pass this way he indicated the door leading to the ground floor but he won't receive it on hearing this voice so cold and unconcerned rostof was panic-stricken at his audacity the thought that he might at any moment meet his majesty was so entrancing and at the same time so terrible to him that he felt like running away but the camera foyer who came to meet him opened the door into the general's office and rostof went in a short stout man thirty years of age in white trousers hessian boots and a bastite shirt apparently meant for summer only was standing in this room a valet was behind him buttoning a pair of handsome new braces embroidered in silk as rostof could not help noticing the gentleman was talking with some one in the next room bien fait et la butte du diable devilishly well made this man was just saying but when he caught sight of rostof he stopped and frowned what is it you want a petition what is it asked the individual in the next room another petitioner replied the man in the braces tell him to come later he's going out we've got to go with him come later to-morrow to-morrow it's too late now rostof turned round and was about to go when the man in the braces stopped him who is it from who are you it's from major denisof replied rostof and who are you an officer yes a lieutenant count rostof what audacity give it to your general and be gone with you be gone and he put on the rest of the uniform handed him by his valet rostof went down into the entry again and noticed that on the steps there were still many officers and generals in full parade uniform and that he would have to pass by them all cursing his audacity his heart sinking within him at the thought that at any moment he might meet the sovereign and be mortified and even put under arrest in his presence appreciating all the impropriety of his conduct and regretting it rostof with downcast eyes was hastening away from the house which was now surrounded by the glittering officers of the suite when a well-known voice called him by name and some one's hand was laid on his shoulder well bayushka what are you doing here without a uniform demanded a deep bass voice this was a general of cavalry formerly commander of the division in which rostof served during the campaign he had won the signal favor of the sovereign rostof was started and began to justify himself but when he saw the general's good-natured jocose face he drew him to one side and began in a voice choked by emotion to lay his whole case before him and begged the general to take the part of denisof who was well known to him the general listened to rostof's story and shook his head gravely pity pity he's a brave fellow give me his letter rostof had only just handed him the petition and finished telling the whole story when quick steps and jingling of spurs was heard on the staircase and the general leaving him hurried to the steps the gentlemen composing the sovereign's suite hastened down from the staircase and went to their horses the equerry hain the same one who had accompanied the sovereign at the battle of austerlitz brought up the emperor's steed and then on the staircase was heard the slight squeak of steps which rostof instantly knew Forgetting his apprehension of being recognized, Rostov went close to the doorsteps, with many other curious spectators, from among the natives, and again, though two years had passed, he recognized those adored features, the same face, the same glance, the same gait, the same union of majesty and sweetness. And that feeling of enthusiasm and love for his sovereign rose in Rostov's soul with all its former force. The emperor wore the Preobatsensky uniform, white shimmy leather breeches, hessian boots with a star of an order which rostof did not know it was the legion d'honneur as he came out on the steps he held his hat under his arm and was putting on his gloves he paused glanced around and his glance seemed to light up all about him he said a few words to one of the generals he also recognized the general who had been formerly commander of rostof's division gave him a smile and beckoned to him all the suite moved away from them and rostof noticed that this general held a rather long conversation with the sovereign the emperor said a few words in reply and took a step towards his horse 
again the crowd of the suite and the crowd of spectators with rostof in their number followed after the emperor standing by his steed with his arm thrown over the saddle the sovereign turned to the cavalry general and said in a loud voice evidently intending that he should be heard by all i cannot general and i cannot because the law is more powerful than i said the emperor and he put his foot in the stirrup the general respectfully inclined his head the emperor got into the saddle and rode at a gallop down the street rostof forgetting himself in his enthusiasm joined the crowd and ran after him End of chapter 20part two chapter twenty one of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter twenty one on the square where the emperor was going the battalion of the proyabatsensui stood facing the street on the right on the left stood the battalion of the french guards in their bearskin caps just as the sovereign rode up toward one flank of the battalion which presented arms another throng of mounted men galloped up to the other flank and rostof recognized napoleon at their head it could have been no one else he rode at a gallop wearing his cocked hat with the ribbon of st andrew across his breast with his blue coat unbuttoned over his white waistcoat riding up to alexander on his arabian steed gray of extraordinarily good blood with crimson housings embroidered in gold he took off his hat and at this motion rostof as a trained cavalryman could not help noticing that napoleon sat awkwardly and unsteadily on his horse the battalion shouted hurrah and viva la emperor napoleon said something to alexander then the two emperors dismounted and shook hands napoleon's face wore a disagreeably artificial smile alexander with a courteous expression made some remark to him rostof notwithstanding the trampling of the horses of the mounted gendarmes constantly backing into the throng followed every motion of the two emperors not taking his eyes from them it struck him as most extraordinary that alexander treated napoleon as an equal and that bonaparte bore himself toward the russian czar also as an equal as though this proximity to the sovereign were perfectly natural and usual with him alexander and napoleon with a long train following them passed along toward the right wing of the preobotsensky battalion straight toward the throng that had collected there by some chance the throng was allowed to press so near the emperors that rostof who found himself in the very front row felt anxious lest he should be recognized sire i crave permission to grant that legion of honor to the bravest of your soldiers said a shrill precise voice dwelling on each syllable these words were spoken by the diminutive bonaparte looking straight up into alexander's eyes alexander listened attentively to what he said and inclined his head with a pleasant smile to the one who conducted himself most gallantly during this last war added napoleon laying equal stress on each syllable with an unconcern and self-confidence that aroused rostof's indignation at the same time napoleon glanced round on the ranks of russian soldiery drawn up before him and still presenting arms and immovably looking into their sovereign's face will your majesty permit me to consult with the colonel asked alexander and he made a few hasty steps towards prince kozlovsky the commander of the battalion bonaparte began meantime to be drawing his glove from his small white hand and when it tore he threw it away an aide hastening forward picked it up to whom shall it be given asked the emperor alexander in a low tone in russian of kozlovsky whom would you designate your majesty the sovereign frowned with annoyance and glancing round said yes but i must give him an answer kozlovsky with a resolute look glanced along the ranks and his eyes rested on rostof he couldn't by any possibility choose me said rostof to himself lazarev commanded the colonel knitting his brows and the first man in the front rank briskly stepped forward this was lazarev where are you going stand there whispered various voices to lazarev who did not know where to go he stood in trepidation looking askance at his colonel and his face twitched as is generally the case with soldiers summoned to the front napoleon bent his head back a little and stretched his small plump hand behind him as though wishing something to be handed him the faces of his suite who at that instant surmised what was going to take place showed some perplexity there was whispering some object was handed from one to another and a page the very one whom rostof had seen at boris's the evening before sprang forward 
and respectfully bowing over the outstretched hand and not causing it to remain a single instant placed in it an order on a red ribbon napoleon not looking at it closed two fingers and retained the badge between them then he went up to lazarev who with staring eyes continued to gaze steadfastly at his sovereign and no one else napoleon looked at the emperor alexander signifying by this that what he was doing now he did out of consideration for his ally the little white hand with the badge touched the button of the soldier lazarev napoleon seemed to realize that all that was necessary to make this soldier forever fortunate decorated and distinguished above every one else in the world was for this white hand of his merely to touch this soldier's breast napoleon simply suspended the cross on the soldier's chest and dropping his hand returned to where alexander was standing as though he knew that the cross must needs stick to the man's breast and that the cross really did officious russian and french hands instantly seized the cross and fastened it to the man's uniform lazarev had gazed moodily at the little man with white hands who had been doing something to him and he continued to present arms with his eyes again directed straight at alexander's face as though he were asking his sovereign whether it were his duty still to stand there or whether he should go back or whether there was anything else for him to do but as no orders were given him he stood in exactly the same motionless attitude for some time the sovereigns mounted and rode away the preo brazensui breaking ranks began to mingle with the french guardsmen and took their seats at the tables which had been prepared for them lazarev was assigned to the seat of honor russian and french officers pressed around him congratulated him and shook hands with him a throng of officers and the public crowded around merely to get a sight of the man the hum of conversation in french and russian and bursts of hearty laughter began to be heard around the tables erected in the square two officers with flushed faces feeling gay and happy passed by rostof what a treat brother all served on silver said one did you see lazarev i did to-morrow they say the prayer of brazensui are going to give them a dinner is that so what luck for lazarev twelve hundred francs pension for life how's that for a cap children cried a preo brazenets putting on a frenchman's shaggy bearskin marvellously fine very becoming have you heard the countersign asked one guardsman of another day before yesterday it was napoleon france bravour yesterday alexander Rouche, grandeur one day our sovereign gives the watchword and the next napoleon to-morrow the sovereign is going to confer the george upon the bravest of the guards he can't help it he's got to keep up his end boris and his friend zelinsky also came out to witness the banquet to the preobratzensui as they returned boris noticed rostof standing near the corner of the house hello rostof good morning we missed each other said he and he could not refrain from asking what had happened to him so strangely dark and disturbed was rostof's face nothing nothing replied rostof will you join us yes by and by rostof stood for a long time by the house corner gazing at the feasters his mind was filled with painful reflections which he could never bring to a satisfactory conclusion strange doubts had risen in his mind now he recalled denisof and the change that had come over him and his obstinacy and the whole hospital with those amputated legs and arms with all that filth and disease it came up so vividly in his imagination at that instant he had such a lively sense of that fetid odor of putrefaction and that dead body that he glanced around to see what might be the cause of it then in contrast he recalled that self-conceited bonaparte with his little white hand he was emperor now the loved and valued friend of the emperor alexander for what purpose then all these amputated legs and arms and those men killed then he remembered lazarev rewarded and denisov punished and unforgiven he found himself indulging in such strange thoughts that he was frightened the savour of the viands and the pangs of hunger drove him out of this mood he had to get something to eat before going back he went into an inn which he had seen that morning he found so many people there and so many officers who like himself had come in citizen's dress that he had no difficulty in getting dinner two officers of the same division as his own joined him the conversation naturally turned on the peace these officers rostof's friends like the majority of the army were dissatisfied with the peace which had been concluded after friedland they maintained 
that if only they had held out a little longer, Napoleon would have laid down his arms, that he had no supplies or ammunition for his troops. Nikolai ate in silence, and drank more than he ate. He alone drank two bottles of wine. The inner conflict which had risen in his soul, instead of finding solution, tormented him more than ever. He was afraid to express his thoughts, and he could not get rid of them. Suddenly, at the remark of one of the officers that it was a humiliation to look at the French, Rostov began to declaim, with a heat and violence wholly uncalled for, and therefore very amazing to the officers. "'And how, pray, can you decide what would have been best?' he shouted, his face flushing suddenly crimson. "'Why do you judge the sovereign's actions? What right have we to sit in judgment on him? We cannot appreciate or understand the sovereign's actions.' "'But I haven't said a word about the sovereign,' replied the officer, who could not explain Rostov's violence on any other ground than that he was drunk. But Rostov did not heed him. "'We are not diplomatic chinovniks. We are soldiers and nothing else,' he went on to say. "'We are commanded to die, and we die. And if we are punished, then of course we must be to blame. It isn't for us to criticize. It is sufficient for our sovereign, the emperor, to recognize Bonaparte as emperor, and to conclude a peace with him.' Then, of course, it must be so, for if we once begin to criticize and sit in judgment, then there will be nothing sacred left. We shall be declaring that there is no God, no nothing, screamed Nikolai, pounding the table with his fist with quite unnecessary vehemence, as his friends felt. In reality it was demanded by his feelings. It's our business to fulfill our duty, to fight and not to think, and that's the end of it, he said in conclusion. "'And drink,' said one of the officers, wishing to avoid a quarrel. "'Yes, and drink,' replied Nikolai. "'Hey, there, another bottle,' he cried. End of chapter 21 and end of part 2this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 1 In the year 1808, the Emperor went to Erfurt for another interview with the Emperor Napoleon, and in the upper circles of Petersburg much was said about the magnificence of this solemn meeting. In 1809 the intimacy between these two arbiters of the world, as Napoleon and Alexander were called, reached such a point that when Napoleon that year declared war against Austria, the Russian troops crossed the frontier to support their former enemy, Bonaparte, against their former ally, the Emperor of Austria. And there was also talk in high life of a possible marriage between Napoleon and one of the Emperor Alexander's sisters. Then, besides these external political combinations, the attention of Russian society was at this time occupied with a special interest with the internal reforms which were inaugurating in all parts of the imperial dominion. In the meantime, life, the ordinary life of men, was busied with its own concerns of health and illness, labor and recreation, with its interest in philosophy, science, poetry, music, love, friendship, hatreds, sufferings, and went on as always, independent and outside of political alliance or enmity with Napoleon Bonaparte, and outside of all potential reforms. Prince Andrei had spent two years of continuous life in the country, all those enterprises on his estates, such as Pierre had devised on his, and which the latter had brought to no result, constantly changing as he did from one plan to another, all these projects had been accomplished by Prince André without any display, and without noticeable exertion. He had to a marked degree that practical tenacity of purpose which Pierre lacked, and which gave impetus to any enterprise, without oscillation or undue effort on his own part. On one of his estates, three hundred serfs were enrolled as free farmers. This was one of the first instances of the sort. On others, the forced husbandry service was commuted for obrek or quit-rent. At Bugucharavo, a babka, or midwife, was engaged at his expense to help in cases of childbirth, and a priest was employed at a salary to teach the children of the peasants and household servants. Half of his time Prince André spent at Luisia Guri with his father and son, who was still in the care of nurses. The other half he spent at his Bugucharovsky Monastery, as his father called his estate. 
Notwithstanding the indifference which he had affected in Pierre's presence to all the outside events of the world, he eagerly followed them. He read many books, and was often amazed to remark, when men came fresh from Petersburg, from the very vortex of life, to visit his father or himself, that, though he had not once left the country, these men were far behind him in their knowledge of what was going on in politics, at home and abroad. In addition to his projects on his estates, and his general occupations in reading the most varied books, Prince Andrei spent his spare time in composing a critical account of our last two unfortunate campaigns, and a project for a change in our military code and establishment. In the spring of 1809, Prince Andrei went to the neighborhood of Ryzen, where his son, whose guardian he was, had estates. As he sat in his calash, he enjoyed the warmth of the spring sun, and looked at the young grass, the first foliage of the birches, and the first curling clouds of the spring flying over the clear blue sky. He simply did not think, but gazed on all sides, full of joy and free from care. He came to the ferry where he and Pierre had talked together the year before. He came to a filthy village, barns, a vegetable garden, and a slope with the remains of a snowdrift by the bridge, a hillside where the clay was hollowed into runnels, strips of stubble field and of shrubbery where the catkins were beginning to show, and finally reached a birch forest that extended along both sides of the road. It was almost sultry in the woods. There was not a breath of wind. The birches, all covered with young, green, sticky leafage, did not even rustle. Out from under the last year's leaves, Lifting them up came the first green bracken and the violets. Scattered here and there among the birches, small evergreens, with their somber hues, unpleasantly reminded one of winter. The horses snorted as they entered the woods, and their coats were streaked with sweat. The footman, Piotr, said something to the coachman. The coachman replied in the affirmative, but it was evident that Piotr got very little sympathy from the coachman. He turned round on the box toward his baron. "'Your illustriousness, how nice it is,' said he, with a deferential smile. "'What? Nice, your illustriousness.' "'What was that he said?' wondered Prince Andrei. "'Oh, yes, probably about the spring,' he communed to himself, glancing all around. "'And how green everything is already, so early. "'The birches and the wild cherries, and the alders are already out. "'But I don't see any oaks. Oh!' Yes, there's one. There's an oak. By the roadside stood an oak. It was evidently ten times as old as the birches of which the forest was mainly composed. It was ten times as large round and twice as high as any of the birches. It was enormous, two spans around in girth, and with ancient scars where huge limbs evidently long ago lopped off, had been, and with bark stripped away. With monstrous, disproportioned, unsymmetrically spreading, gnarled arms and branches, it stood like an ancient giant, stern and scornful, among the smiling birches. Only this oak and the slender evergreens scattered through the woods, with their hue symbolical of death, seemed unwilling to yield to the fascination of spring, and to spurn the sun and the spring. The spring and love and happiness, this oak seemed to say, and how can it be that ye still like to cheat yourselves with that stupid and senseless delusion? It's forever the same old story, and a mere delusion. There is no spring, no sun, no happiness. Look here at these mournful, lifeless evergreens, always unchanged. And here I, too, spread out my mutilated, excoriated branches from my back and my sides, where they grew, just as they grew. And here I stand and I have no faith in your hope and illusions. Prince Andrei looked back several times at this oak, as he rode along the forest, as though it had some message to teach him. The flowers and grass were under the oak, but it stood among them as before, frowning and immovable, monstrous and inexorable. Yes, that oak is right. He is a thousand times right, said Prince Andrei to himself. Let others, younger men, once more hug this delusion, but we know what life is. Our life is done. A whole new series of pessimistic ideas, agreeable from their very melancholy, arose in Prince Andrei's mind, 
suggested by the sight of the old oak. During all the rest of his journey he seemed once more to live his life over in thought, and he came back to his former comforting and at the same time hopeless conclusion that there was nothing more for him to undertake, that he must live out his life, refrain from working evil, and not worry, and not expect anything. End of chapter 1 Part Three, Chapter Two of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Two. Prince Andrei was compelled by his obligations as trustee of the Ryzen property to call upon the district Predvodityel, or Marshal of the Nobility. The Predvodityel was Count Ilya Andreyevich Rostov. About the middle of May, Prince Andrei went to see him. By this time the weather had become very warm, the woods were now in full leaf, the dust was intolerable, and it was so hot that, as he drove by water, he had a powerful desire to take a bath. Prince André, in anything but a happy frame of mind, and absorbed in thinking of the business which he had to transact with the Predvodidiel, drove into the tree-shaded avenue that led up to the mansion of the Rostovs, at Otradnoye. At his right he heard behind the trees the gay sounds of women's voices, and saw a bevy of young girls running down as if to cut off his calash. In front of the others, and therefore nearest to him, ran a very slender, indeed a strangely slender, maiden, with dark hair and dark eyes, in a yellow chintz dress, with a white handkerchief around her head, the locks escaping from it in ringlets. The maiden shouted something as she approached the calash. Then, seeing that it was a stranger, she ran back again with a merry laugh, and not looking at him. Something akin to pain affected Prince André at this incident. The day was so beautiful, the sun so bright, everything all around was so beautiful, but the slender, pretty young girl knew not, and had no wish to know aught of him, and was content and happy in her separate, most likely stupid, but still gay and careless existence. What was there for her to be merry about? What were her thoughts? Certainly not about the military code, or about rise and quit rents. What, then, was she thinking about? And why was she happy? Such questions involuntarily arose in Prince Andrei's mind. Count Ilya Andreyevich was spending the summer of 1809 at Otranoye in the same way he had always done, that is, entertaining almost the whole government with hunting parties, theatricals, dinners, and music. He welcomed Prince André most hospitably, as he did every new guest, and almost by main force compelled him to stay for the night. During the course of the wearisome day, monopolized by his elderly hosts and the most distinguished of the guests, who happened to be present in large numbers on account of the old Count's approaching fete days, Volkonsky many times was attracted to Natasha, who was among the merriest and most entertaining of the younger portion of the household, and kept asking himself, what can she be thinking about? Why is she so gay? At last, finding himself alone that night, in a new place, it was long before he could go to sleep. He read for a time, then put out his candle, then lighted it again. It was hot in the room, with the shutters closed from within. He was annoyed at that stupid old man, as he called Rostov, for having detained him by the excuse that the necessary papers had not yet come from the city, and he was vexed with himself for having stayed. Prince André got up and went to the window to open it. As soon as he threw back the shutters, the moonlight, as though it had been on the watch at the window and long waiting the opportunity, came pouring into the room. He opened the window. The night was cool and calmly beautiful. In front of the window was a row of clipped trees, dark on one side and silver bright on the other. At the foot of the trees was some sort of succulent, rank vegetation, the leaves and stalks covered with silvery dew. Farther along, beyond the trees, was a roof glittering with dew. Farther to the right, a tall tree, with wide-spreading branches, showed a brilliant white bowl and limbs, and directly above it the moon, almost at her full, shone in the bright, almost starless spring night. Prince Andrei leaned his elbows on the window sill and fixed his eyes on that sky. Prince Andrei's room was on the second floor. The rooms overhead were also occupied, and by people who were not asleep. 
he overheard women's voices above him. Only just once more, said a voice which Prince André instantly recognized. But when are you going to sleep? replied a second voice. I will not, cannot sleep. How can I help it? Come, this is the last time. The two female voices broke out into a snatch of song, forming the final phrase of a duet. Ugh, how charming! Now, then, let's go to sleep. That's the end of it. You go to sleep, but I can't, replied the first voice, approaching the window. She evidently thrust her head quite out of the window, because the rustling of her dress was heard, and even her breathing. All was calm and stone still, the moon and her light and the shadows. Prince André feared to stir, lest he should betray his involuntary presence. Sonya, Sonya, again spoke the first voice. Now, how can you go to sleep? Just see how lovely it is. Ugh, oh, how lovely. Come, wake up, Sonya, she said again, with tears in her voice. Come, now, such a lovely, lovely night was never seen. Sonya made some answer expressive of her disapproval. No, but do look. What a moon. Oh, how lovely. Do come here. Sweetheart. Darling, come here. There, now, do you see? If you would only squat down this way and rest yourself on your knees. A little closer. We must squeeze together more. There, if one tried, one might fly away. Yes, that's the way. Look out, you'll fall. A little scuffle was heard, and then Sonya's discontented voice saying, See, it's two o'clock. Ugh, you only spoil it all for me. Now go away, go away. Again all became still, but Prince André knew that she was still there. He could hear from time to time a little rustling, from time to time her sighs. Ugh, dear me, dear me, it is too bad. To bed, then, if I must, and the window was closed. And my existence is nothing to her, thought Prince André, while he was listening to their talk, somehow or other hoping and fearing that she would say something about him. It's the same old story, and done on purpose, he thought. And suddenly there arose in his soul such an unexpected throng of youthful thoughts and hopes, opposed to the whole current of his life, that he felt himself too weak to analyze his condition, and so he went to sleep immediately. End of chapter 2 Part 3, Chapter 3 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 3 The next day, Taking leave only of the Count, and not waiting for the ladies to come down, Prince André went home. It was already the first of June, and on his way home Prince André once more drove through the birch wood, where the gnarled old oak had so strangely and memorably attracted his attention. The little bells on the horses sounded with still less resonance now through the forest than they did the fortnight before. All the spaces were full of thick leaves and shrubbery, and the young fir trees scattered through the woods were no longer an exception to the general beauty, and but partook of the universal characteristics of the season, and showed a soft green at the ends of their succulent young sprays. The whole day had been hot. Now and again there had been threats of thunder showers, but only handfuls of clouds had scattered a few drops over the dusty highway and the sunny leaves. The forest on the left was dark, in shadow, that on the right, with branches glistening with diamond drops, and gently swaying in the breeze, was full of sunlight. Everything was covered with flowers. The nightingales broke out in gushing melody, and answered each other from far and near. Yes, it was in this forest here that the old oak stood whose mood seemed to agree with mine, said Prince André to himself. Yes, there he is, he thought, as he looked along at the left, and found himself, without knowing or realizing it, admiring the old oak of which he was in search. The old oak, as though transfigured, spread out a mighty tabernacle of dark, sunny green, and seemed to swoon and sway in the rays of the afternoon sun. Nothing could be seen of the gnarled branches, or of the scars, or of the old unbelief and grief. 
through the rough, century-old bark, had pierced the smooth, succulent young foliage. It was incredible that this patriarch should have produced them. Yes, this is the very same oak, said Prince Andre to himself, and suddenly there came over him an unreasonable but joyous feeling of delight and renovation. All the most sacred moments of his life came back to him at one sweep. Austerlitz, with that unfathomable sky, and the dead, reproachable face of his little wife, and Pierre on the ferry-boat, and the maiden enjoying the beauty of the night, and that night itself, and the moon, everything suddenly crowded back into his mind. No, life is not ended at thirty-one, suddenly said Prince Andre with resolute, unalterable decision. It is a small thing that I myself know what is in me. All others must know it also. Pierre, and that girl who wanted to fly up into the sky, all of them must learn to know me, so that my life may not be spent for myself alone, in order that they may not live so independently of my life, that it may send its reflection over all other lives, and that they may all live in union with me. On his return from his journey, Prince Andre made up his mind to go to Petersburg in the autumn, and he excogitated various reasons in support of this decision. A whole series of convincing and logical arguments in favor of this new departure, and even in favor of re-entering the army, were all the time coming to his aid. It even now passed his comprehension that he ever could have doubted the necessity of going back to active life, just the same as a short month before he could not comprehend how the idea ever occurred to him to leave the country. It now seemed clear to him that all his experiments of life would surely be wasted, and without reason, unless he were to put them into effect and once more take an active part in life. He now could not understand how, on the strength of such wretched arguments, he had convinced himself that it would be humiliating himself, after all his lessons in life, to believe in the possibility of getting profit and the possibility of happiness and love. Now his reason showed him the exact contrary. After this journey of his, Prince Andre began to feel tired of the country. His former occupations no longer interested him, and oft times, as he sat alone in his cabinet, he would get up, go to the mirror, and look long at his own face. Then he would turn away, and gaze at the portrait of his late wife, Lisa, who, with her little curls, a la Greek, looked down upon him with an affectionate and radiantly happy expression from the golden frame. She seemed no longer to say to her husband those terrible words. She simply gazed at him with a merry and quizzical look. And Prince Andre, clasping his hands behind his back, would walk long up and down the room, sometimes scowling, sometimes smiling, thinking over the preposterous, inexpressible, mysterious, almost criminal ideas aroused by the thought of Pierre, of glory, of the maiden at the window, of the old oak, of the beauty of women, and love, which were changing his whole life. And at such moments, when anyone came to see him, he was generally dry, stern, and short, and disagreeably logical. Mon cher, the Princess Maria once said, happening to find him in such a state, Nikolushka can't go out today, it is very chilly. If it were warm, Prince Andrei replied to his sister, then he might go out in nothing but his shirt, but since it is cold, you will have to put some warm clothes on him, as might have occurred to you. Now, there is no sense in keeping the child indoors because it is cold, when he needs the fresh air. He would say such things with all the logic in the world, as though he were punishing someone else for all this illogical reasoning that was secretly working in his mind. Under such circumstances, it was not strange that the Princess Maria said to herself, how this intellectual work dries up the heart. End of chapter 3 Part 3, Chapter 4 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne Chapter 4 Prince Andrei reached Petersburg in August 1809, this was the time when the young Speransky was at the apogee of his glory and zeal for the reforms which he had undertaken. The same month of August, the emperor, while out riding in his calash, was upset and hurt his leg, and during the three weeks that he was confined to Peterhof, he would see no one but Speransky. 
It was during this time that two ukazas, or rescripts, of extreme importance and almost alarming to society, were prepared. The one was in regard to the doing away of court chin, or rank, and the other in regard to the passing of examinations for the rank of collegiate assessor and counselor of state. The scheme also provided for a complete imperial constitution, destined to revolutionize the existing departments of justice, administration, and finance, from the Council of State, even down to the tribunals of the Volus and Cantons, throughout the Empire. Now began to materialize and take shape those vague liberal dreams, with which the Emperor Alexander had mounted the throne, and which he had vainly endeavored to bring about, with the aid of his assistants, Sartorisky, Novosiltskov, Kotchebi, and Stroganov, whom he in jest called Le Comte de Salut Public, the Committee of Public Safety. At this time Speransky was the general representative for civil affairs, and Arakcheyev for all things connected with the military. Prince Andrei, immediately after his arrival, appeared at court, and at his majesty's levee, in his capacity as chamberlain. The sovereign twice, on meeting him, did not vouchsafe him a single word. Prince Andrei had always before felt that the sovereign did not approve of him, that his face and general appearance did not please his majesty. By the cold look of disfavor which the sovereign gave him, Prince Andrei was still more confirmed in his former supposition. The courtiers explained to Prince Andrei that the emperor's neglect of him was due to his majesty's displeasure at Bolkonsky leaving the service in 1805. "'I know very well how little control we have over our likes and dislikes,' said Prince Andrei to himself, and, therefore, there is no use in thinking of personally presenting to his majesty, the emperor, my memorandum on the military code. But I must let its merits speak for themselves.' He mentioned his work to an old field marshal, a friend of his father's, the field marshal gave him an appointment, received him more than courteously, and promised to lay the matter before the sovereign. Several days later, Prince Andrei was notified to present himself before the minister of war, Count Arakcheyev. At ten o'clock on the morning of the day set, Prince Andrei went to Count Arakcheyev's. Prince Andrei did not know the minister of war personally, and had never seen him, but from all that he had ever heard of him he was disposed to hold this man in very slight esteem. He is minister of war, the confidant of his majesty the emperor. No one need concern himself with his personal characteristics. It is his business to examine my memorandum. Moreover, he is the only person who can put it into execution, said Prince Andrei to himself, as he sat with a number of other visitors of more or less note waiting in Count Arakcheyev's reception room. Prince Andrei, during the period of his military service, which most of the time had been in the quality of adjutant, had seen many receptions given by notabilities, and he had always been interested in studying the various characteristics of those who were present. At Count Arakcheyev's, the character of the reception was entirely different from anything that he had ever seen. The faces of the less notable individuals who were waiting their turn for an audience with Count Arakcheyev wore an expression of shame and humility. Those of higher rank gave a general impression of awkwardness vainly hidden under a mask of ease and ironical derision of themselves, their position, and those who were likewise waiting. Some walked pensively back and forth, some whispered and laughed together, and Prince Andrei overheard the sobriquet, Sile Andreyich, Andreyich the Strong, and the expression, Deyadia Zadast, Uncle Push, applied to the Count. One general, a man of note, was evidently annoyed because he was kept waiting, and sat with his legs crossed, smiling sarcastically at himself. But whenever the door opened, all faces expressed one and the same sentiment, fear. Prince Andrei for a second time asked the officer on duty to take in his name, but he received a scornful, impertinent stare, and was told that he would be summoned when it was his turn. After several individuals had been escorted in and out of the war minister's cabinet, an officer, whose frightened and humiliated face had already struck Prince Andrei, was admitted into the dreaded audience chamber. This officer's audience lasted a long time. Suddenly the bellowing of a disagreeable voice was heard on the other side of the door, and the officer, as pale as a sheet and with trembling lips, came out, and clasping his head with his hands, hastened through the reception room. Immediately after this, Prince Andrei was ushered into the audience chamber, and the officer on duty whispered, to the right, next the window. 
Prince Andrei went in the meanly furnished cabinet and saw, sitting by a table, a man of forty years of age, with a long waist and a peculiarly long head. The hair was closely cropped, the face was covered with deep wrinkles, the brows were contracted over grayish-green, heavy-looking eyes and a drooping nose. Arakcheyev turned his eyes toward the newcomer without looking at him. "'What was it you wanted?' asked the Count. "'I have nothing to ask for, your illustriousness,' replied Prince Andrei gently. Arakcheyev's eyes fastened on him. "'Sit down,' said Arakcheyev. "'Prince Bolkonsky. "'I have nothing to ask for, but His Majesty, the Emperor, deigned to put into your hands my memorandum, your illustriousness.' "'Please give me your attention, my dear sir. I have read your memorandum,' interrupted Arakcheyev, speaking the first words with a certain courtesy, then again staring into his face and assuming more and more of a querulous and scornful tone, he went on. "'You propose new regulations for the army. Plenty of regulations now. No one fulfills the old ones. Nowadays everybody's writing new regulations. It's easier to write them than to carry them out.' I have come at His Majesty the Emperor's request. To learn what you propose to do with my memorandum? asked Prince Andrei respectfully. I have endorsed my decision upon your memorandum, and sent it to the committee. I do not approve of it, said Arakcheyev, getting up and getting a slip of paper from his writing table. Here, he handed it to Prince Andrei. Across the paper these words were written in pencil, without capitals or punctuation marks, and ill-spelt without basis in common sense, as it is only an imitation of the French military code and no need of changing our own articles of war. "'To what committee has my memorandum been given?' inquired Prince Andrei. "'To the Committee on the Revision of the Military Code, and I have added your nobility to the list, but without salary.' Prince Andrei smiled. "'I should wish no salary.' "'An honorary member, without salary,' reiterated Arakcheyev. I have the honor of... Hey there, come in. Who's next? He shouted, bowing to Prince Andrei. End of chapter 4《Part 3, Chapter 5 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 5 While waiting for the formal notification of his appointment as a member of the committee, Prince Andrei took pains to renew former acquaintances, especially with individuals who, as he knew, were in power and might be of assistance to him. He now experienced in Petersburg a feeling analogous to that which he had experienced on the eve of a battle, when a restlessness and sense of curiosity had invincibly attracted him toward those lofty spheres, the laboratory of the future, on which depended the fate of millions. By observing the angry criticisms of the older men, the curiosity of the uninitiated, the reserve of those who knew, the eagerness and activity of all, the portentous increase in committees and commissions, new ones being, as he knew, appointed every day, he felt certain that, there and then, in the year 1809, in Petersburg, some mighty civil conflict was in preparation, and that the presiding genius of it was to be a personage as yet unknown to him, endowed in his fancy with mysterious qualities, and a man with whom he was prepared to sympathize, Mikhail Speransky. And this indefinitely realized sense of an impending reform, and Speransky, its leader, began to interest him so intensely that the matter of the military code was very soon relegated to a secondary place in his mind." Prince Andrei found himself in the most advantageous position for being well received in the most varied and lofty circles of the Petersburg society of that day. The party pledged to reform welcomed him cordially and did their best to win him to their side, in the first place because he had a reputation for intelligence and great learning, in the second place because he of his own free will had emancipated his serfs and thereby gained himself the reputation of being a liberal." The party of the old men, the discontents, naturally turned to him for sympathy in their criticisms of reform as being the son of his father. The generality of women, the world, gladly welcomed him because he was a rich man, an illustrious, and yet practically a novelty, with that aureole of romance with which he was crowned on account of his supposed death and the tragic end of his wife. 
moreover all those who knew him in days gone by confessed with one accord that he had greatly changed for the better during the last five years the time had softened down his asperities that he had lost all that old pretense pride and sarcastic manner and had now acquired the serenity which comes only with years he was talked about people were interested in him and all were anxious to see him on the day after his interview with count arakcheff prince andrei was at a reception at count kotchubi's he had been telling the count about his reception by sila andreitch that was the nickname by which kotchubi called arakcheff with the same expression of masked contempt as prince andrei had noticed in the others who spoke of him at the minister of war's reception room mon cher even in this affair of yours you can't get along without mikhail mikhailovitch c'est le grand facier he can do everything i will tell him he promised to come this evening but what has speransky to do with military matters demanded prince andrei kochubi with a smile shook his head as though amazed at bolkonsky's naivete he and i were speaking of you only a day or two ago continued kochubi and about your free laborers ah and so you have been emancipating your muziks asked an old man of Catherine's time turning scornfully upon bolkonsky it was a very small estate which brought in a very meagre income replied bolkonsky trying to palliate his action in his presence so as not to irritate the old man to no purpose you seem to be in a great hurry said the old man glancing at kochubi there is one thing i do not understand continued the old man who is going to plough the land if they are emancipated it's easy to make laws but hard to execute them if it is all the same to you count i will ask you who is going to be the deciding judge when all have to pass examinations those who succeed in passing them i suppose replied kochubi shifting from one leg to another and glancing around now there is priyanichnikov an excellent man true as gold but he is sixty years old will he pass an examination yes that is where the difficulty lies since certainly education is not at all widespread but count kochubi did not finish this sentence he got up and taking prince andrei by the arm led him forward to meet a tall bald man of forty years with white hands with a broad open forehead and an extraordinarily strange pallor on his long face the newcomer wore a blue coat the ribbon of an order around his neck and a star over his heart this was speransky prince andrei instantly surmised who it was and a peculiar feeling stirred his heart as usually happens at significant moments in life whether it were caused by respect envy expectation he could not tell speransky's whole figure was of a peculiar type so that it was impossible for a moment ever to mistake him never had prince andrei seen any one in the spheres where he had moved who was so remarkable for the calmness and self-assurance of his motions though they were awkward and ungainly or any one who had such a steady and at the same time gentle gaze from his half-closed and rather moist eyes or any one with such determined expression in a smile that meant so much or with such a delicate gentle monotonous voice and above all such an ethereal pallor of face shared also by the hands which were rather broad but extraordinarily plump soft and white such white ethereal delicacy of complexion prince andrei had never seen except in the case of soldiers who had been long at the hospital this then was speransky the emperor's secretary the sovereign's factotum and his companion at erfurt where more than once he had met and talked with napoleon speransky did not glance around from one person to another as men usually do in spite of themselves on first entering a large company and he did not hurry about speaking he spoke quietly assured that he would be listened to and he looked only at the man with whom he was speaking Prince Andrei followed Speransky's every word and motion with the keenest attention, as usually happens to people, especially to those who are inclined to judge their fellows severely. Prince Andrei, on meeting a new personage like Speransky, for instance, whom he knew by reputation, naturally expected to find in him the full complement of human perfections. Speransky told Kochubi that he was sorry at not being able to come earlier, but that he had been detained at the palace. He did not say that it was the sovereign who had detained him, and Prince Andrei remarked this affectation of modesty. When Kochubi presented Prince Andrei, Speransky slowly turned his eyes upon Bolkonsky, 
without altering his smile, and continued to gaze at him in silence. "'I am very happy to make your acquaintance. I have heard of you, as has everyone else,' said he. Kochubi gave a brief account of Bolkonsky's reception by Arachev. Speransky's smile grew more accented. The chairman of the Commission for Revising the Military Statutes, Mr. Magnitsky, is an excellent friend of mine, said he, carefully dwelling on each syllable and each word. And if you would like, I can give you a personal interview with him. Here he came to a full stop. I hope that you will find him sympathetic and willing to further all that is reasonable. A little circle had immediately gathered around Speransky, and the same old man who had spoken of his chinovnik, Pryanichnikov, turned to the minister with the same question. Prince Andrei did not take part in the conversation, but contented himself with observing all the motions of Speransky, that man who but a short time since had been an obscure seminarist, and now had in his hands, those white, plump hands, the control of Russia's fortunes. He was struck by the extraordinary contemptuous calmness with which Speransky answered the old man. It seemed as though he stooped down from an immeasurable height to grant him a condescending word. When the old man began to speak louder than the occasion justified, Speransky smiled and said that he could not judge of the utility or futility of what the sovereign deigned to approve. After conversing for some time with the group generally, Speransky got up and, crossing over to Prince Andrei, drew him aside to another corner of the room. It was plain that he considered it necessary to patronize Bolkonsky. I haven't had a chance to talk with you yet, Prince, owing to the lively discussion into which I was drawn by that worthy old gentleman, said he, with his blandly contemptuous smile, seeming to imply by this smile that he and Prince Andrei appreciated the insignificance of the people with whom he had just been talking. This treatment was very flattering to Prince Andrei. I have known of you for a long time, in the first place, through your treatment of your serfs, the first example of the sort, I believe, and one which I should like to see generally followed, and in the second place, because you are the only one of the chamberlains who has not considered himself abused by the new ukaz, concerning the court ranks, which has produced so much talk and criticism. Yes, replied Prince André, my father did not wish me to take advantage of this prerogative, I began with the lowest step in the service. Your father is a man of a bygone generation. He evidently stands far above the men of our day, who are so severe in their judgments upon this measure, and yet it aims simply to re-establish genuine justice. I am inclined to think, however, that there is some ground for these criticisms, said Prince André, striving to free himself from Speransky's influence, of which he was beginning to feel conscious. It was distasteful for him to agree with the man at every point. He felt a strong desire to contradict him. Prince Andrei, who generally spoke fluently and well, now found some difficulty in expressing himself while talking with Speransky. He was too much occupied with his study of the personality of this distinguished man. The ground of personal vanity may be, quietly suggested Speransky. Partly, and also for the sake of the government, replied Prince Andrei. "'What makes you think so?' asked Speransky, slightly dropping his eyes. "'I am a disciple of Montesquieu,' said Prince André, "'and his maxim that le principe de monarchie le il honneur, mon pare incontestable. "'Certain rights and privileges of the nobility seem to me to be the means of maintaining this sentiment.' The smile faded from Speransky's pallid face, and his expression gained greatly by the change. Evidently, Prince André's thought seemed to him worthy of consideration. Si vous envisage les questions sans ce point de vous, he began, finding it evidently rather difficult to express himself in French, and speaking still more deliberately than in Russian, and yet with absolute self-possession. Montesquieu says that honor, le honneur, cannot be maintained by prerogatives that are injurious to the service, that honor, l'honneur, is either the negative concept of refraining from reprehensible actions, or it is the true fountainhead of impulse for the winning of approbation, and the rewards that are the fruit thereof. His arguments were succinct, simple, and clear. An institution that maintains this honor, this source of emulation, an institution like the Légion d'honneur of the great Emperor Napoleon, is not prejudicial, but advantageous to the success of the service, but that is not true of social or court prerogatives. 
I do not quarrel with that, but it is impossible to deny that court privileges have always tended toward the same end, said Prince André. Every courtier should consider himself bound to fulfill his duties worthily. But you have not cared to take advantage of them, Prince, retorted Speransky, his smile showing that having worsted his opponent in the argument, he was now ready to cut short this special mark of his favor. If you will do me the honor of calling upon me Wednesday, he added, then I shall have a talk with Magnitsky, and may be able to tell you something of interest, and, moreover, I shall have the pleasure of a more circumstantial conversation with you. Then, closing his eyes, he made him a low bow, and slipped from the room a la Francais, without taking leave, so as not to attract attention. End of chapter 5《Part Three, Chapter Six of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Six. During the first part of his stay in Petersburg, Prince Andrei was conscious that the whole system of thought which he had elaborated during his solitary life in the country was entirely obscured by the petty occupations with which he was now engaged in the city. Every evening, when he returned to his lodgings, he jotted down in his notebook four or five indispensable visits or appointments for the next day. The mechanisms of his life, the arrangement of the twenty-four hours, so as to allow him to be always punctual, was at the cost of a goodly portion of his mental energy. He accomplished nothing. He neither thought nor had time to think, and whatever he said in conversation, and it must be confessed that he talked well, was merely the fruit of his solitary meditation in the country. He occasionally remarked with dissatisfaction that on appearing at different gatherings on one and the same day he found himself repeating himself. But he was so absorbed all day long that he had no time to think out anything new. He went to Speransky's house on Wednesday and had a long and confidential talk with him. The impression that had been produced on him by Speransky at his first meeting with him at Kochubi's was repeated and intensified. Prince Andrei looked upon so many men as contemptible and beneath contempt, he had such a powerful desire to discover in another living the ideal of perfection toward which he was striving, that it was easy for him to believe that he had discovered in Speransky his ideal of a perfectly reasonable and virtuous man. If Speransky had sprung from the same class in society to which Prince Andrei belonged, and if he had had a similar education and mental processes, Volkonsky would have soon discovered his weaknesses, his human instead of his heroic side. But now this strangely logical bent of mind aroused his esteem from the very fact that he did not fully understand him. Moreover, Speransky, either because he prized Prince Andrei's talents or because he felt that it was necessary to attract him to himself, displayed before Prince Andrei his cool, easy wit and flattered Prince Andrei with that delicate flattery which appeals to a man's self-conceit, by tacitly taking for granted that he is the only other man capable of comprehending the full depth of stupidity of all the rest of the world, and the reasonableness and depth of their own ideas. During the time of that long conversation of theirs on Wednesday evening, Speransky more than once said, With us there is a chance to look upon everything that rises above the common level of the commonplace routine, or with a smile. But our idea is that the wolves should be fed well, and yet the sheep kept whole, or they could not comprehend this, and all the time his expression seemed to imply, we, that is, you and I, understand who they are and who we are. This long conversation with Speransky merely served to confirm the feeling produced in him at his first interview with him. He saw in him an intelligent, severely logical man of immense talent, energy, and tenacity of purpose, who desired to obtain power which he would wield solely for the good of Russia. Speransky was, in Prince Andrei's eyes, the man most able to explain by his intellect alone all the phenomena of life, accepting as of any importance only what appealed to his reason, and, in all circumstances, capable of applying the rules of logic in a way that he had always longed to be able to do. Everything was placed before his mind so lucidly through Speransky's exposition that he found himself agreeing with him on every point, in spite of himself. If he raised objections and entered into discussions with him, it was simply because he was anxious to be independent, 
and not a mere echo of Speransky's opinions. Everything was just as it should be. Everything about him was good, but there were one or two things that struck Prince Andrei unpleasantly. Such were Speransky's cold, mirror-like, inscrutable eyes, and his white, plump hand. Prince Andrei could not help looking at them, just as one is always drawn to look at the hands of those men who are in the possession of power. Those mirror-like eyes and that soft hand somehow irritated Prince Andrei. He was also offended by the overweening contempt for men which he had remarked in Speransky, and at various shifts in his arguments which he used for the buttressing of his ideas. He made use of all possible weapons of thought, especially affecting metaphors, and it seemed to Prince Andrei that he leaped from one to another with too great audacity. Sometimes he set himself up as a practical worker and flouted visionaries, then as a satirist and made ironical sport of his antagonists. Then he would become severely logical. Then suddenly he would rise into the domain of pure philosophy. This last weapon of proof he was especially fond of employing. He would take questions to the heights of metaphysics, indulge in definitions of space, time, and thought, and, finding counter-arguments in them, he would come back to fresh discussions. On the whole, the chief trait of Speransky's intellect, and one that amazed Prince Andrei, was his unswerving, unquestioning faith in the power and validity of the intellect. It was evident that Speransky never dreamed of harboring such thoughts as were habitual with Prince Andrei, as to the impossibility of expressing all that came into his mind, or that he ever doubted whether all that he thought and all that he believed were not vanity. And it was this very characteristic of Speransky's intellect that especially attracted Prince Andrei toward him. During the first period of his acquaintance with Speransky, Prince Andrei conceived a passionate admiration for him, analogous to that which he had Willem experienced for Bonaparte. The circumstance that Speransky was the son of a priest, which many looked upon as derogatory, scorning a man as Kutinek, a priestling, or Popovich, the son of a pope, undoubtedly made Prince Andrei particularly cautious in indulging this feeling towards Speransky, and unconsciously led him to keep it to himself. On that first evening that Bolkonsky spent with him, they got to talking about the Committee for Revision of the Laws, and Speransky told Prince Andrei, with a touch of irony, how this committee had existed a hundred and fifty years, had cost millions, and yet had not accomplished anything, that Rosenkampf had merely stuck labels on all the articles of comparative legislation, and that is all the result that the government has received from those millions, said he. We want to give new judicial powers to the Senate, and we have no laws. Therefore, it is a sin for such men as you, Prince, not to serve at the present time. Prince Andrei replied that for this it needed a legal training, which he did not possess. But there is no one who has, so what are you going to do about it? This is a circulus viciosus, and we must break away from it by main force. Before a week was over, Prince Andrei was appointed a member of the Committee on Revising the Military Code, and much to his surprise, Nachalnik, or president, of one section of the Special Commission on the Revision of the Laws. At Speransky's special request, he took up the study of the Revised Civil Code with the aid of the Code of Napoleon and the Institutes of Justinian to set to work on the section entitled The Rights of Individuals. End of chapter 6